Mashoku Tensei Audiobook, Subjugation of the King Dragon King. Prologue, Subjugation of the Dragon King. This story is the original roots of the legendary 48 mystical swords scattered throughout the world, and how for a long time afterwards many would boast about how they came to be connected to the legendary hero. This is the story of one boy who was connected to four groups in their ambition, intrigue, and deception to exterminate the dragons. Please acknowledge that this story takes place some 300 years prior to the current setting of Mashoku Tensei. Prologue the Blacksmith One who invents many kinds of arms, they offer their support from behind the scenes of all of the world's wars. If you look into the colossal amount of documents in regards to the existence of mystical swords, you will see them come and go throughout the background of history. When the thousands of years old demon king perishes, in the hand of the hero who struck the blow was clutched a holy sword. Whenever the powers of a dynastic king would unite a continent, the hand of the opposing villain grasped tightly to a demon sword. The fluctuations in the background of history would almost invariably facilitate an appearance of a mystical sword. The Master Blacksmith some might forge but one holy sword in their lifetime as the culmination of the pinnacle of their refined craftsmanship, or one might sacrifice their life to forbidden crafting techniques and create dozens of demonic swords, regardless of the outcome they entrust their skills to their progeny. Few are the names etched deeply in the historical record. The most famous of these craftsmen would be but three who were said to have forged the most powerful swords. The Dragon Swords of the Dragon Emperor, the most famous sword known to have been forged by the Dragon Emperor, and utilizing the speed of the Sword God is the Graceful Phoenix Dragon Sword. From ancient times, the descendants of the Dragon Tribe have forged the Dragon Emperor's swords. Though magical power is not contained inside of it, they are said to never bend, break, and no matter how much it has cut, their edge never dull. Though many master blacksmiths exist in the world, the only one that can call a sword a dragon sword is one recognized by the dragon emperor. Only one who has pleased the dragon emperor in service would have a sword struck for themselves, and to a swordsman of the world, many would dream of becoming a courageous warrior who is recognized by the dragon emperor. Shishido of the Strange Sword If we talk about the beloved sword called Coral owned by the master swordsman of the East Slaughter Dharma, it is perhaps one of the most well-known swords. There was once a craftsman who was born without the use of both hands. Despite this, he somehow became a master blacksmith, and how it was that he managed to temper a sword is said to be a mystery, but the weapons he produced were said to be made for those people who would be considered unsuitable for fighting, and those weapons always took on a special form. For instance, he created a sword which was, was optimized to be used in the mouth, and a bow whose premise was to be used by the feet. The reason he is called a master craftsman, and why his name is remembered in the annals of history, is because of the strange swords he had struck in his lifetime, and how very conspicuous they were. And then there is the last one. Perhaps the most famous man. Julian Halisco of the 48 Demon Swords, 24 pairs of holy and demon swords. Put together it added up to 48 individual swords, Possessing both overwhelming magical power and having superior sharpness and strength, his swords were said to surpass the dragon sword. Step by step his craftsmanship was said to have arrived at the realm of the sword god, and his creations are what are now considered to be virtually the strongest group of swords in existence. But that birthed a long time mystery. This was often talked about as nothing more than a fairy tale, reason being that there were not many who really knew the finer details of his story. However from this point, comes the account of that very story. The Untold Legend of the Hero of the Forty-Eight Swords Chapter 1, The Collapsed Ladies, Part 1 This is a story not too long ago. It's a story after the long fighting between the demon-slash-human race ended and when the demon-slash-human race began infighting amongst themselves for territory. A Time of War it was especially worse in the center of the continent, where most of the human race resided in. Without a ruler or any form of control, the land kept collapsing as time went by. A village chief would rise up and create a country, 
only to be attacked by its neighboring country in fall, and that neighboring country would also be attacked by another in fall, and that other country would also, destruction, it was a world where such destruction was a natural course of life. Wasn't it more peaceful when the humans with the humans and the demons with the demons united as one? There were many who doubted as such, but none could give an answer. How many times had such fighting repeated? There was a sudden increase of bandits and mercenaries. Farmers would have their entire families slaughtered as well as their fields burned, leaving them no choice but to become either bandits or mercenaries. It was the only way to live. With an imbalance of supply and demand, the poor had no choice but to steal from others. Many orphans were born as well. Of those orphans, only a lucky few would be picked up by knights to become a page and such, but for most, it was either to become a slave or a thief, but usually it was neither, and a death from starvation awaited them. A food shortage caused an inescapable swamp of constant looting. But even in that swamp, the human race gradually found a resolution. The center continent is a fertile land. This is especially true when the land is closer to the south and west, where the barren land disappears and endless green grasslands emerges. It had the potential to save the diminishing human race that had been worn out through war and famine. There was one country that realized such and began to create a strong foundation. The country that took the step forward was called the Dragon King Kingdom. Protected by the Dragon King Mountain, it invested a long time into building its strength and capital, making it an affluent country. It was even blessed by its geographical location. Thanks to its ever-soaring Dragon King Mountain, there are only two ways to enter the country. A safe roundabout trip. A dangerous steep shortcut. The safe route goes through an extended flatland but since it goes around the Dragon King Mountain, it takes more time to finish the trip. However, this also makes it easy to defend against any foreign invaders. On the other hand, the dangerous route has no guides on the road nor food supplies, leading to a continuation of a deadly wasteland for the regular folk. However, it only takes a quarter of the time of the safe route to complete. There are countless people who pass through the wasteland, but nearly none come out in the end, this story is about the latter. It starts in the deadly wasteland. A barren continent as far as the eye can see. With no vegetation to be found, the closest thing were trees filled with poisonous fruits. Occasionally, on the top of the dry dead soil, bleach white bones tumbled away. A bleak reality where without the soaring Dragon King mountain to guide them from afar, one could not tell which way he was going. The landscape was not something that could be completed by walking three days and three nights. One month. From the neighboring country, it took one month. The wasteland expands in a seemingly endless fashion. Whether this land seems ever extending or narrow must vary from person to person. There are living things. There are a great number of sand bugs that feed on the corpses of dead animals. As a matter of fact, only sand bugs live here. There are no birds that fly in these skies. An eerie feeling without a single sound nor hint of life. There are scholars who say there is a reason why the land is like this, but so what? There is no question that an army passing by or even a veteran traveler would lose their lives in this wasteland. Such was the harshness and dangers of the land. Even so, it was still the shortcut to the Dragon King Kingdom. And in this wasteland was a single boy. Fun Fu Fu Fun Fu joined by the sound of armor rustling, he pushed forward into the wasteland while humming. Wearing a suit of shining silver armor, he carried a huge greatsword on his back. His black-haired head cut by his anbura was entangled in sand and hurting, but beneath it all, showed a tough face and held another worldly aura around him. Walking without even taking off his knight armor during the intense heat showed his lack of experience in traveling, making it all just pointless. However his expression showed nothing but a sign of a good mood. Guess I'm almost there, in his heart lied the ambition of becoming a hero. All those stories about heroes he had heard as a child. He had always wanted to become like the main character of those stories. And soon, that dream will become a reality. Because in the town that the boy is heading to is currently recruiting people for the slaying of a dragon. Dragons are the strongest life form. Not only are they strong in numbers but individually they are the largest on land, 
have strong magical prowess as well as high intelligence. Dragons are truly the strongest indeed. Though there are cases where outraged dragons would destroy countries of the human race, there is no case where humans went to a dragon shelter and came back with a kill. But the boy dreamed that if it was him, a dragon could be defeated even if he was alone. And in that dream, everyone would end up praising him for his deed. And rightfully so. His objective was the hero knight he had heard from fairy tales. Defeating a million strong army, bringing down an evil dragon as well as bringing peace to the world, he was a nonsensical existence. If it was a little child embracing such a delusion, it wouldn't be strange as it is the age where kids would dream of such things. There are many people who had such dreams as a child. It was kind of a spur-of-the-moment illness, like measles. The boy's name was Alex equals Ryback. Nickname Al. He is a boy who has scummed to such illness. And solely because of it, he qualified into knighthood, passing through the waste of death and will soon challenge a dragon. He is a seriously ill patient. I have to hurry or they will start without me, huh? In front of him, Al found some rugged cloth. To be precise, it was more something that looked like a rugged pack of cloth. A dirty brownish kind. Nah, it's a person isn't it? Looking closely, it was a person who had fallen. Wrapped up in a rugged cloak, a little girl with chestnut hair was lying face down on the ground. Al thought that it was a corpse but immediately dismissed the idea. For a corpse, it didn't have any sand bugs on it nor did it show any bones. Sand bugs would feed on rotting corpses so he had thought that it hadn't been too long before she took her last breath. Al slapped the back of the girl with his palm. He could feel a warm heat and a pulsation from the body. As expected, she was still alive. Guess it's someone dying after collapsing Al casually turned over the girl into a face-up position. She has the face of someone who lived a diligent life. Tan dark skin. She is most likely from the Bagheric continent. She has a scar on her cheek like the boys. You could tell that she had long slit pupils despite her eyes being closed. Her chestnut hair along with her tan dark skin matched the wasteland. She is short and skinny, but unlike a slave showed signs of muscles. Excuse me Al started touching the girl's body. It wasn't to scavenge the belongings of a dying person nor was it to indulge his sexual desires for he was a gentleman. He was checking to see if she had any physical injuries. No physical wounds nor any sign of her clothes disturbed. It doesn't seem she was attacked by a monster or bandit. Though he didn't know if monsters or bandits even existed in this place, the girl had the clothes of an experienced traveler but had no food nor water in her possession. The water bottle hanging on her lower back is also empty. She most likely collapsed due to hunger and dehydration after exhausting all her food slash water supply. A very important value of a hero is saving others. Well come on, drink up Al said as he pushed his water bottle towards the girl's face. After two ample seconds the girl stopped and looked at him with dull eyes. Did she get it in her nose? Geho, geho. She had a strong confused expression on her face but unlike her violent movements at first, she gracefully took the water bottle and placed it on her lips, drinking the lukewarm water bit by bit without hesitation. Even without a conscious, the body is honest. And right after, the girl once again lost her cushiousness. Okay, wait, please don't die on me Elle slung the girl on his shoulder and began walking through the wasteland while humming. His steps were light. For a man like him who aims to be a hero, saving others is his lifelong duty. By saving a person, he gets one step closer into becoming a hero. That's why he always keeps an eye out for those who have fallen or are in need of help. It's not that he enjoys the misfortunes of others, but rather finds benefit in saving those who are down, something that those in need would welcome with open arms. Of course, Al knows that no matter how many times he helps people, he won't be remembered as a hero for generations to come as he wishes. But anything stacks up eventually. If he stops being aware of the little basic things in his path to becoming a hero, he won't be able to able to act accordingly when an important opportunity for him to arise occurs. On top of that, no matter what kind of situation Al is in, for him to carry a girl or two until he reaches town is not much trouble. I will, 
crush evil, with my fists, they will be crushed, oh? Was it a few hours after he started walking? Al had found a large black rhinoceros beetle in front of his path. These beetles lived in cracks of people's homes. However the detestable black kind had multiple species and some of them even grew to one meter long and would attack people as well. To be precise, he saw something that looked like a large black rhinoceros beetle. A black hunk metal that reflected the sunlight. Well, it's not an insect to be exact, he saw a person wearing a black suit of armor. The person was wearing a black suit of armor that was getting hot due to the sunlight, it was a tall woman who had fallen down face down. It's a dead body, Al thought. It was a fallen body that had no sense of life in it. If the girl he had rescued earlier was glittering with life, this woman here was glittering with death. She will most likely rot and become a meal for the sand bugs here. She was one stupid lady. To wander this wasteland that had no shelter for the sunlight while wearing a black suit of armor that captured all the heat. If only she had wore a silver set of armor like me that reflects the sunlight instead, well even then, it's still hot. However, a hero was not someone that would be discouraged by the degree of heat. Everything starts with a shape slash impression. A hero without his armor is unthinkable. Now then, even though it is a dead body, finding her was also kind of fate. It would be good to do a background check on her. Al dropped the baggage he held on his shoulder. He heard a voice saying Gufu, but ignored it. He turned over the lying girl face upwards. What? The face that was pummeled in the sand was blushing red and there was a sense of life left in it. As he put his hands on her face, he felt heat as if she was suffering from a heat stroke, but he could still notice her breathing. Did she just suddenly collapse not too long ago? Al turned his head to the route that he was taking. The sacred mountain that soared to the skies, he could see the smoke at the bottom of the Dragon King Mountain. If she had walked for one more hour, the wasteland would have been over. Just a bit more and she would have been able to see the plains that had food. This current place was such a checkpoint of sorts. She is an unlucky woman. If she had just tried a little harder, she would have made it. But on the other hand, her luck isn't all that bad considering Al had found her. Because for Al, helping a fallen lady or two is of no difficulty for him. Al carefully took off the hot armor, and beneath the black armor was a black outfit that a castle maid would wear. It was an impressive outfit with black chains compiled together on various parts of the body. I wonder if all maids arm themselves like this, a maid wearing a suit of armor walked through the wasteland. Without knowing the reason as to why she did so, Al tilted his head. Guess everyone has different circumstances, ha? Huh? After muttering so for some time, he bundled the armor into one, strung it up and carried it on his back. And then he splashed all the water he had left at the woman's face. There's no shade to hide from the heat here. His best bet would be to hurry to the town. Whether she lives or dies is totally dependent on her stamina. Thinking as such, Al slung the girl on his left shoulder while carrying the woman on his right side. He is aiming to be a hero. Saving a person or two is of no hardship for him. The biggest tavern in the Dragon King Kingdom was especially crowded more than usual. Al didn't understand the more than usual part but it was fully occupied despite having a large amount of seats compared to other taverns. Also, there was a group of people that didn't seem like customers that hung around the wall area. Looks like that's where the more than usual part lies. What is the reason that so many people are here today to the point of it being full? Al had an idea to the reason why. It is the same reason as to why Al took this journey to the Dragon King Kingdom. Today was the day where the person who requested the slaying of the Dragon King would come to explain the details to those who accepted his request and this tavern was the place chosen for such discussion. Now then, leaving that as it is. Seconds. Here too. In front of Al's eyes, two women were emptying plates as if they were competing against each other. One was the girl with the slit eyes, with a face of peculiarity rather than one of awe. Her small body was covered with a ragged mantle. She is earnestly stuffing meat into her stomach constantly. The other person was the tall maid with the face of either an intellectual or one of cold-heartedness. Wearing a suit of pitch-black armor on top of her maid clothing, 
she held the appearance of what one would think of when they imagine an elegant knight. However right now, all that elegance was washed away with her only aim being the food on the table. They were one scary girl and woman. They gave the impression that if someone were to bump into their shoulder in the streets, they would consider it fate and suck them dry of all their money. As soon as we entered the tavern, the two girls used the strength they recovered from sleeping on the way here to run into the shop, chase out some customers that were already seated and secured a table, ordering dishes in succession right after. Seemingly not even caring about Al, who was sitting across and facing them to be exact, they definitely don't care. They are only focused on replenishing their missing nutrients. But seriously, there seems to be a lot of interesting participants gathered up here, huh? It wasn't a voice that was directed towards him, but Al listened in closely. It seems that those people talking don't have anything to do with the gathering here. Are they merchants? With their drunk breath intoxicating their surroundings, they happily looked around the tavern. Those guys there are the Dragon King Kingdom's royal knights, right? They sure are famous. Their leader is the astonishing lion, Leonhart equals Pombador. The man who makes the impossible possible. Accomplishing countless attack and defense strategies for the kingdom, a true man indeed. Al's gaze shifted towards where the men looked. In the corner of the tavern, you could see around ten fully armored men gathered into a group. With a steel blue set of armor, their armor had no fancy decorations other than the red feathers that decorated their helmets. They were armed for practicality and had it not been for the Dragon King Kingdom insignia engraved on their armor, people would have mistaken them for a mercenary group. Although they may seem simple, the proudful royal knights of the Dragon King Kingdom had many great tales. Sometimes, when a dragon comes down from the Dragon King Mountain and attack human settlements, it was their duty to exterminate the threat. And as the drunkards said earlier, they were also very proficient in the battlefield. For the Dragon King Kingdom to maintain its status as a great nation during these warring times, their abilities definitely played a huge role as well. A proficient knight's order held proudly by its great nation. It would be impossible for them to be weak. And over there, aren't they the prime leopard mercenaries? You're right. The only people who wear those leopard printed coats in the continent are the prime leopard mercenaries. Even then, they are one of the primary color divisions, the blue leopard division. Al switched his gaze once again. They were seated to the side, two tables away from the royal knights. As the drunkards said, the group wore leopard printed coats. Rather than a vibrant blue color, they wore a shiny slash showy blue colored coat covered with black leopard print patterns. Talking about the Prime Leopard Mercenaries, they are a huge mercenary organization in the Central Continent. With their leader Big Panther at the top, there are five color divisions consisting of red, blue, yellow, white, and black. Under these five, there are four separate divisions as well. Their members are said to be around a hundred thousand strong and have the might rivaling that of a national army. Among the mercenaries present was a man hunched back wearing his shiny and vibrant blue coat with dyed short blue hair. He is probably the leader of this group. We accidentally met eyes. The man had no interest for Al, but his gaze lied upon the two women who were greedily emptying the plates around him. The man's expression turned crooked. Do they know each other? As Al looked, he could see the man clicking his tongue and downing his drink in one shot. Who are those guys up on the second floor? That shining white armor. Those who wear such evil warding armor can only be the Holy Knight's Order of Millis. The proud executioner division of the Holy Millis Nation. They are said to be more nasty than the Temple Knights, but that's also the reason why they are so strong. With overwhelming anti-demon equipment, they go around killing off witches or whoever their target is. Switching his gaze from the mercenaries to above. Above was a group that stood out even more than the Blue Leopard mercenaries. A group wearing a white suit of armor. It was the Holy Knight's Order. Their official name is the Anti-Demon Armored Army Corps. Their white armor held a high degree of anti-magic resistance, and only they, the Anti-Demon Armored Corps otherwise known as the Holy Knight's Order were granted such treasured equipment. Officially speaking, they aren't official Knights of Millis. 
However, as a foreigner, if you asked about the Millis Knights, they would always mention the Holy Knights. This was referring to them. Rather than the Temple Knights who rarely left their home country, the Holy Knights order that were found to be all over the continent were much more well known. Within the group, one man with crude features that didn't seem to even match the vocabulary of Holy Knight looked at us with a surprised expression. Since he didn't match his eyes with Al at all, it seems that he is acquainted with one of the women here. Just like the Blue Leopard Division's leader, he had a face of disgust as if he had found some garbage insect and looked away abruptly. Hey hey, who are those muscular guys over there? They look very sweaty you idiot, what are you going to do if they hear you? They are a martial arts group called the Phoenix's Nest. Their hometown lacked the metal to make the weapons and armor they needed, so they resulted to developing their hand-to-hand -hand combat instead. Well nowadays, it seems as though their objectives and means to solve matters seem to have reversed roles respectively. Phoenix's Nest even Al at least knows the name of the group. Though we don't know why they need to, they are a group that specializes in fighting anything with their fists. The hand is surely a strong weapon. Everyone has it and since it can be used anywhere, the more you train with it, the more power you can create. Furthermore, it is the closest range weapon of them all. With only using skills, one can deliver a strong damaging blow to their enemy by sticking onto them. However, the hard truth is that a person is at his strongest when holding a weapon. Since the reach is very short, it is considered very portable but outside of that there isn't much. A longer reach is better. Knowing all too well of this, they didn't sit down in their seats. Being a nuisance to those around them, they trained towards the corner of the tavern, becoming all sweaty. You could see that the one who looks like their leader is helping to lead one of their especially young members during their training. All of the members were naked waist up, and with one look you could see an unnecessary amount of muscles covering their bodies. However, in the region that the phoenix's nest is from, there seem to be many huge monsters with tough hides living in the region. Although their muscles might get in the way when fighting against humans, when it comes to slaying such monsters, those muscles were probably getting the job done. But of course, there is still some lingering doubt since they live in an age where weapons could just be imported from the outside. Who are those gloomy fellows over there? Huh. Those guys are some magician group from the northern side. From what I recall, they call themselves the Grass World Leaf Tree, Suyumoku. I don't know the details but I can tell you one thing, everyone in that group is an imperial court level magician. They were a quiet group. Wrapping their bodies up with light brown and navy blue robes, they seated themselves at the table in the very end and quietly ate their meals. They barely have a conversation. They really don't fit in with this loud, alcohol-infused atmosphere. A tense sensation could be felt, probably due to the Millis Holy Knight's order being here as well. The holy country of Millis prohibits all use of magic, and the Holy Knights are on especially bad terms with such magicians. Millis prohibits any magicians from entering the country and when they do enter illegally, they are judged and punished as criminals. The ones that punish such heretics are those of the Holy Knight's Order. When their brethren are killed, people have a burst of anger no matter what the reason is. Magicians are no different. They are humans after all. Maybe they really are mad. But it wasn't possible to interpret as such from the expressions they made sitting at the table near the end. Suddenly, my eyes met with a young girl sitting amongst the group. Taking a look at Al's gaze with dim-lit eyes, she tilted her head to the side. Al got rid of his gaze. After a brief moment, on the platform of the tavern, on the stage where usually traveling bards or whatnot would perform, the man appeared accompanied by his guards. A dark purple body with four arms. You could tell at one glance he was of the demon race. And so, if he is a demon, it is obvious that he is the organizer of this assembly. The tavern returned to dead silence. Even those drunkards would not open their mouths. At any rate, five large organizations are glaring around the place. With that being said, no one could dare open their mouth. It seemed that even the sound of eating would make them find you at fault. However at the most extreme end of things, this didn't matter to the two girls who didn't care about their surroundings. 
Not caring about the glances surrounding them, they slurped away at their noodles. My name is Julian Alisco. Ah. I'm a weapons blacksmith more or less, but every single one of you here probably know that much he didn't shout too loudly, but just enough to reach the corners of the already silent tavern. He is probably of a race that didn't have fully developed vocal organs. His hoarse voice suited him as one of the demon race. He is still young. For the demon race that sometimes live up to 1,000, even 10,000 years, he probably hasn't even reached the age of 500. It would be hard to distinguish such from his appearance alone, but for the demon race that stack up years of life, most become ferocious as they grow older. I can't feel the ferociousness of a starved beast from him, so he is definitely young without a doubt. As for why I've gathered you all here, all of you are probably well aware of the reason why for a moment, the tavern turned noisy and returned to its lively state. But it was really only for a moment, as it returned to silence. I plan to make a sword. All the theories of how I will do so are complete. My workshop is also ready but there is one flaw, and that is the lack of materials it was straightforward talk. Now the conversation will head to the main topic. The Lord of the Dragon King Mountain, King Dragon King Kazakht shall be the material I use. For that to happen, I need you to enter the Dragon King Mountain and bring his corpse. I want you to come back with every inch of his body without even a scrap left behind Dragon King. Having a huge body compared to other dragons, it utilizes high-tier gravity magic to make its seemingly sluggish body jump and leap with ease. Although in terms of group strength, they cannot match the red dragons. They are no match for the red dragons that eat any living being that steps a foot into the mountain. However, in a fight of individuals, they reign supreme. Dragon kings are the strongest of all dragons. And out of them all, is King Dragon King Kazakht. His name is more famous than any other dragon. An ancient dragon that has lived for who knows how many long years. During the Great Human Demon War, he fought the U-race hero known as Ran Shao who had sided with the humans and won. For his victory, the Dragon King Mountain bestowed upon him by the demon god himself. Currently there is no living survivor from the Great Human Demon War. The only one still alive other than the King Dragon King would be the immortal demon King Atof, who governs a piece of demon race territory. King Dragon King Kazakht, a creature that human intelligence cannot fathom. As for the reward, I have prepared an amount of money that you will be able to spend playing around for the rest of your life. Furthermore, I will give you the greatest sword I make from the King Dragon King's remains a commotion erupted for a second time. Whether it was a creature that human intelligence could not fathom, or one that could not match human intelligence, it did not matter. Humans live for desire. With that money and selling the sword as well, not to mention a lifetime, it would be like being promised great prosperity to the very end of your teenage years. Everyone grew excited as they hoped. Go! The Dragon King is in the mountain. Ooh. Thanks to the command of the demon race organizer, Yulian, the tavern became much more lively than it previously was and the groups inside who were like the lords of the place began to rush out, leaving the place behind. After the brief moment of liveliness, the tavern became devoid of life. The ones left behind were drunkards who had no interest in dragon slaying. Mu, after realizing he was off to a late start, Al got up in a daze. I can't be like this, I'm going to be the one to slay the dragon. Falling behind the others, he didn't have time to pass by idly. Let's run out of here quickly and take over the others. After that, it'll be straight to the King Dragon King. It'd be useless even if you go now after hearing the voice, Al stopped his feet. Looking around, he found the tall maid's figure standing with a happy face, with a toothpick. The once bright red face from the heat stroke returned to its white color matching her body. Her satisfied gestures gave off a bewitching impression. A bewitching one not suited for a maid. Beside her was the imposing girl, with a happy face as she drank her after meal tea. Al asked the woman. Although he didn't even know her name, for some reason her words just now held a certain weight behind them. What do you mean useless? The woman, with a puzzled look as if asking how he couldn't know, said bluntly. There's no meaning to it, is what I mean so then what do you mean there's no meaning to it? 
Despite thinking that she was going around the question, Al kept stacking questions, so the woman tilted her head to the side. What? Isn't your goal to exterminate the dragon? Or am I misunderstanding? There's no misunderstanding. I'm going to defeat the dragon and become a hero Al said so with confidence but the woman returned a bitter smile. She thought that he was joking. However, to Al who was serious, began to receive her smile with disdain. It probably showed on his face, as the woman blinked her eyes and bowed her head. Ara, I'm sorry. To defeat a dragon and become a hero. It is a spectacular dream regardless of that, what do you mean it is useless? Receiving the apology, Al instantly got rid of any irritation he held and asked her for a second time. This time, the woman replied. If you enter the mountain in huge groups, the Dragon King will be alerted so you mean because of that King Dragon King Kazakh will hide deeper inside the mountains? Well who knows? Maybe he will come out himself to face them. However, it is most likely that he won't care about what the humans are doing. So it won't end within one day. One week to two weeks, if we look at it long it may even be a month before they find the King Dragon King. The groups that left the search for him will come back to resupply so you should start your search after they come back here. At least that's what I would do if you go to search in one big crowd, never mind the King Dragon King, the Red Dragon's kings will be agitated and the group will have no choice but to fight them. Each of those groups could probably take in on two to three Dragon Kings but there will undoubtedly be chaos in the mountain. Therefore, it would be safer to go alone when no one is there and it would take not much labor to search the mountain to the top. This is what the woman was implying. As for gathering information, using the traces that the other groups left behind should be enough. Well, even if you know it's futile I know your feeling of being left behind won't go away. So go at it. Kapu the woman said so as she indecently burped. Al understood her words and sat back down on his seat. I wish to hear your side in more detail. My name is Alex equals Ryback. I'm called Al by others Ryback, Ryback? I feel like I've heard of that somewhere. Wasn't that the name of some famous noble in the countryside? Yes, even in my hometown it is mostly a forgotten family name. I wouldn't think that someone in a faraway foreign country like this would know of us are you perhaps from the northern side? Sorry to assume based on your facial appearance but I would assume you are from the Tetsigan cold plains of the vast northern lands of course not, it's more to the east I see, you really come from the rural areas she has never been to a country that is to the east of the Tetsigan cold plains. The map she had thought of in her head basically matched her thoughts my apologies for the late thanks regarding your help. Thank you Al and hello. My name is Shayna. Shayna equals Marion she elegantly bowed with a bewitching smile fixed on her face. My occupation is that of a wandering knight. You could also say I'm a mercenary, but more or less I am still a knight she said as she stretched out her hand. Al responded and they both shook their hands. A wandering knight ha. Huh? That's very cool what's with the maid outfit. Was what he wanted to say but he swallowed his words. It isn't that good of a job. The bad thing is I can't join any order of knights. Kind of like a homeless knight a knight is someone who devotes their life to their king. Whether it is from doing deeds of merit in battle or being talented with a sword, there are many reasons but it isn't something that anyone can become. Only those who are respectfully polite and know proper manners slash etiquette would be able to hold the title of one. A knight is different from a mercenary. They are just fundamentally different. A knight isn't all about fighting. Unlike the crude mercenary, the noble knight would have to help out during festivals and rituals. When negotiations are to be made with other countries, if a knight isn't available for escort, usually a wandering one would be hired to do the job instead. It depends on the wandering knight but usually countries would expect them to take rough tasks like mercenaries. She would most likely be someone not just with manners, but one who could be reliable in battle as well. Al could sense it just by grasping her hand. This hand wasn't something that was used to holding up a ceremonial sword during a ritual. This was one that actually wielded a sword. That's why Al brightly laughed. To joke about not being able to join any order of knights, you are popular aren't you? Shayna rubbed Al's hand in intrigue. 
Even you Alcoon, you must be quite skilled, taking on the task to slay a dragon yup, I'm strong you know to say so with your own words. You must be really confident because it would be impossible to win without confidence and resolution Al said as he took his hand back. Thank you for the meal at the same time, a cup was placed on the table. The imposing faced girl took one deep breath and looked at Al with a piercing gaze. In reality, it was her just sending a mere gaze, but it was more fitting to say she sent a piercing one. It was truly a powerful observation from her. Thanks to you I survived. Cheeky's name is Cheeky Ta. Remember it she said as she stretched out her hand to Al, Cheeky works as an assassin. I had a job to do here Al's hand stopped for a brief moment. But then again, there is difference in status regarding one's occupation. Assassination is also a job, it is different from ill-intended murder. I'm Alex equals Ryback. You can call me Al, Cheeky San got it. Al. But to carry two people and walk in the wasteland. You must have some great stamina. What do you eat to become like that? It's nothing like that. I only carried the both of you for a short distance Al said so as if it was nothing. Even though it's a wasteland, it's only a week-long trip. Anyone with enough water, food and equipment could walk through it. To Al, he couldn't understand why the place was called the Wasteland of Death by travelers. For a wasteland like that, there are no how ways to do the trip no hows. For instance, you could eat those sand bugs that feast on the corpses. They provide great nutrition as well Cheeky looked at him in disgust and took away her hand. To eat something that has been feasting on dead bodies is like eating the corpse itself. There's a limit to the strange things one can eat. You can fish the sand bugs with some dried jerky. They live underground, at the innermost damp part so they have plenty of fluid as well. They are a must for anyone traveling the wasteland Cheeky shaked her head with a disgusted look on her face. Cheeky is a city girl. I don't want to eat any bugs is that so? Well in my hometown, everyone eats it like a normal meal. But can't say it is tasty. So I get what you mean it wasn't a matter of taste, but seeing Al understanding it the way he did, Cheeky couldn't say a word. Cheeky wasn't rude enough to complain about the hobbies of the person she just met that had saved her life. To collapse from refusing to eat sand bugs. You're not that good at traveling are you Cheeky San? That's not true. Cheeky is a great assassin. I just had a little miss this time around I see. Is it the same for you too as well Shayna San? Al passed off the conversation to Shayna who was quietly listening to their conversation. It wasn't a miss for me you know. I was provoked by others telling me there was no way I could traverse the wasteland with that armor so I pushed myself through it. The sorry state I was in was what happened because I refused to give up then what would you have done if you died? Shayna showed no concern for Al's surprised reaction and responded smoothly. Well I survived like this so there's no problem is there? It's as the knight says said Cheeky with a loud voice. That may be true, Al observed the self-proclaimed great assassin as he spoke. I see. Her demeanor is sharp. Though I can't truly understand how skillful she is. She definitely isn't an amateur that only boasts around proclaiming herself as a great assassin in the streets. Though she said she came here for a job, Al didn't ask her who she came to kill as he wasn't really interested. Although a hero is someone who saves others, he is not one that can deny murder. Al could kill someone while saving another. With Cheeky killing someone, there might be a possibility where another would be saved. Thinking about it one step further, it's all the same. Whether it is Al or Cheeky, both are just doing their jobs. By the way Al what is it? For some reason with informal expression although you are my savior, Cheeky has no money if you are talking about paying for this place, you don't have to worry about it Cheeky shook her head. Although there's that. Cheeky's life has been saved by you that's true Cheeky's job is to snatch other people's lives. So there is a value on every life. That's why since you saved me. I must compensate you with something equal in return. Do you understand? I understand if there's a fee to be paid for destroying something, the same could be said for making it as well. If there is a money to be had for killing someone, you can't say that there is no money to be had when someone is saved. Such are her values as an assassin. 
but I'm not some professional helper so I don't need the money Fumu, but if nothing can be given, Chiki won't be able to settle down even if you say so, demand something for yourself, was what Al had interpreted from her. He put his hand on his chin and soon came up with an idea. If you're going to keep insisting, please pay me with your body what? Chiki's eyes widely opened her eyes and blushed. She was petrified for a few seconds and then started looking around, finding the woman next to her staring at Al with a cold gaze and held her tongue. She closed her eyes. Is that so, my body, so it will be. But, as you can see Cheeky is very thin so I don't know if Al is going to be satisfied. Are you okay with it? Please don't be so humble by saying you are thin. I carried Cheeky San all the way here remember? You have the wonderful body like that of a flexible yet tough spring and one that is full of youthfulness is is that so? That's the first time someone said that to me. You sure are passionate. Hmm. I've simulated this before with my eyes several times, but to hear this face to face is still embarrassing. Ah, so, ah, uh, that's right. Be gentle with me on the bed, okay? Cheeky dyed her face red and fidgeted her body as she looked at Al with upturned eyes. Al tilted his head in confusion. Bed? No, I plan to have you work hard in the mountain mountain. Cheeky was astonished. She was this girl that had superficial knowledge on sex. To her, it was something to be had indoors, but to do so outdoors was the skills of someone advanced in the act. This was the first time Cheeky has ever felt embarrassed. At least, Al cut off her uneasy voice. It's okay. It's my first time too. That's why it has to be the mountain hearing Al's words that brimmed with confidence, Cheeky's heart was in shock. Since the day they were born, for living beings to have intercourse day after day was their way of repeating evolution and what not. Thinking back on it, there's this feeling that quite a few people who told her about this. Underneath the blue sky, feeling liberated but being aroused by the impending danger was the best way of doing it. Something like that anyways. That's the reason why, is it, sorry for not being well informed but is it okay to have your first in the mountains? I've also yearned for something like a castle. A castle occupied by an old demon king located in the deep parts of the forest ho, ho. That's as romantic indeed. Umu, that I can understand but, it wouldn't be dragon slaying if it isn't in a mountain dragon slaying? Hearing a word that she didn't hear before, Cheeky raised her lowered head. The opponent is the king dragon king Kazak. He can't be approached by ordinary means. I need some comrades along the way you know after the clock's needle passed by for three seconds, Cheeky's flushing cheeks returned to their normal colors. She scowled at the female knight sitting beside her, who was covering her mouth from laughter. Hey knight. Did Cheeky look like a fool just now? You looked very foolish, humph. Cheeky feels the same way breathing out once with her nose. Cheeky folded her arms and returned her gaze back to Al. Just a little, she lifted her chin up as if she was looking down on him. Dragon slaying. Very well. Cheeky's expertise is targeted towards humans, but if you take me, there will be things I will be useful for. I'll work my life's value thank you very much I'll bow deeply to the girl much younger than him. Although he had confidence of fighting the king dragon king by himself, if someone got there first, it would be all for nothing. For tracking, it is much more advantageous to have the many people help out. Better two people than one, better three than two. Al's gaze looked toward Shayna. And so, Shayna San Shayna distur her face in refusal. What? I don't want any part of it, but Shayna San, you came here for the dragon slaying, right? Your observation before of seeing the truth from the knots was very impressive. Please by all means, lend me your strength and, oh. My principle is to never carry a burden a complete refusal. She isn't bargaining. There is nothing she wants from this. But Al won't give up. She is experienced. Not to say that she has experience in dragon slaying but she knows how to outmaneuver the many groups ahead and reach for victory. Al is confident on bringing down the dragon but getting to it first is not something he can be confident of and is out of his expertise. Al wants to slay a dragon not search for it. For searching the dragon, she will be reliable. 
he wants to bring her to his side by all means necessary. If it's not possible, it is what it is, is what he would usually think, but with Cheeky lending her hand just before this, he wants to push his luck a bit. That being said, how will he persuade her? Al with his worries had no words to say. Hey Knight. Do your principles outweigh your life? The assistance came from right nearby. It was Cheeky. Shayna looked up to Cheeky as if she was scowling at her and made a bitter smile with a what? On her eyebrows. If you say it like that, it's pretty difficult if that's the case, you should help out. Or do you want to hoard the reward for yourself? It's not like that. There's no way I can single-handedly defeat a dragon king, but uh, how should I explain this? Shayna folded her arms and groaned. She had her own reason for approaching things as such, so her declining his request accordingly was something that even Al had assumed. You have to pay back those who save your life. A knight is an occupation that works with their duty and honor. This is even true for a wandering knight. But there must be a reason why she refuses despite all this. What is your reason for wanting to slay the dragon? Al Kun right after her groan, she asked such a question. Even if you ask why I want to, Al bitterly smiled, is it for money? No. It may be awkward for me to say myself, but I'm from a wealthy family, so I don't mind giving up the money reward, you know? He said so freely. Ara, you sure are generous. Then is it the sword made by the demon blacksmith? No. This treasured sword that I carry has been handed down my family for hundreds of years and is my partner. At the very least, unless it breaks, I won't be needing a new one inch he said freely as he touched the hilt of the sword placed on his back. To not desire anything from this. I can only doubt that you plan to do something devious I do have desired is that so? Then what do you want? I want to become a hero. So what I want, is fame fame? Ha! Ah. That word made Shayna laugh. This time, it was a really scorn-filled smile. Even Al knows what it means to be famous or a hero in these times. Fame. It is not something that is simply obtainable. It's something that sticks on like a stone weight over time. If you expose yourself to the battlefield, anyone has the chance of obtaining it which made it a very common thing. If you live on the battlefield, you will surely obtain it. Fame is something like that. Al received the scorn-filled smile, but this time, he did not have the displeased face as before. If she showed such scorn while carrying light feelings, Al would be irritated as well. But in her case, it was something much heavier. She probably has ill feelings to the word fame. What will you do by obtaining something like that? Obtaining fame, and being called a hero, then what? No matter how it is said, defeating the King Dragon King Kazakht, and earning fame to be called the hero of dragon slaying holds meaning there's no way something like that can, there is one owl repeated once again while biting his lips. For Shayna to have ill feelings towards the word is fine. But there is nothing wrong with wanting to earn fame. And as for what owl wants, it is not something that could be simply said and generalized. It was something personal, something like a personal idol of sorts. So, owl just stared at Shayna. Wah, what? Shayna closed her mouth. She stuttered. Taking a breath. There is a meaning. At the very least, for me Al would only say that much. If there was no meaning, he wouldn't bring himself all the way over here. To become a hero holds meaning. For it to not have one is not an option. Al yearns to become a hero, but he doesn't want to become one just by yearning. He didn't have the confidence to put those complex feelings into words. Al wasn't good with words. He would try to start by explaining from the beginning, but would get lost himself along the way. However, there was one thing that he could say. Please. The King Dragon King is my father's lifelong enemy Al said so and bowed his head. How long did he bow down for? Shayna relaxed her shoulders. All right. Going as far to say that much, I'll help you out then. As Al elevated his face died with joy, Shayna sighed ah and looked up at the ceiling. She had a face that she would make when during conflicts, the scales of fate that sided with no one would in the end choose a path for her that she didn't wish to take. But promise me one thing. This isn't a simple give and take. 
It's a promise. If you protect this promise, never mind the dragon slaying, I'll continue to always be your companion. It is a very important promise for me to protect something to Al who obediently nodded in agreement, Shayna sent a weak gaze. It looked as she was about to cry. It's simple contrary to her face, she said something truly simple, something that sounded simple. If at any point, if you feel a danger or risk, I want you to leave me behind and run away, Al smiled brightly. So that's it, that's what you meant he replied immediately. The girl on the side watching all of this unfold was sure that the boy who held justice to such a high regard would reject such a promise immediately. He would shake his head and tell her it was impossible for him to leave her behind. That's no problem for me right after he muttered those words, Cheeky spurted her teeth from her mouth all over Al's face. Chapter 2, The Collapsed Ladies, Part 2 Shayna equals Marion is a wandering knight. She is 23 years old. She became a knight at the age of 13. Though her home country held a history of 50 years, it fell to ruin following the year of her appointment to knighthood. With her entire clan massacred, Shayna was the only survivor. The girl had a natural gift. The gift of survival. She was unusually aware of impending death. She scents out the smell of death and evades it as easily as others would breathe. At that day, when her home country fell, the imperial castle was set ablaze. An approaching flame with advancing enemy soldiers. In such a dire situation, she, a novice knight, was in the very center of such chaos. She could remember carrying her sword and running. Whether it was towards the enemy or away from them, she could not remember. But she did know that with her sword in hand, she ran as if she was dragging her heavy armor along with her. As she approached the three-forked road leading to the nobles ahead, she sensed something and came to a halt. As she stopped, a blazing beam from the ceiling fell down before her at the same time. The beam had fell right before her eyes. If she didn't stop, it would have been fatal. Looking at the beam in front of her with astonishment, she didn't hesitate to jump over it. After the jump was a sea of flames, but she didn't even have time to think about mustering up the courage and leaped inside. At the same time, soldiers appeared from behind. But thanks to the fire covering up her presence, they did not notice her and ran off to the distance. It was no coincidence. For some reason, Sharia knew this. If I keep at it like this, I'll be saved that same ability showed its strength for the past ten years. In little increments, it manifested its power during times where she had worked in various countries as a wandering knight. And thanks to it, she had become a well-known wandering knight at the young age of 25. Also known as a notorious wandering knight. It was a humiliating matter. There were two kinds of famous wandering knights. The first being someone that calls out to the country that matches his ability, a man who makes room for such opportunity. Once a country that needs him heeds his call, they openly invite him to become a knight in their kingdom. The majority of them are this type. Humans are greedy beings. If they know that their name is famous, it is not unlikely that they will join a country that treats them the best. The other one is someone with a fault in personality or nature, one who does not call out to a country. As competent as their incomplete ability is to others, their name gains notoriety and the prejudices and rumors makes it impossible for them to be hired in the conventional manner. And as humiliating as that may be, this was the type of knight that Shayna was. Well, it isn't really that their call isn't heard. There are seasons where ceremonies need to begin and when there are times where supply of labor is short, and if she applies for the job as a knight, Shayna could also secure an appointment. Such miscellaneous matters are made to appoint those who hold the title of a knight. A knight's official employment comes when after finishing the task, the country asks them to stay and appeal their desire to employ them officially. An efficient way of recruiting unknown but talented wandering knights, recently this has been the most popular method of doing so. Currently, every country is looking for capable people, but you can't tell how good they are if you don't put them to work. So they hire wandering knights and if they are satisfied with their work ethic, they will prepare a vacant seat in the knight's order and welcome them officially. It is an easy to understand method. The Dragon King Kingdom's Royal Knight's Order also used this method to gain power. 
As for Shayna, she never caught such a call. There were times during tasks where such hopeful voices were heard such as if only you were an official knight in my country. But by the time the task ended, the once lent out hand became no more. Please think nothing of what I said before. She didn't know how many times she had heard such words. It was humiliating indeed. Now, the reason why such a girl came to the Dragon King Kingdom is because she had heard talks of the famous dragon slaying mission in the around town. The Dragon King Kingdom had agreed to the Master Blacksmith's goal of using the Dragon King to make his swords. Though it is not known what was exactly said behind closed doors, for the country to lend its cooperation meant that the Royal Knight's Order was making their move. It was a chance. If the Royal Knight's Order makes a move, it means that the Dragon King Kingdom will be holding a recruitment campaign. With the Dragon King Kingdom being such a large nation, their Knight's Order insists on holding great value to true strength. Instead of relying on rumors and prejudice, if she shows her true strength, they may even hold the heart to recruit someone like Shayna, who has such an infamous reputation. Furthermore, this involves her strong suit of fighting. Her eyes were set on her long-awaited dream. An official appointment. Once she heard of the rumor, she decided not to lose her chance and began moving. However, the region where she first heard the rumor was a place too far away. Despite using shortcuts within shortcuts, she was too slow, not to mention whether she would be able to arrive in time for either the recruitment campaign or for the first day of the Dragon King slaying mission. Eventually she forcefully pushed herself only to end up with the so-called result. She had even unsightly collapsed in the end. And the man who had saved her. He still held the vibes of a boy. Most likely eighteen or seventeen. Young. He had carried Shayna and another girl all the way to this town. Was it his astonishing strength and stamina, or was it his courage? Thinking of the time when she had crossed that deadly wasteland, she could only admire the power he had to help others. As someone who hadn't saved anyone else's life but her own, Shayna began to hold interest towards the boy. Though he was difficult to understand at times, gleefully saying that he wanted to become a hero, she thought that she could loosen up her principles around him a little. Such was the great interest she had of him. Two days after Al's group had formed, Shayna and the rest passed by those who came back to resupply and got out of town. Although the so-called negotiation slash promise was disagreed upon, they somehow agreed to run away together if things get dangerous afterwards, and it helped her calm down. Now, they are in the mountain. Originally, there would be no road here but they are walking on the road created by those who came before them. Seeing the rivals that passed by, the groups that seemed to have the most chance at success did not have any significant losses. However, those who thought of taking advantage of such groups took heavy damage from the fight against the Dragon Kings. Among them were people who were being carried on a stretcher with fatal wounds. With that being said, there are probably a lot dead as well. It's as you said Shayna Al said so with a voice of concern, but to Shayna it was heard as you knew the answer. If they had left on the first day in high spirits, she knew that they would have more or less suffered like these people. Without being on the same pace, a group only gathered by one same goal would end up in such danger. Nevertheless, she didn't have a basis for her decision. It's just vagueness and danger. It's useless, you shouldn't go, is what she had thought. There's no need to dismiss such intuition. Although her reasoning may be vague, her intuition had never been wrong once. If she had ever been wrong before, she wouldn't be alive right now. That being said, I guess the true contenders really are different as if he was remembering the groups that came back, he began repeatedly praising the skillful groups. Despite being the first day, there were certainly those with astonishing battle feats. Occasionally, a group of Blue Leopard mercenaries with around a dozen members would be carrying back a total of three Dragon King crowns. Although this dragon slaying mission wasn't such a contest, it still did its job in awing everyone around them. Shayna could remember Al's glittering eyes when he had saw them pass by. Even amongst the Blue Leopard division, those guys are extraordinary. I guess they gathered the cream of the crop ha huh? as Shayna said so, Al made a confused expression. Cream of the crop? No way, there wasn't anyone that looked that strong amongst them Arara, stop bluffing will you? 
Shayna let out an unintentional laugh and said so teasingly, as if she had seen a kid reacting to someone being praised by saying, Hmph, I'm way stronger than they are. And so, Al pouted and began to deny her claims. I don't bluff about my strength. It's just, it's just. It just didn't seem that they would have offensive capability to bring down the King Dragon King Shayna judged the statement as if it came from someone who didn't want to admit their loss. If I wanted to do it, I can do at least that much too. She felt as if this was exactly the kind of words Al wanted to say. If you could do it, it would be best to prove it, but to say you want to do it somewhere where no one would be looking, Shayna grumbled as such internally. All right, all right. But I don't plan on fighting multiple dragon kings with just the three of us. If things get dangerous, we run. Remember to keep your promise of course, I understand. I alone am enough to fight against them all so there will be no danger. Leave it to me come on Shayna's side. Extreme vanity isn't such a great sight to see, and if she leaves it be, this boy will most likely end up thrusting himself into a crowd of dragon kings. Though she can't sense any danger at the moment, Shayna made plans for such events in her mind. She planned to hit the boy from behind and make an all-out run for it. Right now, they are approaching the meeting of two paths in the Dragon King Mountain. This whole region is still on the outskirts of the Dragon King territory and is covered in green. Knowing that a bit further east lies the wasteland, it is miracle how many trees there are in this region. In truth however, it is not as miraculous as one may think. Taking the shape of the mountain into account, it is most likely that the rain only falls on this side of the mountain. One theory is that the King Dragon King Kazakh sucked all the mana out of the wasteland to preserve his powerful mana. Though it is nothing more than a mere superstition, we are talking about an ancient dragon that has leaped beyond the human mind. Surprisingly, he may actually be doing this. No way right, Shayna thought so intensely as she glanced at Al to the side. What if he actually believes this story and plans to become a hero because of it? For example, by restoring the wasteland to its former green pastures, he could save a couple starving in poverty, ridiculous, Shayna shook off her notions. First of all, that's not what it means to be a hero. Stop said Cheeky who was ten meters away with the palm of her hand facing towards the group. Cheeky immediately lowered her back. If the person leading the front tells everyone to stand still, it is common sense to follow suit. Though Shayna's instincts hadn't sensed anything yet, however, Al started walking towards Cheeky as if he hadn't heard the stop and placed his hand on her small head. Oi, if I tell you to stop, stop. Why do you think Cheeky is the one staying on the front? Also, don't put your hand on my head. Are you making fun of me for being small? I'm not making fun of you Cheeky-san. You're just really small and cute by night, get this kid to stop treating me like a child Shayna shrugged her shoulders and caught up with them. Looks like there was no danger after all. It's fine isn't it? Just take it like the cutie you or what? Leaving Cheeky who was voicing her displeasure to the side, Shayna began to look forward. Wait. There was danger up ahead. It was five corpse eaters who had just been alerted by the rowdiness and started groaning. Corpse eaters are four-legged dog-like beasts. Their face is both similar and not so similar to that of a dog. With a three-section lower jaw and two-section upper jaw, they pick on corpses and bugs as their food. Just imagining how they eat sent shivers down Shayna's spine. Gururu, they got their name Corpse Eater from favoring dead flesh, but their ancestors were heretic monsters made by magicians of the past during the Great War to counter the demon race's artificial undead monsters. Though recently they have evolved to become more independent, their ferocious behavior still matches that of their past ancestors. First off, they hunt in packs. Though since they prefer corpses, they do not actively go hunt for prey. But if they are interrupted during their feast, they will gather a pack of three or more of their kin and attack the intruder. When they are eating, corpse eaters are cold-hearted and fierce. And apparently, right now they were in the middle of their feast. Seeing the five angry corpse eaters approaching them while glaring, Cheeky's cheeks puffed up. Cheeky tried to tell you to stop enough with that and lower yourselves. Shayna screamed as she pulled out her sword and stood in front of both of them. At that moment, the five corpse eaters kicked the ground. 
one charges at the front while two follow behind. The leftover two begin to encircle them from both sides. It's to make sure there is no way to escape. They are fast, and seem to move with experience. A five beast hunt. Living in a place where dragons dwell, they move as veteran group hunters of this harsh region. What strong specimen. Watch out. As she alerted the two at her rear and one beast leaped forward. There was no time for hesitation. Shayna pursued the beast and leaped. North God-style reverse technique first Dan, sliding avalanche. She went above the beast and aimed for the corpse eater in mid-air. To take the upper side of a leaping opponent. One can see that it is a useless act. For legged beasts who leap end up exposing their defenseless underbelly. So, the right response would be to cut through the lower side accordingly. But Shayna leaped above. This was because she saw the two corpse eaters hiding behind the shadow of the leaping first beast, preparing to attack from below. A simultaneous attack from above and below. Furthermore, the two attacking from behind will arrive faster than the one who leaped forward. Humans are not adept at dealing with enemies above their heads. Being occupied with the first beast, no matter how dexterous, they would still fall behind. That was how perfect the attack was. Even humans who hold much pride in their teamwork would not be able to perform such a beautiful combination. And someone who could respond to such an attack would be Shayna, who had been trained to deal with such crisis with her ability. Thanks to her instincts, she knew that they would attack from below. Daria Aoiya. As if she was dancing, she landed one straight cut towards the neck. It was only to the degree of landing a small cut into the artery, but it was enough to take a life. Even if these beasts were made from heretical arts, their weaknesses are still similar to that of a dog. The corpse eater landed and collapsed while spilling a geyser of blood. Boo! The two remaining corpse eaters lost sight of Shayna. By being above the beast that had initially leaped forward, she was able to secure a blind spot. It wouldn't take them one second to find her, but it was enough time for fatality. North God-style righteous Techink second Dan. Heavenly Flower Circle Shayna disposed the two beasts with one stroke of her sword. The point of her sword that had cut a bit short earlier inserted itself into the windpipe of one beast below, and with a circular movement cutting upwards, she used that same force to drive into the head of the second beast, breaking its skull. Are the both of you dash the remaining two beasts? Shayna immediately looked around her surroundings, worrying about her companion's safety. It seems you guys are fine the remaining two beasts were already lying defeated on the ground. The one in front of Cheeky had all its limbs sliced off. By the time Shayna looked, it was still breathing but Cheeky with a blank expression and a weird knife at hand, ended its life with a thrust. In front of Al stood a headless corpse. With blood coming out of its neck, its head was nowhere to be found. She looked at her surroundings to find it but to no avail. A headless dog and a silver-armored knight without a hint of blood on him. If one were to change their perspective, it could be quite a fantastical view. If it was a noble with a perverted hobby, they would most likely be holding a painting similar to this very scene she was witnessing. During the short time she watched, the once-alerted Cheeky began to relax and go limp. What is it, knight? Are you our parental guardian or something? Cheeky said so mockingly as she wiped the blood off her knife and on Cheeky's head rested a hand. Well well Cheeky-san, worrying about your companion's safety after defeating an enemy up ahead is the right thing to do El said as he stroked her head. Moo? Does that mean that we are the bad ones for not worrying about her safety? That being said, stop stroking my head I can't stroke your head. It's not that you can't. It's not like it's something that decreases in quantity. If Al wants to stroke my head, you should do it to the degree that it won't become a hindrance to our work. But you are not stroking my head because you want to, but because my head is at the right place at the right time. I'm glad that both of you aren't hurt Al gave off a fresh smile. Cheeky's face turned red and screamed so I was right ha. Huh? What do you think a person's head is ha? Huh? Shayna looked at the scene with a bittersweet smile and laid her gaze towards Al's sword on his back. She never paid attention to it until now but the blade seems to be over a meter long. To draw, make stance, cut and sheath. 
the bigger the sword is, the more time it takes to make such movements. A sword of that size would make such faults pretty noticeable. The sword that Shayna holds has a single short blade with a length of only 50 centimeters. The reason why it is curved is because her fighting style emphasizes on the speed of drawing her sword and slashing. And thanks to it, even when fighting against three corpse eaters, she is able to keep up in speed. If she were to hold a sword the size of Al's, she would have had a hard time fending off the three beasts. I wonder when he pulled it out, swords carried on the back are heavier than those carried on the side. Such were the words of one famous swordsman. Swords on the back are much harder to draw than those on the side. There is a good reason why swords are generally carried on the side. Wait, but wasn't he carrying the sword on his side when we left the inn? Huh? Al, why are you carrying your sword on your back? Didn't you have it on your side earlier? Before Shayna could open her mouth, Cheeky asked. She probably asked out of reflex. That's right. Al was holding the sword to his side just earlier. She remembered thinking that he was carrying such an unnecessary long object just to flaunt. Oh this, Fufu, it's a secret Al said so secretly and moved the sheath in a circle from his back. Suddenly, the sword appeared at his side. Ooh. Cheeky raised her voice in admiration. A mechanical sheath. And a technique to make such movements. Shayna remembered seeing the technique before. But no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't tell from who. It wasn't something used by the knights she had fought. It was something that couldn't be forgotten at first sight. Where did I see it? At the very least, it is not a technique shown by ordinary folks as a way of showing off. By the way, Shayna Sands School. Is it the North God style? Shayna's thoughts were interrupted by Al's question. Yep, you're right she wanted to congratulate him on finding out so easily but soon remembered that she shouted her school name as she used the techniques. Her master would always tell her to shout the technique names, and it had become a habit to do so. It wasn't something that was too out of place though, after all it was the disciples' responsibility to spread the name of the school. The North God style is sure rare isn't it? Where did you learn it? The first dojo I entered was the North God style. Now that I think of it, I've never met any fellow students of the school, my father was also a member of the North God style that is, what to say, as Shayna stopped in her tracks, Cheeky raised her voice. Oi Al, and night the two of them looked towards the voice. Cheeky began approaching the area where the corpse eaters had gathered. Look, it's their food the place was a wide open space created in the middle of the woods. It probably wasn't like this from the beginning. Multiple trees blown away by sheer force, the scorched earth, one could tell that this was originally a small space only used by animals that wanted to cross. The reason why this place had such a huge space burned open was most likely due to the rampage of dragon kings. How many dragon kings rampaged? The answer was on top of the surface, with all the scattered human remains. This disastrous open space were the remains of a battle. Although more or less eaten by the corpse eaters, the corpses still had most of their original form intact. The smell of rot was not strong either. This corpse, it seems to belong to a member of the magician group Shayna affirmed accordingly. Robes that held a color that couldn't be differentiated from being burnt, unnaturally scorched surroundings, depressed earth, wet branches despite it not raining. These were definitely traces of magic. It seems they fought numerous dragon kings and lost I wonder how many they fought taking the scope of the battle into consideration, probably three to five as Shayna replied, she began to feel a little odd. If it were three to five dragon kings, it is probably right. Anything more than that would increase the scope of the battle and in turn would open up the area a lot more. If there were less, it would be the opposite. But it's still weird. There was no way a magician group like the Grass World Leaf Tree would be defeated by such few dragon kings. They are a group of magicians specialized in battle. Battle magicians are just simply strong. They are different from the novice magicians that became adventurers because they had nothing else do. The title of magician is given to anyone that can use magic, but to become battle magician requires a strict examination from the magician's association. 
these magicians remember all their magic by heart to prepare for battle. Combustion, freeze, impact types are some examples of the variety of attack spells they know. As for defense, they use bulwark, holy, regional types in healing, flying, haste types for support spells. The highest ranked battle magicians would also learn martial arts that put warriors to shame, so the notion that magicians are weak in melee combat does not exist. They are adept at staff wielding martial arts, hold high enough concentration to chant spells during hand to hand combat, and durable enough stamina to execute such spells. Surely, swordsmen mature faster and as long as there are techniques to defend against magic, the swordsman is stronger if they are on the same level of training. However, in terms of fighting monsters, a magician engaged in battle holds much more advantage than the swordsman. The Effectiveness of Magic For example, there is a spell called Fire Lance. This spell transforms fire into a lance, and while holding its mass, it pierces through the enemy with intense heat. This spell becomes stronger as the heat gets higher and higher. However, it is useless against a human opponent. This is because it doesn't take much heat to kill a human and if the opponent is armed with anti-fire magic equipment, it wouldn't matter how much the heat is raised and the spell would be nullified. Of course such equipment is very expensive so no individual would be able to put their hands on one, but the possibility of such an event occurring is still important. On the other hand, such a high power attack is very useful against monsters. Especially when it comes to gigantic beasts like Dragon Kings, whom have a huge body surface and capacity, making it hard for the average swordsman to land a one-hit kill. However, with magic, landing such a fatal blow is much easier to accomplish. There's also a problem when it comes to a dragon's physical defenses. The scales that are near impossible to cut open with a sword could be destroyed with a well-prepared spell. To get back to the point, it isn't likely that four or five dragon kings were enough to win against a magician group that had their eyes set on dragon slaying. However, the magician group was defeated and their corpses laid on the field. What a weird occurrence. For a group that should have held an overwhelming advantage to be laying dead without a single dragon corpse in sight. To find out the reason why, Shayna began to search each corpse. Exclamation point. She had found the reason on one of the corpses. The body of a man with a surprised face. A corpse wrapped in a high-quality robe, grasping tightly to a high-grade staff. A sword wound and it was an ambush to the back. A wound that a dragon king would not be able to inflict. Then why would they have such a wound? There is still something weird going on. The number of corpses. If Shayna's memory served right, the magician group held around 30 members. The corpses fallen here don't even cover half that amount. It was possible that the Dragon Kings ate them, but Shayna suspected the intrusion of a third party. It was thanks to them that the corpses had been concealed. The theory was as such a group holding ill intentions towards the magician group attacked and annihilated them while they fought the Dragon Kings. To erase their own tracks, they made it look like as if the Dragon Kings were the ones responsible for the massacre. The rest of the missing corpses were probably burnt or buried. The one body she had just found was most likely a result of them leaving it behind thinking that the corpse eaters would come to eat away at the evidence around three days later. Putting whether it is the correct answer or not aside, the undeniable truth is, is that a magician was attacked in the back by a sword. Then the question is, who is responsible? Logically, the most likely suspect would be the Blue Leopard Division that came back with three to four Dragon King heads. It matches the number of Dragon Kings that attacked this area. The least suspicious group would be martial arts group that only use their bare hands. Though that isn't to say that it would be impossible for them to inflict such a sword wound. After all, they are closer to swordsmen than they are to magicians. Nevertheless, they who view swordsmen as weak men who rely on weapons and despise the use of swords, would it be possible for them to use such tools to harm someone from behind? The possibility is slim to none. Perhaps it wasn't the work of a group. Maybe it was the work of a serial killer inside one of the dragon slaying groups. They would have most likely approached the magician group during their fight against the dragons and massacred them on the spot. If one were to think too seriously of any coincidence, the possibilities would be endless. Huh.
Shayna just realized that her two fussy companions were out of her sight. She thought that she had left them behind, but there was no need for such concern. They were standing on the other side of a tree with a thick trunk. They are staring at the roots of the tree for some reason. Looking closely she found three corpse eaters laying dead around them. What happened? Well, it's that Cheeky held a confused expression. Al nodded his head in assurance. As Shayna walked around the tree to where they stood, she saw a tree hollow. Inside the tree hole was a little girl wrapped in a tattered robe. A survivor Cheeky briefly explained, but anyone with an eye could see that. Though there were no noticeable wounds, she seemed worn out. Probably used up all her mana and stamina as well. Let's return for the day. We have to take care of this girl once we reach town and act without hesitation. A feeling of familiarity comes forth. A movement prioritizing one's safety while seemingly not caring about what their identity is or what event had occurred. Knowing she had been in a similar situation, Shayna instinctively opened her mouth. Is it your hobby to save people collapsed on the ground? Such an astonished voice was let out. Chapter 3 The Reaper Knight The next day, the girl woke up. She looked around the room with hazy eyes. There were two women in the room. One of them was a tan girl, around her same age. She was sitting on the bed next to the recently awoken girl, polishing the knives in front of her, one by one. Her figure looked like the one of a doctor who was about to perform a surgery. Or the one of a torturer selecting their instruments before doing their job. The recently awoken girl wondered if she was about to die. The other girl was on the opposite side. She had placed a chair beside her bed, and sat there while reading a book. From the neck up, she looked like a carefully raised girl from a well-to-do family, but if you looked at her completely, she gave the impression of being a castle's maid, who had dished her work, in order to read a popular novel. The main difference with an actual maid was the sword hanging on her belt, which she had even if we were indoors. Who was she? With such different people at her sides, she couldn't figure out where she was, or in what situation. The girl looked around once again. Her eyes met the girl with the knives. Oi, night. It looks like she's awake now in her bed, the girl saved by Alex heard, very faintly, the movement of a chair. From where the noise came, there was a woman standing. She held a jug. Good morning. Would you like some water? After being asked, the girl silently nodded. Her throat was very dry. The woman, in a way that showed her wealth of experience, put the pitcher in the girl's mouth, and gently poured small amounts of water, so as to not choke her. She did this two or three times, which was enough to satisfy the girl's thirst. Thank you, very much ah, so you can talk already. You're welcome the girl heard a bam, and looked around the room. The noise had come from the only door in the room, which was now closed. The girl with the knives had completely disappeared, as the girl in the bed wondered, since she hadn't heard any sound. When the girl tried to get up, pain spread through her whole body. Ugh? Are you okay? It wasn't a very bad injury, but, the knight said, looking at the girl, even if her voice didn't show any worry at all. She was right. When the girl tried to move, it was true that she felt a throbbing pain, but it wasn't like she couldn't move at all. It must have been a minor bruise after all. And thus, the girl got up. She felt a little dizzy but it wasn't for long. Here, where are we? An inn, in a town at the foot of the Dragon King Mountain it was a quick, good answer. As the girl looked over, she found that the woman wasn't looking at her anymore, and had sat down and started reading once again. The title was The Heroic Tale of the Northern God the Ode of Ruin, the Bard, was published ten years after his death. When the girl was younger, she had read a version for kids of that same tale. She fondly remembered the fight between the hero and the demon lord in the third section. That is the battle of the demon lord, who possessed an overwhelming power, and the hero, who wielded a sword that could defeat that enemy in a single hit. It was a fight that would be decided after only one hit. That is the story the bard Ruin continued to watch, even after realizing how powerless and worthless he was, against those who were about to fight. 
I don't know what's going on. Neither is moving. I can't move either. I can only feel the shiver down my spine. That was the sentence the girl remembered the most, as it had left an impression on her. Why did Ruhin part ways with the hero, at the end? After the girl asked that, the woman raised an eyebrow and closed the book in a rather violent manner. Don't speak about what's going to happen in front of those who are reading I'm sorry it was a story the girl had read many times, so she thought everyone knew how it ended. However, it seems that wasn't the case for the reading night. And then, someone knocked on the door. Without waiting for a reply, the girl with the knives from before entered the room. She entered the room quickly, without turning around even once. She then sat in front of the knives, just as she had been before. She looks like a boy, but her gestures are like a little animal's, and that's cute. Then, the recently arrived turned to the door and loudly said, Oi, Al, what are you doing? Hurry up and enter in response, a boy timidly peeked through the half-open door. Cheeky son, when you know on a door, you have to wait for a reply what are you talking about? It was Al who knocked, and this is the maid nights in my room. Why should I wait for a reply after knocking on the door of my own room? Because there's a guest. Excuse me, please the boy slowly looked around the room, and once he saw everything seemed to be fine, he finally entered. As he closed the door behind him, the woman who was reading silently let out a chuckle. You're very well behaved Alex shrugged after hearing this, and then replied, Even if I look like this, I come from a pretty well-off family, you know ah, uh, you had said something like that before the woman said that as she stood up and gave the chair to the boy. She then sat in the bed where the girl with the knives were. After the bed creaked, the tomboyish girl gave a disgusted look. The boy sat down, and giving the girl in the bed a smile, he said, Good morning. I am Alex Ryback, please feel free to call me Al Flowing Clouds m. Did something happen to the clouds? The boy said that as he turned around to look outside the window. However, it was a fine day for the weather, and the blue sky had not a single cloud on it. Wrong, name, mine is A. The girl tried her best to say those words. She sounded like she came from the headquarters of the magic organization, which were to the west of the northern land, and where the language was very different from where they now were. Her pronunciation was clumsy too, so Al had trouble understanding her. The woman with the book decides to help him. Al Kuhn, she said her name is Flowing Clouds Ah, so the way of the magician is, I see. Thank you very much, Shana San Alex nodded as if he had understood. A magician has, in addition to their real name, a special name as well. It is a practice that began with a superstition. That is, when you summon a devil, if you know its real name, it will be successfully summoned. However, were the devil to know your real name, it would be your soul that's summoned. That's why it became a custom to have another name, as to avoid many people knowing your real name, which could make your soul end up summoned in the devil world. Although it is true that some demons use pseudonyms as well, so it may not be a superstition at all. Nowadays, those alternative names are based on a combination of the person's magical prowesses, as well as their personality. For example, if someone was called Angry Earth, it is someone who is good at earth magic, as well as having a short fuse. The thing is, those names are not common at all, actually. That is because it isn't good that you can have your magic preference and personality identified from your name, especially if you're a combat-oriented magician. Shana thought. Flowing clouds. Someone who is easily influenced, and that manipulates clouds with their magic, or at least that's what she thought at first, but she knew it wasn't that easy. Flowing might have to do with being indecisive, that would make sense for flowing clouds. However, it could also be more like, flowing by one's will, kind of like a river. Clouds should be something related with wind or water magic, but it could also be spiders that create illusions or poison. I have a drifting personality and I'm good at cloud-related magic after hearing a pushing noise, flowing clouds watched as Shayna had pushed down Cheeky to the bed. The impact made a couple knives fall. Oi, Knight, it's dangerous, so stop. If you want to bother someone, go to the guy over there. Cheeky is busy right now Cheeky gets angry and kicks and flails. However, the maid knight is not a beginner at this, and the disparity in size is big. 
it's not an easy task, by any means. Chiki-chan is small and cute, isn't she? The woman said while poking fun at her, to which she was met with this response, stop. I'm going to stab you, bastard. And thus, a fight began in a bed where many knives were scattered. It was dangerous, but Al decided to ignore it. So, Kumo-san, yes? If you could please tell me about the events that happened over there, it's hard to think that a group of magician like yours could be wiped that easily against three or four dragon kings as Alex asked. Shayna, who had been revolting in the bed, stopped moving. She had just stripped Cheeky down to her underwear. Cheeky-chan, did you notice? The extent of your stupidity? I wish I had realized earlier wrong. The fact that those magicians couldn't be annihilated by a couple dragon kings, ah, that. There was some evidence around the bodies that showed they had been stunned with a blunt weapon. I thought the attackers might have been around, but it was a needless anxiety blunt weapon. Please say that kind of thing before. Even if I didn't say it, you did notice it. I wasn't aware of the traces of blunt instruments. To begin with, it's obvious there's a huge difference in how a knight like me and an assassin like you see things, hmm, I guess you're right. Be careful next time. Also, Cheeky isn't an assassin, but a hitman obediently nodding, Cheeky began to put her clothes in place. Shayna looked at that, and turned to look at Cloud, who remained silent after listening to the question. It was impossible to decipher what she was thinking, as her face only showed a vague expression. Her bluish-white hair is shaggy from sleeping, and her nightgown was worn out. A sleepy girl, it was erotic. Alex quietly admired the smile of such a girl. For Shayna, something looked strange with the person known as Al. The spark on the eyes for a kid at such an age, wasn't there. He was too much of a gentleman. As a knight, she had been blessed with the opportunity to speak with many aristocratic children. And not a single boy that age no matter how much of a gentleman he looked like, was able not to stare at a lady at times like that. That was not the case with Al. However, it's not like he was a gentleman in every sense, and he still had that childish dream of slaying a dragon and being a hero. It's an imbalance. About the battle, could it be that you remember anything? Ah, if you don't want to talk about it, it's fine, don't push yourself, please that's not it. Suddenly, a weird person attacked us from behind, a dragon came from the front, and then it all became a mess. I can't remember it well so it was like that. I really understand. Anyways, as of now, please take your time to recover Al said that, and slowly got up from his chair. A gentle smile was still showing in his face, as usual. When flowing clouds saw that, she felt a bit relieved. But Shayna felt a strange foreboding. She thought about it again, and it really felt like something was wrong with this guy called Alex. Although his dream was one of a child's, his words and actions weren't on the same page. Even when exploring the mountains, it's the same. The knight definitely thought he would be the leader type, but he let Cheeky go ahead without any issue whatsoever. It's not like he isn't bloodthirsty at all either. When they found the body, too. She thought he would be upset angry, or confused, but after all, he remained calm. And with that habit, of course he helped flow in clouds. There is nothing wrong with someone whose words and actions don't particularly agree, it's just ridiculous. Shayna shook her head to stop those thoughts. It didn't matter what type of personnel was, he was the savior of Shayna's life, after all. I'm getting hungry, so let's go for something to eat. Once we're done, al -Kun, will you go shopping with me? Sure. Then, Cheeky-san, could you please stay here and take care of her? Okay, leave it to me Shayna was still worried, but decided not to pay much attention to it. In the end, the truth behind the destruction of the group Grass World Leaf Tree was that other groups got together and attacked them when they were fighting. That's all it was. After all, the magic group was the best suited for the Dragon King's extermination. It was simply a difference in the attack power and the defensive capacities. They were members who came to hunt dragon kings. The measures against gravity magic, as well as for the fire breath, were perfect. They could also aid the exploration with magic, which would make them reach the Emperor Dragon King way faster than other groups. 
Also, it's important to know that any other group in that tavern is capable of doing such sabotage with a straight face. If Shayna were one of those group's leaders, she would probably mess with the other groups while slaying the dragons. It was not wrong to deal with other groups that shared your same task. However, the righteous man in this room could not allow such things to happen. I won't allow that kind of thing. Why couldn't they compete in a fair way, using all of their strength? Because they can't win as the Maid Knight expressed her opinion, Al got a little angry, and became indignant. Shayna could easily understand such justice-allied thoughts. If the Magic Squad was a ten in power, the other groups were only about seven. At the current rate, they would have been the first to find and kill the Emperor Dragon King. It's better to crush your opponent when you get the chance, if you know they're stronger than you even if it's like that, listen, al -Kun. This situation, it's not bad at all, for you. Since the strongest party is now gone, we now have a better chance at slaying the Emperor Dragon King ourselves if I'm honest. I don't really think so after seeing the boy pouting, Shayna whispered her agreement. The truth was, she didn't think so either. She actually thought that, despite Al's motivation, the best would have been for the magic group to kill the objective. Even if they were to take their chance, and had a fight with the Emperor Dragon King, the most possible outcome would be Al suffering an abrupt death. Even if the Blue Leopard and the Magic Squad were to paralyze its senses, it would still not be an easy opponent. Because of all that, Shayna would like to avoid the encounter. So, excuse me and after saying that, the knight started walking while looking sideways, until her shoulder bumped into someone. Wait the woman instinctively apologized and tried to hurry up, but the one her shoulder had met was not having any of it. He grabbed Shayna by her shoulder and forced her to turn around. As soon as she saw his face, hers suddenly felt tense. As I thought, it is you, Shayna Marion Barkle, question mark. Al turns behind to look at what's happening. Three men, all wearing white armor. On those armors, the crest from the Holy Kingdom of Melees. They were from the Holy Knight's Order of Melees. Between the three of them, the one whose face looked the fairest away from being a Holy Knight, but rather like a bandit's, was staring at Shayna. It looked like the face of someone who had met the enemy of their parents. It doesn't look like the first time they meet. What is the relationship between this bandit-looking man and the leaders of the Holy Knight's Order? When I saw you at the tavern, I thought it would be impossible, you bitch, how do you dare show your face here, huh? It's not like I was trying to show my face in particular as she said that, Shayna thought to herself what a problematic opponent I just met. When she first saw, back at the tavern, she knew there would be problems, were she to meet with this man, who was the leader of those Holy Knights. She was trying to avoid this from happening, but in the end, she forgot about it. I imagine you're ready to get your ass kicked, ain't ya? You instead, if you don't finish it with a beautiful, single blow, it would be like all your hardships weren't hard at all, wouldn't it? Who? Barkle gritted his teeth as he glanced at his subordinates, behind him. Those two seemed puzzled, which was obvious, as their boss suddenly became angry. Barkle is a man who Shayna knows to act like a stray dog. Very territorial and prideful, he will bite anyone who gets in his way. But he's not a mad dog. He won't do anything that's not profitable, and he could move his tail, even to a boss he didn't like. Like a sly and nasty wild dog. However, he's trusted by the Holy Knight's Order of Melees. He's the type of guy that openly says to their boss I'll betray you one day and if I do, it'll be your fault for making an opening. Even so, when it comes to working, he's capable. It would be easy for his boss to cut him off if he was incapable, but since that wasn't the case, he was still working. Whether he's an ally or an enemy, it's a high-risk and high-return situation. That is Shayna's image of the Holy Knight Barkle. Boss? He was sure his subordinates understood that too. That's why he was perplexed. They couldn't understand why Barkle was suddenly so hostile to a weirdly dressed lady knight in the street. One of them spoke up, without understanding at all. Boss, if you could please tell us who this woman is, if she's someone against the motherland, we are also, TCH, it's not like that. She's a personal enemy with a disgusting face, Barkle spits. And, in that moment, he finally realized that there was a boy standing next to the maid-looking knight. 
he raised an eyebrow, wondering. Who the hell is? Excuse me. I am known as Alex Ryback. In this moment, I am a member of a party which shana -san is part two a party. Barkle thoroughly looked at Al, from the tip of his toes, to the top of his head. And then, like a thug, he stood there, deeply looking into him. He, in response, just smiled, coldly. Excuse me, Holy Knight Dono, could I please hear your name? Ha! Huh. Barkle was very confused after hearing such a polite way of speaking. I'm Barkle, Deputy Chief from the Holy Knight's Order of Melees, Central Continent General Branch Deputy Chief. Does that make you someone important? He's a middle manager, it's not someone important at all Shana knows. The Holy Knights have a total of six branches around the world. The one in charge of the central continent is the second biggest, right next to the main one. No, if you think about the amount of members in the area they are around, it's even bigger than the main one. As for the deputy chief, if knight leader is the highest rank, then the second one is each branch chief, and then, right below it, would be the deputy chief. In short, Barkle is the number two, in the second biggest branch. There are no more than twenty combined people who are more important than him, in all of the organization. He is important. His rank isn't one that would normally come all the way to a place like this, to take command of a dragon extermination. However, he is here. That is probably due to him planning so. In order to prove the height of his skills at the scene, as well monopolize the success of the dragon extermination. He's driven by the desire to keep gathering success. Shayna didn't know what exactly made him do that, but he's brave and pure, and aims for the very top. Barkle liked Al. He made a gross smiling face, put a hand on his chin, and looked at the boy's expression. If someone looked from the side, it kind of looked as if a thief had found an easy mark, but it's just a regular pose for the leader of those holy knights. I see how it is. I don't exactly know where this noble kid is from, but he sure does look naive, ha. Huh? The Reaper Knight seems to have found yet another small victim Shayna got pale. The Reaper Knight, you said? Ha. Huh. Don't cha know? Well, sure, if you knew you wouldn't be hanging with that woman could you please tell me about that? Oi, Shayna. Seems like he wants to listen, heh. I wonder if it's fine if I talk about it the Lady Knight was staring at the disgusting man as he talked. After seeing that, Alex said she looks like it doesn't really matter. Please, start talking is it really fine, Shayna? To talk about these kind of things, it seemed like Barkle was taken aback after hearing Al speaking like it was a funny story. Shayna just turned around. Is it really fine? No one will believe your words anymore, Barkle was already looking a bit tired, but he took a deep breath and started talking. This woman, you see, she's one to kill her allies and escape being the only one alive. A reaper more than Al, the ones who seemed more surprised were the holy knights that were accompanying Barkle. At least, it's a famous story in the holy knights' order of Melees. That story is also deeply related with Shayna's past. I see Alex nodded. It was an expression Shayna couldn't understand. She had thought he would probably be disappointed after hearing that. Until now, it had always been like that. The famous reaper knight. Everyone knew that rumor, after all. When Shayna finds out, she makes a difficult expression and backs away. The Reaper Knight who kills her allies. Ha, huh, it's strange, as she thought Al would probably take the same attitude as everyone else, tears appeared in the corner of her eyes. Why would you look like you just took a demon's neck for something like that? What a funny holy knight for a second, Shayna didn't even know who had said those words. It was a low, scolding, violent voice. It was the first time she heard Al's voice. It was such an intimidating voice that Barkle, who had been waiting for a depressive atmosphere, made the same face a chicken would make after having the eggs it warmed up stolen. The hell, was that? The Reaper Knight turned to Alex, who had a smile showing on his face, just like always. After seeing that cool smile, Barkle's face grew redder by the second. He is a calculating man, but if he has a flaw, it'd be how easy it is for him to get angry. As soon as someone laughed, even if it was a bit, at him, he would start planning how to beat them down to hell. 
However, it's not like he immediately attacked someone after getting triggered. Instead, he had the habit of pulling back so his brain would cool down. Bastard, be careful of the roads at night greeting his teeth, Barkle manages to turn around and start leaving. He makes sure to never fight while he's still angry. Ah that's what Shayna first said, after being silent all this time. Could it be that, the thing with the magic group was your doing? The leader of that group stopped and replied with a gesture on his face that clearly read, I don't really have any idea. Who knows, I've got too many ideas, I don't know he then told his subordinates oi, let's go and left, as those two were once again lost in their thoughts, wondering what they were talking about. Shayna and Al are walking down the street. On the way, they bought cheap shopping baskets, which are filled with vegetables that grow in the zone, and fish that was caught from the river. Since many people were gathering over the place, the merchants had already prepared large enough amounts of their products, and thus the maid knight and the boy were able to buy everything they needed without worrying about them running out of stock. I was a member of the Holy Knight's Order of Melees after a long silence, it was Shayna who broke the ice. It was about ten years ago, right after my hometown and kingdom were destroyed, and I had become a wandering knight. I was ecstatic. Being a holy knight is something every kid dreams of at that time, she was around fourteen or fifteen years old. Since she was a woman, and still young at that, she wasn't officially hired by any country. Not only was she not good enough, but at the time, her ego was pretty high. She was usually unhappy, as she saw people with clearly inferior skills be selected in missions. At that time, the Holy Order started looking for people. It was to investigate an evil adherent. She wasn't really expecting to be called. The Holy Knights have a long history, which means seniority plays a big role. As a young woman, she would probably be used as a disposable research tool. Or she could just be called a liability and not be selected at all. Nonetheless, Shayna still applied. After all, if she applied, for the time being she'd be granted a livelihood, and a salary as well. Of course, she thought there was some chance. But that was it, some small chance. So, she applied. And received a white armor. But it wasn't the shining, white armor of the Holy Order, just an armor that was painted white. Oh, and some preparation money as well. But in the end, as she expected, she ended up without work, constantly treated as just a woman, and in the lowest of the low positions. However, even in that position, Shayna worked tirelessly. It's not like she thought of proving everyone who had looked down on her wrong. She just thought, were she not to try her absolute hardest, not only her skills, but even her personality would get completely rotten. She only thought about herself, but it's not like it had been a bad idea. And the next day, the Lady Knight conducted her investigation by herself, and ended up finding definitive proof of the investigation matter, the gathering of evil adherents. The underlings who were above her laughed it off. They told her that, if it was something even she could find herself, someone else would have already found it long ago. Only one person took it seriously and proceeded with the investigation. A lowly ranked, hard worker holy knight, who was in charge of the bottom of the ranks. It was Barkle. He backed up Shayna's findings, and petitioned his boss to move troops to that place. Not only did they destroy them, but that operation also got them information about other branches of that evil organization. A great victory. It wasn't the greatest merit, but it was enough to make the lowest-rated Holy Knight into an intermediate class one. Shayna, who had made her chances a reality, was suddenly transferred to the Melee's headquarters where she became an official holy knight, offered her sword to the Pope, received a shining, evil-warding white armor and the sword of a holy knight, which has a replica of the one St. Melis had once used. She had become a holy knight. Even if she was over the moon, this was still something Shayna had expected. The results and the recognition for a hard effort. Something like this was natural for someone with her skills. At that time, she didn't realize the effort Barkle had done in the background. Thus, Shayna became a low-ranked Holy Knight, who served under the also recently promoted, now mid-ranked Holy Knight, Barkle. That squad had their work changed from the investigation of an evil cult to their extermination. The operation ended successfully, 
and both Shayna and Barkle had remarkable performances among the other knights of the Holy Order. So much, that it was safe to say it would have probably not worked, were not for the two of them. They found, sometimes tricked, hunted down and mainly, exterminated, a lot of cultists. It was as the saying said, and for each one they saw, there were another thirty waiting behind. And in the end, it took a whole year for them to find the whereabouts of the leader. After Barkle reported their new findings, about half the members of the branch were deployed in an extermination mission. And that, was a trap. In conclusion, the Order of the Holy Knights was exterminated. They were completely surrounded by enemies, so much that not a single ant could escape. And then, a fire arrow was shot. While fire did not affect them, most of them ended up without oxygen, unable to move, and thus, were dealt finishing blows. The rest simply died due to the lack of oxygen. During that time, the Holy Knights entered a severe depression as they saw their allies being killed left and right. It was useless to resist. Those who fought back had even more brutal deaths. In the end, there were no reinforcements that came to their aid. Hell. While that happened, Barkle was nowhere to be found. He was supposed to lead a group of Holy Knights as an intermediate rank, but as soon as the fight began, he was nowhere to be found. Shayna, a lot later, learned that he was in the headquarters of the extermination unit at that time. He had asked the field commander for permission to withdraw and call for reinforcements, but when he got to the base, he told them the boss has betrayed us. The call for reinforcements is a trap. After hearing this, the chief of operations withdrew the reinforcements and instead sent them to the real place where the evil leader was, that Barkle had informed them of. What had happened was, Barkle had devised a plan for his own promotion. First of all, he had leaked the extermination plans to the group of the evil adherents. They used that info to set a lot of traps and preparations. After seeing how strong the cultists were in the place of the attack, it was decided not to send support and instead use the remaining soldiers to go to the real place where the leader was, that Barkle had informed them. As a result of his plan, all the other intermediate ranked holy knights died there as well as the sly dog superiors, who were commanding the troops in the leaked mission. After defeating the evil adherence leader, Barkle was regained as the only hero who came back from a terrible battle, and his rank rose up. Everything had gone as planned, but there was but a miscalculation. It was Shayna. Due to her natural survival power, she was able to escape from that hellish scenery. She was, really, the absolutely only survivor. And thus, Barkle panicked. Shayna was still alive. But there should have been absolutely no way she could escape from that cruel trap. Then, there was only one possibility. She knew about her boss plan. That was the only explanation as to how she could have escaped from there. That was Barkle's conclusion. And then, he tried to kill the wound-covered Shayna, with his sword. Without saying anything. So Shayna ran away, without knowing anything. She just couldn't understand why Barkle had attacked her. She couldn't have known. About the betrayal, or about anything the bandit-looking man had done. She couldn't know Barkle had killed an unfathomable amount of holy knights in order to raise his own rank. At that time, she had no way of knowing. And she ran away. And kept running. As her funds eventually ran out she became a wandering knight for a kingdom in a nowhere land. There, the rumors of her possessing the ability of an elite holy knight allowed her to be tested, and when they were confirmed to be true, she even became an official knight for that kingdom. But Barkle didn't allow that to go on for long, as he sent some assassins to deal with the problem. There was never an enemy who could match Shayna and her natural skill to survive, but none of her allies could either. When she finally had dealt with the enemies, her allies had all been killed already. That happened many times. And it kept happening, for seven or eight years. It was time enough for the Night Lady not only to lose her illusion of becoming a Holy Knight once again, but also to start resenting them. After some time, in order not to look anything like them, she started using black clothes, the exact opposite of the shining, white armors. It ended up being made looking clothes, since she could find them everywhere and they were cheap as well. And after that series of events, she started being called the Reaper Knight. 
The rumors said that if you ran into a night woman, who was dressed in black, you'd met the reaper, and either foe or ally, you'd die. And when those rumors started to circulate, the attack stopped. But not only the attacks disappeared, so did the kingdom that had hired her. And that's my story. My life, which was ruined by heroism, fame, and glory. If Al were to die when fighting the Emperor Dragon King, and if I survived, new rumors about the Reaper Knight would appear, as soon as she said that, Alex was directly looking at Shayna. She flinched, as a realization drew in her mind. The boy's gaze was extremely intense. It immediately pierced through you. Wah, what? Please, stay calm Al said, with a serious look on his face. I won't die, after all. He declared, as if it was a simple matter. And that way, they arrived home. Once again, there was no conversation, and the silence reigned supreme. The time had passed, and it was already evening. The other two, who were still waiting in the inn, must have been hungry. Shana usually likes the silence, but right now is feeling a bit uncomfortable, after all. Everyone would feel that way after telling the story of their life, only to be replied with only a few words. She didn't quite feel like it, but it was a feeling somewhat akin to a rejection. It didn't matter how many times, or how many days had been since her first rejection, it's not a feeling the knight could get used to. She didn't want to, either. With those negative thoughts in her mind, the two of them suddenly heard people screaming ahead of the road. It's a fight. It's an impatient-like voice, but there's a little fun behind it. Everyone knows watching other people fight is fun. Shayna didn't really enjoy watching adults fight without any skill whatsoever, but it's not like she hated it so much she would ignore it if it was happening right in front of her. They suddenly peeked through a gap in the crowd. It was a regular tavern you could find in this part of the city. As most establishments do around here, you can go and eat there during the day and it works as a tavern at night. The chairs and tables had been moved to the sides, and in the center there was some kind of a ring. There were six people in the center. It was a three-on-three. Three. As we started watching, both sides were drawing their swords. The bloodlust covers the atmosphere. More than a fight, it looks like it would be a death match. It's understandable why there's such a big crowd around them. You can find a lot of people interested in that kind of fights around here, Alex admired the scene from the side. Alcoon, did this kind of thing happen in your hometown as well? Yes, after all, how many times are there fights in a day? If you go see every single one, you can't get any work done it was a dangerous town, huh? Alcoon Shayna turned her sights on the fight, once again. If they were experienced fighters, she was interested. Both sides were swordsmen but the shape of their swords was different. One of them had thin, curved, single-edged swords. Those were designed to cut people. The other had thick, straight, double-edged blades. Those were designed to cut through armor. As soon as the experienced knight lady saw them, she thought the double-edged group were at some disadvantage. Not only that, but the single-edged side had a distinctive attire. The jacket of the blue leopard, Shana Son, who do you think will win, the Royal Knights, or the Swordsman from the Blue Leopard? Oh, how do you know they're Royal Knights? I saw it in the tavern the other day. That is the sword of the Royal Knights. On the hilt, you can also see the crest of the Emperor Dragon Kingdom if you looked really close, you certainly could find a symbol that included a dragon with a crown. It was a really nice observation from the young one. So, who do you think has the edge? The soldiers, if it lasts five minutes, that's probably the story, as they finished saying those words, the first slash had already happened. They didn't stand a chance at all. Those words would be more suitable for this situation. With a single long sword, they had beaten two of the knights into a pool of blood. Not only was there a skill difference, but the quality of the swords wasn't the same either. The knights used big swords that helped them fight violent, big creatures, like the Dragon Kings, or armored enemies as well. It would have been effective if it was to fight among themselves. On the other side, the sword the mercenaries used is the one people used to kill in wars, it's perfect for killing humans, right like this situation. Essentially, mercenary groups are only able to boast of their skills, 
without being significant enough, and should have been no match for the royal knights. However, this group was an elite prepared to face the Emperor Dragon King, that came from the, the Blue Leopard Division, a strong group from the elite of the Prime Leopard Mercenaries. Within their numbers, each one is at least strong enough to be the master swordsman for a whole country. Even if the Royal Knights are no amateurs, they aren't wearing the armor they're used to, and their big swords make it difficult to fight indoors. This outcome was predictable. Go, you damn, the defeated knights glared at the mercenaries while holding one arm. There were no fatal wounds. They had contained themselves. Not only their skills were in totally different leagues, the members of the Blue Leopard were smart as well. They knew that, had they killed them, a conflict with the royal knights would arise, no matter what. That's why, they only cut one arm from each and finished there. Trading lives would have been too much. A decision that was unworthy for a mercenary, but the right one for this situation. And with that, the fight was over. Gay, so the power of a knight from a great nation is like this if only one of the mercenaries hadn't let out a deep sigh. He was looking at them. From some distance, there stood a man. It was a knight from the Emperor Dragon Kingdom, who had become enraged. Bastard, are you mocking us? Ah. Uh. If the event had finished with the group of mercenaries victorious against the off-duty knights, this guy on patrol wouldn't have done anything. Since lives hadn't been traded, it was just a story of his colleagues fighting tough opponents. However, the taunt had reached this knight's head. He couldn't overlook that ridicule that was directed to the whole knight order. The mercenaries knew the man they had beaten and had taken an arm off for royal knights. In other words, they knew they weren't your average citizen but proper knights that served a kingdom. And so, if you overlook that, the royal knight's uniform became that of a coward who does nothing while seeing their friends being slashed. If he let that slide, it wouldn't take long until the royal knights of the Emperor Dragon Kingdom became known as cowards who are at the bottom of the power rankings. How dare you mercenaries raise your hands against the royal knights of the kingdom? I won't allow it. Royal knights, gather. That could have been the delusion from a loser. However, there was a knight who answered the call. There was a knight who gathered his allies. Some heard that shout, and started to go there from far away. Some other knights, who were off duty, suddenly started coming from nearby taverns. It all happened in a couple minutes. In those couple minutes, the three mercenaries had become surrounded. Hey, hey, come on, really? There were about 15 or 16 people. Many of them were using full body armors and equipment, while some others held their off duty daggers. Even for swordsmen, there wasn't anything for them to do after being surrounded with such a numbers disadvantage. The three mercenaries held their swords ready, while relying their backs on one another. However, their faces were blue. Surely, the mercenaries wouldn't call us cowards among them, one of the knights came in front as he said that. After seeing him, the people in the surroundings became noisy with excitement. It's Leonardo Pompadour, why is the captain of the knights, the amazing lion, that's the amazing Leo, between the knights that were surrounding the mercenaries of the Blue Leopard, the figure of Leonardo Pompadour, the captain of the royal knights of the Emperor Dragon Kingdom, stood out. He was a man that, according to the rumors, was able to make the impossible possible and responsible for the name of the royal knights being known, even in other kingdoms. He surely wasn't the kind of person to get into these quarrels, but he must have happened to be near. And if he had been near, he had no choice but to represent his knights, who had requested help. Or at least, that's what Shana thought. Although he had been in a position to stop them from the beginning, knights value pride and honor, and for those that wanted to stay at the top, it was important not to intervene much. Seeing the disadvantage they were at, one of the mercenaries apologized, while a smile appeared on the corner of his mouth. It was our fault. But they aren't really injured, so please forgive us, do a dejiza ha. Huh? Didn't you hear me? Get down on your knees, so that you can rub your forehead on the ground. Lick our shoes, and ask for forgiveness Leo said that, as he crossed his arms, in an arrogant pose. A faint voice that claimed is that a fucking joke, could be heard, but all the royal knights stood with a serious look on their faces. Two of our knights, from our country, in our own territory, 
had their arm cut off by an unsightly, pathetic mercenary. They were ridiculed. They could be marked as pathetic and weak by their own people who they must protect. And we are allowing that big offense to be forgiven by a simple Dejiza. It's a small price to pay, isn't it? Don't fuck with us, then, you can die as Leo unsheathed his sword, the mercenaries were in shock. That sword, that radiated brilliance in a very different way, had the same shape as the Royal Knight's one, but with only looking at it once, you could realize the other Knight's ones were but a replica of this one. The famous one. The sharp sword. It is a type of holy sword. We can cut you down without saying a word. Even if we cut down three of you, the Blue Leopard Division won't be able to retaliate it's difficult for the mercenaries to stay in the town if they killed the knights, but the opposite isn't true. Even if three members died at a tavern in a night, the Blue Leopard still has the mission of slaying the Emperor Dragon King. If you looked at it from a military perspective, the Royal Knights wouldn't have power to spare. The mercenary's forehead is covered in sweat and fat. Shana knows why. Even if they're mercenaries, the Blue Leopard still values honor greatly. Speaking about the elites from the Blue Leopard, they're ones among the very top of the organization. If they lowered their head at that moment, they would later be killed by their own boss. As I thought, you won't lower your head, you have wasted your lives, the Blue Leopard leader will hear, from me non and no no, if the three of us are killed, he won't stay quiet, will he? What? No one knew for how long that man had been there. Even if he was wearing a very easy-to-notice, brilliant blue-printed coat, he had suddenly appeared beside Leo, as if to protect the mercenaries. Shayna didn't even remember having seen a man that stood out so much. Boss. After recognizing that figure, the three mercenaries became clearly relieved. The Reaper Knight also knew who that man was. Leader of the Blue Leopard Division, the Blue Leopard itself. Blue Panther. No one knows his real name. But what everyone knew there, is that he was the head of an organization much bigger than the Royal Knights, and that he had fought his way to the top by killing people. He's smart, and his arms are big. He also has the confidence of his men on his back. You, you piece of shit, where did you come from? One of the knights shouted in anger. Where did I come from? I have been watching since the beginning, you know. I was in the corner of the tavern, drinking by myself. When the fight started, my heart was dancing around in enjoyment, but it suddenly started to turn real boring, so I stood up and here I am, YC. And I think that the strongest winning is what's supposed to happen, right? When the loser calls on allies to help them after losing and surround the enemy, I think it's pretty lame, ain't it? He exaggeratedly shrugged his arms, with a playful tone. Leo watches that with a grim face. You son of a bitch hey he heh, it's fine to have a fight and lose, but this isn't the best way for the loser to apologize to the winner, is it, my sir? The young guy over there apologizes for being a loser, and then we bow as well and say we're sorry for the trouble we caused to the tavern. Isn't that good enough? Hey! As he laughs, almost like a child, the man asks the crowd for their approval. Nobody really agrees. Leonardo Pompadour and the Blue Panther. For the crowd who gathered to watch a fight, nothing could top that possibility. Oh, oh, what's that? Hmm, I don't think it would be good to kill each other right here and now, but I don't think the four of us could escape this situation easily, but if by any chance, were I to die, you know, my father could get angry, too, you know? That guy loves his family in a fully-fledged war between the Holy Knights of the Emperor Dragon Kingdom and the soldiers of the Prime Panther could begin, you know? There is no profit whatsoever. On the contrary, if I kill everyone here, I would be wanted by the kingdom. And I need to hunt the Emperor Dragon King, which I couldn't do like that. This is not good at all, you know? The Blue Panther says that as he playfully turns around. Unlike his attitude, what he is saying makes complete sense. This won't bring profit to anyone, so both thought it better to end it here. So, I think it's best for everyone here to just see the our swords, and go back to our everyday life, pretending nothing happened here. Is that fine for you? Please, let my face do the talking, right, Leo Dono? Leonardo thought about it for a second, and then opened his mouth. 
understood the knights around him screamed in protest. Why? He's bluffing, just cut him down. The order will be ruined, and so on. But the captain shut them down, and ordered them to let the surrounded men go. He he he, I'm sorry for these guys. Anyways, that'd be all from me, the Blue Panther and his three men walked out to the road in ease. You could say they had one. The fight is over. Now scatter away. Leo chased away the people who remained there, and soon enough Shayna and Alex left as well. Oh, you're back late the road was packed as Shayna gets back into the room, Cheeky greets her with only one opened. It's not like she was winking, she was just absorbed by the shine of her knives. It had only been one or two hours since they left, but the girl had still been cleaning her weapons after all. You sure are meticulous, huh um, there's a lot of things happening right now over here, so you really need to be careful, because of how many strong opponents you can find. I'd specially rather not meet with that blue panther as she said that, Cheeky looked at the blade again, and thought it was a bit dull, so she took a sharpening stone, and began moving the blade against it. Soon enough, the bed became littered with metal dust. It was later that the night lady realized the innkeeper would surely get angry with them because of that. I see, but why is that of the Blue Panther? In terms of something bad happening, it was likelier to happen with the Holy Knights. Huh, is there someone the Reaper Knight does not know about? Oh, so you knew I am the Reaper Knight? Of course I would. A hitman knows very well how to tell if someone is a good or a bad opponent well, I guess so it couldn't be helped that Al, who came from the countryside, far away, didn't know about it. But, it would have been strange that this girl, self-proclaimed a hitman from the cities, didn't know about the Reaper Knight of the Central Continent. If you know the rumors about me, then why are you working together with me? Boy, ask one question at a time. Cheeky's not that smart while she said that, the little assassin took every polished knife, one by one, and wiped them with the bed sheets, before carefully sheathing each one, one by one. Shayna wondered how she had made two questions at the same time, before realizing the one from before, about the Blue Panther, had not yet been replied. So, regarding the first question. That guy is a mercenary, right? And mercenaries only accept requests that are to be paid with money. So far so good? Yes, keep going while she hadn't worked as a mercenary, Shayna still knew about this, since it was basically common knowledge. On the other hand, a mercenary would do just about anything, as long as you were paying them what they thought their work was worth. Those mercenaries have not been contracted to take down the Emperor Dragon King a request, it's true that the blacksmith there didn't put one cheeky shook her head. No, that's not what cheeky wants to say. The Prime Leopard mercenaries are huge, right? Such a big mercenary group only moves after someone tells them to are you saying they wouldn't move unless they got a direct, signed petition from? That's it Shayna nodded in agreement. It was true, there was no way for that blacksmith to put a request to the Prime Leopard mercenary group to get rid of the Emperor Dragon King. If he had done so, it wouldn't be just a little part of the Blue Leopard group, but at least that entire faction. Or, maybe you could think, but the Blue Leopard division is full of strategists and intelligence gatherers, with but a couple combat experts. However, the subjugation of the Emperor Dragon King does not require that kind of work. If they were a little team, like Shayna's, it would be more efficient for them to go back and forth in the mountains. Why didn't that happen? The leader of the Blue Leopard Division, Blue Panther, was killing time in a tavern. No, he's not someone who could have that much free time. Then, he probably has given his people another job, different from the Emperor Dragon King Hunt. Shayna couldn't quite think about what this other job could have been. If you don't know their purpose, then you can't predict their actions, um, also be ready for the knights. There are many suspicious people we've got to be ready for, yes, I know that Cheeky nodded, and then started to put the knives all over her body. In just a couple seconds, all of them were hidden in her clothes, and she just looked like a regular, tanned girl. You couldn't see the knives at all. By the way, where's Al? I'm already getting really hungry Cheeky scans the room looking for the boy, as she rubs her belly. While she's doing that, a sweet, appetizing scent starts entering into the room. He borrowed a kitchen below, and said he would make a lot of stuff from his hometown Unite, aren't you helping? 
I was kicked out of the kitchen. Just because I held the knife with an underhand grip, let's just be happy that the inn didn't get caught in a fire as she said that, Cheeky shrugged and left the room. Shayna scratched her head and went to try and wake up the sleeping girl. Chapter 4 The Heroic Tale In this world, there are hundreds of heroic tales. If we take into account those from long ago, from the mythology already, the one that stands the most is that one about the first dragon god. It is said that he, who visited countless other worlds, destroyed them. And thus, he left our current world as the only one there. It is also said that all these creatures that inhabit our world right now, used to be from those nowadays destroyed worlds. That would make him the one to unite the world, being the only one in all of history. However, this is just a myth. Since it's a myth, and it's pretty dark to be a heroic tale itself, it's rarely selected to be told to children, but it's for sure renowned as being the oldest tale, and the most powerful one. It is told in many ways, and its importance is such that this is the first story anyone who aspires to be a bard learns. The next one would be about the demon god, Laplace. The new unified world was one of common fighting, for the hundreds of millions of creatures that were now there. There, someone unified what we now call demon races, in what we now call the demon continent. That was Laplace. Even if this is a very old tale, the demon continent is over there today, and in all of its history, it has never allowed an invasion from other races. If you think about it, he united the demon races, who like to fight as much as the human race. This is an amazing feat, considering that there is still no ruler in the central continent. If you start thinking about people who unify, someone who comes to mind has to be St. Melis. In case you didn't know, in the past, what we now call Melis continent was once a cursed land, with very deep forests and endless deserts, only barely interrupted by a few plains. However, that changed when the hero that gave name to the land defeated the demon king, source of the curse, and reverted that unsightly desert to a land filled with a rich green and the strength of nature. It was also at that time that the Order of Melee's Holy Knights was established, the one that is in present time the strongest religious organization in the world. However, the three mentioned above are so incredible, it's hard for most people to even understand their greatness. To a child, a hero is someone who has achieved great accomplishments in battle, or has defeated a bad king, or maybe is the protagonist of a heroic tale. With that in mind, you can probably think of someone right away. It has to be Hades, the Golden Knight. That is the legendary man, who defeated the demon god Laplace in the war against demons and humans, about 1,200 years ago. After facing difficulties alongside his friends, overcoming trials, and defeating hundreds of demons with the power to be called Demon King, he bested the demon god in just a single attempt. It is the heroic tale everyone knows about. And keep in mind, defeating someone called a demon god is not as easy as it sounds. Remember that, anyone who's called a god, is always bound to be so overwhelmingly powerful, the power itself surpasses human knowledge. If that wasn't the case, the other people who are called gods are the ones that are able to defeat the aforementioned. For example, the sword god Alpharion began as an unknown swordsman. Even if he was a human, he took the side of the demon race in the war and earned his title after managing to defeat the North God, Kalman, who was the most powerful swordsman at that time. Once the war was over, he kept training and developing his style and went on to pass his skills to the next generation. Today, the sword god style is the most popular sword style in the world. By the way, speaking about the North God Kalman, he is often referred as the sword god's biting dog, but he deserves more respect. Some say he was a hero who defeated a giant rock monster, called the Rock King. Some say he was a hero who defeated the immortal Demon King. Some say he was a hero who defeated the leader who created the evil sect of Millis. Some say he was a hero who defeated Emperor Dragon King, Kajakt. However, all of that is barely talked about. The reason for that is, that most of the creatures he's said to have beaten, are still alive and the heroic tale of the sword god says that the north god was a coward who fled before he had struck a blow, which helped create a rumor that the north god is an extraordinary liar. Even more, no one knows about what happened to him in the end. 
after his battle with Kajakt, he hasn't been seen anymore. By the way, Kajakt is still fine and well. Because of all that, it is believed that the North God is an imaginary person who never existed. After that, for the next two weeks, Cheeky and her group went in and out of the mountains, replacing the larger group. Even if they repeated this seven times, in the end, they didn't find the Emperor Dragon King. It looks like some groups already have an idea of where they can find the ruler of the mountain, as the traces they leave follow a direction. Cheeky knows there's a direction, but doesn't know exactly where to go. However, it seems like Shayna has a more detailed idea, so Alex convinced himself and followed them. Even if you told Cheeky you'd tell her anything that happened ahead of everyone in the forest, as always, the scout girl complained inside her heart. Behind her, there were three people, Al, Shayna, and a magician girl that started following them around ten days ago. The little girl with knives struggled to remember her name was Flowing Clouds, and thought it was strange. As she looked over her shoulder, she saw the order they walked in was, the little boy, the magician, and the lady knight in the rear. With the infamous Reaper Knight behind them, Al was in charge of protecting the latest party member. It's a formation that makes sense, although they haven't been attacked from behind just yet. As she thought, Cheeky had never been in a party with people like this. She belongs to a mid-sized assassin order called the People of the New Moon. In that guild, they receive orders from other, higher-ranked assassin guilds. Even though it's an assassin's guild, there are some members who do well as thieves alone, and that also possess a notorious fighting prowess, so they are called to parties. Cheeky possesses those skills, but she hadn't been invited to join a party so far. Because of that, she ended up becoming the type of person to only do what she could do alone, and to never go for a job she couldn't do by herself. Being a hitman is a job where having more people makes the success rate go down, not up. Even if she hadn't tried it, she didn't like the idea of being in a party, and tried to keep herself away from one, but unlike with her job, she found it quite interesting to now be with allies. With her night vision and farsightedness, Cheeky would report anything that looked dangerous. If it was a beast or something alike, Shayna would come out and cut it down. In many cases, the knight was able to finish the battle by herself, which was easy for the hitman, who wasn't good at fighting together. The leader of the team, Al, wasn't doing anything in particular. He would help when needed, and would stay back otherwise. It was mentally easy for him. As for Cheeky, she didn't like people getting into her job, and conversely, she didn't want to help people who didn't know what they were doing either. That's why she was really happy with how things were playing out. It was basically her ideal state of a party. However, it's not related, but she had recently started to feel something out of place from Shayna. It's hard to explain, but it was like she reacted to danger way too fast. Since the magician Flowing Clouds joined the party, the detection of Dragon Kings had accelerated, but the Lady Knight was even faster than that. Looking from Cheeky's eyes, it was definitely eerie. And after yet another uneventful day of exploring, Cheeky and her friends returned to the inn. As the four of them sat around the dinner table, they reviewed the results of their day. There's almost no doubt that the Emperor Dragon King is one the east side of the mountain and it seems like the other groups are already looking over there, so I'm not that sure there's no doubt, since our exploration magic has been having stronger reactions the closer we get the assassin girl had a small participation in these talks. She was there at the table with the rest and listened carefully, but she wasn't good at giving her opinions, so most of the time she stayed silent. She didn't exactly know what type of info her party members were looking for. She usually had her own priorities for information, that seemed to be unique for her, as she was usually told cruel stuff like we're talking about other things now and that doesn't really matter, which made her feel bad, and in the end, she stopped sharing her thoughts. Cheeky is the type of people that likes to be complimented and grows on that that's why she was by herself today. She felt that she would be disrespected and ignored were she to talk, so she decided to only talk when asked for her opinion. The girl has that way of thinking. For her party, missing her opinions like that may have made the search for the Emperor Dragon King a bit longer and tiresome, but it was not a problem for the knife-wearing girl. Since Al's the only one who is really invested in killing the ruler of the mountain, even while helping, 
she's not taking the most aggressive approach, since it's not her goal at all. That should be the same for the night, but, in the eyes of Cheeky, Shayna works really diligently. She didn't go over the action zones of other people, but often told them they could rely on her for the combat, and when fighting, her focus was more about protecting everyone else, rather than defeating the enemy as a group. That was fine, the little girl didn't feel like she needed to be protected, but she didn't care either. The woman knight could do whatever she wanted. But there's one concern about her. Earlier, when following the traces left behind by other parties, Shayna couldn't explain why, but she told them to go with a direction that was not exactly where the traces were, Cheeky noticed. It was shady. In Cheeky's eyes, Shayna was shady. Let's clarify some things. First of all, when she agreed to join Al's party, her condition was will run away when it becomes dangerous. This is probably due to her rumor about being the Reaper Knight, and that she doesn't want to spread it any further. After working together for two weeks, Cheeky felt that Shayna's abilities were extremely high. The reason all of her previous allies had been wiped was surely because they couldn't keep with her excellent abilities at all. While not familiar with the North God style, the little lady realized that she had extremely good fighting capabilities, and a strong arm. Still, it wasn't enough to beat the Emperor Dragon King. Cheeky was also an assassin, and she proudly called herself strong. She had confidence when it came to fighting. She didn't know much about Al's skills, but judging with what she had seen and the way he behaved, he's probably confident with his skills from the opponents he had in the countryside. She didn't know about flowing clouds either, but she looked like an ordinary magician. Although, there's a rumor that says that a magician becomes stronger the more they abandon people, so she could be even weaker than what it seems. With these members, she thought it absolutely impossible to defeat the Emperor Dragon King. Let's analyze their combined strength. First of all, Cheeky wasn't a very big threat, since her knives were barely able to damage normal Dragon Kings and she didn't have any more strength that could allow them to penetrate the scale protection it'd have. As for Shayna, it was a bit of the same, since the style she used wasn't designed to fight with giant creatures, but rather, humans and medium-sized beasts you could find in the plains. The next one would be Flowing Clouds, who is expected to be the strongest among them for this fight, since she's a magician. However, if she goes on the offensive, she'd have no way of protecting herself. But, in this situation, the only one who could be expected to do anything was Flowing Clouds herself. When you add Al into the formation, well, he would probably wouldn't make much difference. So, back to the topic at hand. Cheeky thought Shayna was shady. She was sure she'd arrived at the same conclusion as her, but she was still there, in the hunt for the Emperor Dragon King. This contradiction made the girl feel like the Lady Knight was even more suspicious. She understood she was helping her lifesaver, but when a situation becomes this uncertain and dangerous, you should be able to just tell them it's impossible and get back to your previous job. At the time Cheeky had been thinking about all of this, the Emperor Dragon King has been found. A voice like that was able to be heard from the outdoors. Chapter 5 The Boy Who Was Abandoned, Part 1 these are events that happen in the middle of a dark sea. Cheeky doesn't really enjoy the sea herself. Since she was born and raised in sandy soil, it was just too different. But she also didn't like the creatures that inhabited the sea. For example, think of the octopus. That octopus is currently entangled in the girl's body. It tightens its grip like a vice, and it's probably planning to keep that up until her bones are broken, so it can eat her later. Cheeky rampages, trying to free herself from that terrible destiny. As she notices her futile efforts, feeling sick to the point of fainting, she starts calling out for help, screaming. As she does so, there was a man passing by. It was someone the little girl knew, as he was the receptionist for the Assassin's Guild. That man is a lollycon and is always looking at Cheeky when she comes to pick up her work, reaching for her breasts and ass, while always pretending it to be an accident. As troublesome as an octopus, she also hated him. However, since he can at least understand the girl, it's still a better option. She realized this and called out for help once again. But it was useless. The man turned his bloodshot eyes on Cheeky, 
who still couldn't move due to the grip of the octopus, and started to get closer to her, as he ignored her words. The girl thought of the unknown face of her father and mother, as she was about to lose her chastity. And as she finally prepared herself, the bindings suddenly loosened. What a thing, the octopus and the man were fighting. It was a fight to the death that was hard to describe. It was so fierce that Cheeky just forgot to run away, and kept watching. In all of her life, she had never seen such an intense battle. In the end, it was Al who won. He pulled out his giant sword with a speed that the eyes couldn't follow, and then cut through the Dragon King in a clean hit, slicing it in two. He then lifted Cheeky, and got close to her lips, and then, she woke up. She looks at her surroundings with sleepy eyes. The room is dimly lit, and it seems to be just about dawn. The birds could be heard singing outside. In the bed right next to hers, she found flowing clouds. She was a bad sleeper, as she bounces off the blanket, sticks out her belly button, and drools all over the pillow. As she saw that, Cheeky suddenly felt discomfort on her own belly button, and looked down there. There was not an octopus, but, a woman was entwined there. It was Shayna. It was strange, she should have been sleeping in the other bed. There are only two beds in this room, so Shayna and Flowing Clouds were sleeping together. Then why was she in Cheeky's bed? The assassin girl thought it could be the night lady was a nightcrawler, since it wouldn't be the first time she showed perverted behavior, but still wondered if that was true, no, she was sleeping far too well for that. Even if her rugged face made it look like she was having a nightmare, she still slept well. They say that children who sleep well are the ones who grow the most, and since she's pretty overgrown herself, she must tend to sleep well. Cheeky wondered if sleeping well would also make her grow taller, if you looked closely, there was a bruise on Shayna's forehead, and tears appeared in the corner of her eyes. And thus, the girl realizes. The Reaper Knight must have been kicked by the bad sleeper, flowing clouds. Oh, poor lady she doesn't understand how Shayna could put up with that for almost two weeks. Cheeky got out of her bed, pulled the blanket over Shayna, and staggered out of the room. She went into the bathroom and did her business. She knew it would be a dangerous day if she saw water in her dreams. She then went back into the bedroom, crawled into the only available bed, and slept once again. As soon as she felt the gaze of someone, Cheeky opened her eyes. In front of her was the face of a man she had seen a lot in the past two weeks. Squeezing the knowledge from her just awoken brain, she remembered this guy's name was Al, and that she owed him her life. He looked at the girl's face with a mix of bewilderment, astonishment, and embarrassment. And then she figured out. Ah, night crawling sure is manly, Al. However, between Cheeky and the women sleeping next to me, why did you pick me? Even if you say that, the only woman sleeping to my side is Cheeky even if Alex had just woken up, he was acting intelligent and rational. Normally, when a beautiful girl is sleeping next to you, you can't help but be curious and play a prank on her. And sometimes it's not even a prank at all. That's what the assassin girl thought, and thus, was impressed with his self-control. She also then thought about how different he was from that disgusting receptionist that appeared in her dream and fantasized about how she liked to marry someone as gentlemanly as him in the future, since she is currently not a physically mature adult yet, that would have to wait. But even as those thoughts happened, she still thought about how right she'd always been thinking of Al as such a gentleman. Truly, the ideal man. Well, still, even if you're not a nightcrawler per se, it's rude to sneak into a maiden's bed and do nothing, isn't it? I didn't know that, and while you're at it, I'd be grateful if you could tell me how a man should behave when a maiden sneaks into his bed, to begin with, try getting closer as he got close, his cheeks pressed against her muscular chest, which made her mouth relax. So, what will he do next, Cheeky thinks. She calmly thinks. Then, finally, her sleepy head seemed to start working. She knew exactly where she was and what the situation was. Morning, Al good morning. Cheeky saw they were very close to each other. She's thinking if she would normally scream in a situation like this. She wonders if she should let a silk ripping scream and brand the man in front of her as an attacker. Is that truly the right thing to do? Even letting her feelings aside, it was she who got in the bed, 
Al the one being annoyed, and in the end, it was her who felt good. In the first place, Cheeky had never heard the sound of silk being ripped. It was a prostitute she knew who had said that once. She also said, if you wake up to a man next to you, don't let him take the better out of you. Men are creatures that like to think of women as their own after sleeping with them once. Oi Al, don't get too cheeky, I mustn't get too cheeky. As Cheeky said that, his face showed a shadowy expression. The girl wondered if she had made him angry. Speaking of which, that prostitute also said if a man is in a good mood, never tell him not to be in a good mood, because a proud man will get upset and strangle you. The little girl panicked in her mind. As they were too close together, she couldn't move a single inch. She thought she'd be strangled. Do you know what it takes to subjugate the Emperor Dragon King? Contrary to Cheeky's sleepy imagination, Al sounded very serious. Deciding she wasn't angry at all, she looks at Alex's face, who is very close to her. First of all, we absolutely need offensive power. You need gravitational magic, skin like a shell, bones, and flesh that are obviously heavier and harder than the human race, and you need a sword or magic to cut them in two inch there was a sickening smile on Al's face, one that no human being could have produced. The next thing you need is defense, endurance, and stamina. This is even more important than offense the sheer awfulness of his smile made Cheeky shudder. People generally think that because a dragon's attack is easy to evade, the Emperor Dragon King's attack can also be managed by the same evasive maneuvers are, are they wrong? It is said that the Dragon Kings are the strongest single fighters, and the Emperor Dragon King is even more powerful, which is easy to understand as it is undefeated. It is the only dragon that is interested in the martial arts of the human race, and has refined its own body, techniques, and skills and has developed its own tactics and strategies. He is so skilled at fighting that even if a human were to spend a lifetime training, he would still be said to have only a little bit of all that knowledge. It's basically impossible to avoid all the attacks, but, in the end, it's only a dragon, right? I pay my respects to the cheeky son who can call the dragons who control the entirety of the mountain range in the central continent only a dragon, but still, the difference between a regular Dragon King and the Emperor Dragon King is like that of a newborn baby and a strong mercenary. Please think about it, there'd be no way that the hero Lan Xiao and the North God Kalman could be defeated if it was just a bit stronger than the regular Dragon King Ha. Huh? Didn't the North God defeat the Emperor Dragon King to later vanish and never appear again? Cheeky has always thought that since she was a child Al chuckled to himself with a mischievous smile. Is that so? I've always heard that the North God lost to the Emperor Dragon King, thus ending his life there, although it's the last heroic tale about him, so there are various versions of as far as the little girl's knowledge goes, she has never heard of an ending where the North God was defeated and ended his life, but this may just be a regional thing. Cheeky doesn't know much about folklore and mythology either. Shayna says that the boy's hometown is unbelievably rural, so that might have to be it. So, to be a hero someone needs both incredible strong offensive and defensive prowess. Both Lan Xiao and Kalman were heroes whose powers were close to the Emperor Dragon Kings, so, why do you think they lost and ended their stories there? Cheeky thinks for a couple of seconds and then answers him, do you think it's because it was a dragon, and thus they underestimated it? It is said that the hero Lan Xiao, in the midst of a commotion, recognized the destructive power of the Emperor Dragon King and challenged it to a duel, and when Kalman heard the story, he made up his mind to die and went for it, so it's a bit different the girl shuddered. When she realized it, she was looking at Al's face with fear. But, she didn't understand why was his face so scary. But, what was that, she thought, since she had never seen a human make a face like that. It's not like the face of desire the receptionist of the Assassin Guild showed for her. It looked like something more, instinctive. Not greedy, but more, instinctive, indeed. Was there such a thing? What they lost was, their heart heart. It can be said as the confidence. Without the will to win, the tip of the sword will become dull and the body will become slack. You will not be able to win a match that you could win. Even more so if the game is evenly matched, a dulled sword tip will miss the chance to win the girl had heard stories like those before. What she knows is the opposite, though. 
Those negative emotions such as I might lose, I might die, and I might fail make people run for cover, so some of her colleagues use witchcraft and drugs to get rid of them. Many heroes are strong-minded. Lan Xiao was one, and so was Kalman. But they lost. Right up to the moment of the duel, they would keep fighting, here and there. If the opponent did this, they would respond in this way, if he did that, they would attack in this way, if he did that, they would defend in this way. In the process, they lost their confidence in winning. The dragon has a huge body and an enormous magical power, and it also has martial arts and tactics. There is no way to win. The more they thought about it, the deeper they got into it, the more their confidence wavered, and the more they stuck in the battlefield with no answers, but doubt and fear, which led to their defeat you think the fight is about spirit and mental fortitude. The battle is always in flux. Two people meet for the first time, two people of equal skill, two people who would win 50 and lose 50 if they fought a hundred times, and in the first fight one of them loses his life. It has to do with a lot of things, what you're thinking, what your enemy is, the factors that determine who is better prepared, the guts, courage. Well, there are many ways to call it, but I like to think of it as the heart and thus, Cheeky finally understood that trembling emotion she felt. It was, probably, a gift from her ancestors. So I'm going to get carried away, get Cheeky, and keep thinking that I deserve to win until I beat the Emperor Dragon King. That way, the tip of the sword will not dull. So, I'm sorry, Cheeky san, but I'm going to need you to put up with that for a while more. And with that said, Al's smile finally got back to the usual, gentle one. Cheeky could not stop trembling, since that feeling is a warning that begun from ourselves, against their natural enemies. A frog stared at by a snake, a bird held down by a cat, a human standing in front of a dragon. Now that the last one has long since become a thing of the past, it brings back feelings that have been forgotten. Anyone who can subjugate a dragon can, without exception, be a natural enemy to man. Al is trouble. Cheeky's intuition told her so. After that conversation, later the same day, the group was reunited at the top of the Dragon King Mountain. Since they left the city, the clouds started moving quickly, and it looked like it was about to rain. While Cheeky was not part of a religion that thought that the weather could be used to foretell what was going to happen, she still had a bad feeling about this day. She was still thinking about the talk she had with Al that morning. After that conversation, Al's threatening atmosphere disappeared and he returned to being the normal easygoing, gentle, smiling Al. It's not as if Shayna and flowing clouds didn't feel it, but the hitman couldn't help but think that their attitude was a little too relaxed. Even if the boy was an unworthy and naive country bumpkin, the fact that he saved Cheeky's life doesn't change, and she doesn't want to stop helping him challenge the Emperor Dragon King. Still, the girl now feels a strange stirring in her heart. Whether this is because of the weather, Al's terrifying nature, or the fact that they had green peppers for breakfast, which she hates, or maybe that the shoelaces we tied when we left the inn were not symmetrical, Cheeky doesn't know when it doesn't matter. What does matter now? is the feeling that something bad is about to happen. Something very bad. The master who taught Cheeky how to work as an assassin also taught her four other tips. Those were the four tips to become a good assassin for as long as she lived. First, the work is broad and shallow. Every organization has its dark side. Never go deep. Second, don't choose your customers. The key to a long life is not to make specific enemies. Even if you don't like them, smile at them. Stab them with a smile, even if you like them. Loyalty to your work is a virtue. Third, get on well with your peers. Always have a smile on your face. If you do, you may be offered a lucrative job. If you have to betray someone, make sure to clean every trace of your bad action, to make sure it doesn't come back at you. And fourth, keep your senses sharp. Trust your senses when you think you are in trouble. No matter how good the bait looks in front of you, it's best to run away immediately. And don't forget to find out what traps are in the places you were supposed to go. The most important ones were the first and the fourth ones. This time is the fourth one the feeling that something bad is coming is still there. The body is faithful to the teachings and the feet have been trying to move sideways for a while now. It's a bit of a stalling exercise. 
Each time it is pointed out by Shayna or the flowing clouds, she changes course. She feels like a condemned man on his way to the gallows, but no, it's not that imminent. Even if it's not imminent, according to the teachings, it's already time to leave. But, Cheeky is not a good talker. Right now, if you could look at her thoughts, they'd look like this. I don't think I can convince them, and it's a pain in the ass to explain. It's likely that we'll end up in a fight and end up splitting up in a messy way. It would be a violation of the third lesson. They are not my peers, but they are the first friends I have. I don't want to leave traces of this bad action, nor make them feel bad. Let's, let's kill them all. I wonder how many times I've thought about that today alone we're getting closer, ain't we? A shiver down ran Cheeky's spine. After all, the moment her hand got close to one of her knives, Shayna, who had always been walking the closest to her, spoke. Yeah, yes, we're close disregarding what were they getting closer to, she decided not to let her nervous self overtake her. Every time she felt like killing any of them, the Lady Knight got very close to her. Cheeky was a self-proclaimed great assassin, but there were no doubts that her skill was real. However, she's no match for this Reaper Knight, who could detect her killing intention even if she was sleeping. Once something dangerous is directed at her, she reacts as if she had a special skill, or was a prodigy, or maybe like if she could see the future. It is said that a warrior trained to the very limit can see the moment when his opponent is about to attack, but Shayna is way too young to have reached that level. No matter how she did it, that woman was still a problem for Cheeky. Of course, she had heard about the rumors about the Reaper Knight, although she thought them exaggerations and not really accurate. Like, those were situations that were told to be inescapable without killing an ally. No, not only that, but some also called them impossible to escape, even if you killed an ally. Anyways, the rumor stated that Shayna Marion was a crazy knight who, once she entered the battlefield, she'd kill everyone, foe or ally all the same. A crazy knight who killed allies as well in order to survive. A crazy knight who was betrayed and killed her enemies. A crazy knight who was chased by a holy knight. Cheeky had only heard all those rumors recently, but they still were eyebrow-raising. All those rumors couldn't be true. Even if there was a holy knight following her, he must have made up all those other rumors. Even if he didn't, then it must be one or two accidents that were greatly exaggerated. The closer the assassin girl became with Shayna, the more she couldn't believe them. She wasn't like that at all. In the end, the rumors were rumors, and this must all have been a defamation campaign by the Order of the Holy Knights. It must have been linked to her ending up in a terrible situation, where her prowesses allowed her to survive, but the same couldn't be said about her allies. Yes, that was it. There was probably something else to it, but the little girl thought it didn't have to do with her, so she stopped thinking about it. And that was fine, until this morning it was different now. Since she decided to stop thinking about it, her mind had done a 180 degree turn. She was someone dangerous. The Reaper Knight was definitely trying to push her to the brink of death. It had been some time already since Cheeky had started to plan new courses of action, but every time she did, she'd been frustrated by the Knight to her side. It may happen once or twice. For some reason, people do things at the same time. Just as you are about to go to the toilet, someone else will think of something and stand up as well. It's not strange that it happens twice in a row. But when that happens all the time, it can't be a coincidence. She felt like she was having her movements blocked. For example, if Cheeky were to try and get out by saying something like I feel like something is wrong, can I go home, or can I leave because the deadline for work is approaching, what would the lady do? But she was sure, she would be killed by a logical and well-reasoned argument. And she knew she wouldn't be able to counter that since she wasn't a good talker. Reaper is the word that comes to Cheeky's mind, once again. This lady knight must have driven everyone to their deaths this way. She knows this. She has a special feeling. She heads to her death but is unaware of her own viability. She takes me to a position where she can escape, even if it's dangerous, but that ends up being just a position where she can escape because she's Shayna. Someone that didn't have that power, like Cheeky, had to escape earlier, as she would die if she got to that point. 
but this woman says, it's still fine, don't worry and brings others closer to death. The people around her, knowing her ability to sense danger, are reassured by this and rush into the danger zone. By the time Shayna thinks she's in danger, it's too late. No one but her can escape anymore. It's something she does unaware and unconsciously. The sense of security the experienced Lady Knight gives to others is immense. If you're not cheeky, you'll find yourself immersed in it. That is why she is dangerous. Both Al and Shayna were dangerous, after all. Cheeky felt uncomfortable when it came to relying upon others. She stops, crouches down, and reties her shoelaces. It was another stalling technique. She wants to get away somehow, but can't think of a plan at all. Then the group stopped and got down low. The girl wondered what were they doing, as she remembered that she was the scout for this team. As she came out of her sea of thoughts, she started listening once again. It was a very loud clash of swords, reverberating everywhere. Just ahead, behind the bushes, about three meters down the cliff, two groups were killing each other. The group was at the perfect spot to watch. Apparently, it seems that she heard the sound of this struggle unconsciously, went around, and moved to this position. Right now, she wanted to both praise her ability to do that even unconsciously and scold herself for not paying attention to what was happening in front of her. It's the Royal Knights and the Blue Leopard Division. I wonder if they're continuing where they left off last time Shayna, who came next to her, murmured. She seems to enjoy it, somewhat. The other day, she denied that it was unseemly for grown men to beat each other up. She loves to fight. She often watches the fights in the innkeeper's quarter with a grin on her face. On the opposite side, Al and Flowing Clouds were standing side by side. The guy looks interested, but I can't make out the expression on Flowing Cloud's face. I can't tell what she's thinking. I don't know what her expression means. She looks like she's not really reflexing, but she's saying the right things at the right time, and I think that her face looks like that precisely because she's thinking about something. The experienced girl watches the fight below them with interest. In a makeshift ring where all the magic groups seem to have been wiped out, perhaps after fighting the Dragon Kings, there were two groups fighting in a narrow area. It was a very chaotic battle. There are two groups that are easily recognizable due to their appearance. One is a heavy, fully armored knight, wearing full-body rat-colored armor, with a shield in his left hand and a sword in his right. The other is a light warrior, wearing a blue leopard jacket and holding a warped, single-edged sword. There are no exceptions, everyone in the ring has one or the other look. Although the ones fighting in the middle had a slight difference. One wore a special helmet in the shape of a lion, and the other held in the opposite hand a sword that was slightly shorter than the ones held by the surrounding mercenaries. The Amazing Lion and the Blue Panther Leopardo Pompadour and the Blue Panther their postures also contrasted. While the lion is standing tall and intimidating, the panther is hunched over and clinging to his sword as if he is holding his stomach. At first glance, it would appear that the lion is dominating the blue panther. However, the opposite is true. The lion is stained with blood on various parts of his armor, and an expression of agony can be seen through the gap in his helmet. The Blue Panther, on the other hand, has no obvious wounds other than the blood pouring from his cheek, and he has a fearless smile on his face. If you looked around, it seemed like most of the people that were lying down were those of the Royal Knights. Cheeky wondered if the Blue Panther had done it by himself, and if he had, she was sure he must have been exhausted by now. The girl has heard a lot about Leopardo, the astonishing lion. The man who makes the impossible possible the undefeated royal knight. A leading figure in the development of the Emperor Dragon Kingdom. He surely was famous, but not as much for people in the underground. He only fights battles he can win, and if there is no chance of winning, he turns tail and runs away. His true nature is that of a cautious coward. The fact that he is still fighting means that the situation is either 50 to 50 or his retreat was cut off. Overall, it seems that the Royal Knights die way more than their opponents, but their numbers are several times those of the Blue Panther Division. The situation is probably 50 to 50. It's a bit too deadly for a continuation of the fight, 
What's going on? Al asks with curiosity. Cheeky looks sideways at Flowing Cloud's face. The assassin was thinking about that attacked magic group. If it was deliberately annihilated by some group, or this killing might be a plot of that group. It's the Order of the Holy Knights Shayna said by herself. Barkle's idea was to destroy the most dangerous group first, and then let the groups that could be destroyed fight each other at any moment. I'm sure that in a few moments the Holy Knights will appear and try to crush the two exhausted groups her brow furrows, and she says, in a voice that sounds like she hates him. There was a hint of disgust in her eyes. Cheeky couldn't help herself and asked. What are you based off? Nothing, really. But Barkle will do that. He's a man who thinks first and foremost about destroying the competition in order to win. He thinks a lot about the phrase that says the lion's does its best to hunt the hare, but when another rival competes with the lion, he's the one who crushes the hare, with his full power Al looked at Shayna with a troubled face. Why does he look like this? Why is he making this face, even putting his hand on his finger? It's a gesture that says you shouldn't talk behind someone's back. Cheeky doesn't really get it. And since the Lady Knight doesn't notice him, the rant doesn't stop. Barkle is brave. Barkle is brave, if only because he is not afraid to take risks in case of failure. If he wants to get promoted, he doesn't just take credit for it, he kills his superiors and his seniors. You are willing to trap your allies in order to pretend to be on a difficult mission. He is so good at destroying evidence and making up stories that he will never be found out, and he is so good at manipulating and laying the groundwork that even if he is found out, he can usually cover it up. The word scum is a perfect synonym for him. The Holy Order is the same, a collection of scum by scum. On the outside, they look like good guys, but they're nothing but trash on the inside dash Shayna keeps ranting all along and doesn't realize. Cheeky, Al, and Flowing Clouds have already noticed and turned around. You've got a lot better at talking behind my back in the short time I haven't seen you. Shinea. A man with the face of a bandit was standing with his veins marked all over his face. Behind them, the mighty knights in their silvery white armor are standing in formation. That's right. If Shayna was right, then the holy knights were watching the battle from somewhere, and there are only a few positions from which they can safely look down. Cheeky was sure they had been close by from the start. When the lady knight heard that man's voice, she turned around and immediately drew her sword from the sheath on her waist. Barkle. You won't get away with this today, Shayna. Holy Knights, draw your swords. It's time to put the hammer down on the ringleader of that nightmare tragedy. The leader pulls out his sword with a tremendous smile on his face. Shayna looked back with an impatient expression, her eyes met with Cheeky. She shouted something, but Cheeky didn't hear her. A holy knight in the background. Two groups killing each other in front. No way out. Nice. Cheeky was delighted. This was her chance. And so, she ran away. She jumped straight down onto the cliff where the two groups were killing each other. It began raining at some point. She ran through the quagmire. It was raining in the mountains, and while normally she'd be swearing and glaring at the heavens, the girl was now happy that it was happening. The rain removes footprints and smells. It also reduces visibility. Sounds are harder to hear. It makes tracking difficult. For a runaway like her, it was a blessing. The muddy ground made it easy to lose your footing, and Cheeky lost her balance several times as she tried not to slow down too much. The sun hadn't set yet, but it was dark nonetheless. Thanks to her night vision, she hasn't lost sight of the ground, but not even she knows where in the mountains is she running right now but the assassin kept running since she was being chased. A glance behind her back reveals Al, who is running dangerously with flowing clouds under his arm, and Shayna focused on the running girl, checking further behind. That night Reaper, she is really planning to kill me, huh? Cheeky frowned, knowing that wasn't true after all. Just before the scout could make her first move to escape, Shayna shouted, Escape! Seeing the little girl's decision to run away through the battlefield, soon both the boy and the lady knight decided to follow her.
the harmonizing, mentally and physically, of two parties engaged in an activity, singing from the same hymn sheet, dancing to the same beat, communicating with their eyes alone, the perfect combination. There was no way there could be such a thing between Cheeky and the rest of the party, who had only met each other about a fortnight ago. Since there wasn't that at all, their intentions were different. The assassin tried to escape by herself, not from the Holy Knights, but from Alex and Shayna. Their eyes met while they were running, but you couldn't see the expected message that would bring, like an over here, or follow me. The girl stopped her legs. And the two behind her did as well. Are we spreading? She asks as if nothing was happening as if it wasn't important like she doesn't care. It seems we're okay Shayna looks behind her and breathes a sigh of relief. If you look at Al, he is rubbing flowing clouds back, who has become motion sick from the violent up and down movements. Who wouldn't get dizzy after riding such a creature, except someone who is used to riding bulls? Both skilled girls use their abilities to run through mud or ice, while the boy relies entirely on power, as Cheeky had seen him do before. If he was about to fall, he would force himself to regain his balance with his other foot, and if the other foot slipped too, he would use his hands to regain his balance. You must possess an unbelievable sense of balance, leg strength, arm strength, and spring in your body to be able to do this. The little girl thinks it's impossible to do it while carrying someone else, at least for a human. It was impossible. As she thought, there was surely something weird with him. It was best to follow her plans and leave him here. I should be going dash be going to prepare a resting place, right? It's night already, so it's probably safer to stay here rather than returning to the town Shayna interrupted her at the last possible second. What? Cheeky Chan? Ah, nothing. I was about to say that, too she suddenly felt overwhelmed. While the thoughts of saying goodbye were still lingering in her mind, and saying something like I'm sick of following you guys, I don't want to get in any danger, I'm going to let you go first was easy, the sun was already setting, she was in the den of dragon kings, and didn't exactly know where she was at all or how to get back, so in conclusion, she had failed to escape. She couldn't do it anymore, at least for now. Since she knew she'd failed, the best thing to do now was to reset her mind and start thinking about what would be the best thing to do from now on. The threat in front of her or the fight they were running from. Cheeky's decision was fast. Anyways, let's move yes, the rain is getting heavier and we need to find a place to use as a shelter Al agreed quickly and lent the magician among them a helping hand to get her on her feet. Shayna, too, gazed into the darkness of the forest behind her and muttered a small I guess so. She then looked at the sky with a slightly nervous face, shook her head and shrugged her shoulders as if nothing had happened. Those actions had the attention of the scout. Maybe she was feeling some kind of danger right now. Maybe, the reaper was putting its scythe over Cheeky's neck. By night, we're leaving you behind. She said as she tried to shake her fears off. And thus, the four of them began walking through a forest, in a deep dark night. With every step she took, she could feel the tension with Shayna, who was walking two steps behind her, getting stronger. It was sunset. It was raining, and even though she had only been walking for about an hour, Cheeky was feeling worn out. The rain had lowered her body temperature and the darkness obstructed her vision, making the girl feel physically and mentally drained. She had never learned how to walk in the mountains at night. After all, there were only a handful of people in the world who walked in the mountains on a regular basis and none who would teach you how to do it. Mountains are the home of dragons, and they are territorial creatures especially the red dragons of the Red Dragon Mountains that go through the middle of the central continent, who will attack you in packs if you take even one step into their territory. The Dragon Kings are relatively less territorial than other dragons, but they will always attack you if they see you in the mountains. It is said that they become more belligerent at night, and it gets even worse when they are excited. The reason Cheeky and the rest are able to walk around like this is that the number of Dragon Kings has decreased dramatically over the past two weeks. While they advance, the assassin is frequently checking on the knight's body language. She looks anxious. It seemed as if she was afraid that something would come at her at any moment and that she would not be able to move. From that look on her face, Cheeky could tell. 
there was a danger approaching, and not even she would be able to handle it. Hey, Cheeky Chan, it's, what's wrong? Don't you like, feel something unpleasant coming from there? When the rain started to grow even stronger, Shayna decided to start changing their course. For Cheeky, it was predictable, but it was not a good idea to head over there. If she was right, Shayna would be the only one who could turn back here and survive, were they to go that way. I see, well, luckily for us, there's a cave just right there, so let's set up a camp for tonight there from a distance, visible through the trees is a cavern with the shape of a gaping mouth. It is wide, over two meters high, and easy to see. Cheeky's sixth sense is telling her that's the wrong place to be, and now would be the wrong time. That cave is, well, let's rent the place for the night with Al's voice of authority, the night lady ended up being completely disregarded. It was hard to say why, but there was a bad feeling coming from that cave, so it would have been best to avoid it. It wasn't only Shayna, but their scout also wanted to shout it loud. As they got closer to the cave, it became easier to tell why did it give that feeling. First of all, there was an indescribable foul smell that comes from the entrance of the cave. Humans are sensitive to smells. We have a very good sense of smell, especially when it comes to judging whether a smell is good or bad, though not as good as a dog's. Not only was the smell bad, but it also meant there was someone else beside them over there. Looking up at the edge of the cave. It is a beautiful bowl shape. It's easy to describe it as a gaping hole, but it's hard to see how it would naturally look like this. It is unnatural as if someone had forced it to spread out. Then, they looked at the ground. There was a single rut in the road as if something had been dragged through it. Once you've come that far, you can instantly guess what was ahead. This cave is the nest of the Dragon Kings. Well, in fact, they do not have a specific place of residence like the beasts of the plains. At certain times of the year, however, they dig caves and begin to live in them. No one has observed this behavior in detail, but there are some hypotheses based on animals with similar characteristics. Cheeky didn't know all the details, but she knew that the female dragon kings laid their eggs and raised their children in those caves. They weren't sure when the egg-laying sessions were supposed to be, but really, they didn't need to know. The cave's smell reflected it was probably upon them. Phew, it sure is good to have found a shelter from the rain, isn't it? While saying that, Alex sits down on a dry stone near the entrance to the cave. He's still as optimistic as ever. It probably has to do with him not knowing what he's in for. Flowing Clouds was no longer as listless as she had been earlier, and was curiously fiddling with a wooden stick a brown lump, probably dragon shit, that had fallen nearby. Only Shayna looks pale, her eyes darting back and forth between the back of the cave and the outside. This is a place of certain death. Animals that lay their eggs and raise their young are usually in a frenzy. The Dragon King is no exception. Only humans can be kind to each other after the birth of a child. Predator males may consider even their own young as food, so females are desperate. And this case was not an exception. They wouldn't be so carefree as to let a few humans at the entrance of their nest go unnoticed. Soon they will come out. They will come out soon to chase away the offenders from the egg-laying site and the entrance. Cheeky is waiting for that. She rested her body, relaxed her mind but kept her nerves sharp. She couldn't get the timing wrong, even it was a fraction of a second. She couldn't fail now. She would push Shayna against the Dragon Kings, and then run away. Whoever wanted to take on their new enemies after that, could perfectly do so. She would make her escape. Al must have come for that. The girl doesn't know how good he is, but it doesn't matter to Cheeky whether he wins or loses, she will escape. Since he saved her life, she wanted to protect it now, and to do so, she had to escape. By the way, flowing clouds, muttered as if trying to say something. That man from before, the one who killed the rising sun the rising sun. Cheeky knows that name. It's the name of the general of a magic squad in the northern part of the central continent, one of the magic groups they saw in the tavern that day. He is a well-known figure in that circles. He is someone who manipulates light and heat magic with ease, and it's also an advanced class fighter. So, does that mean the Holy Knights were the ones who attacked your group? 
It seems so, the magician girl nods as to confirm Al's suspicions. Well, that's what they understood, at least. Still, it's the conclusion most would arrive after being presented all the information they currently had. I knew this was all Barkle's fault Shayna frowned as she expressed that. Her face always became like that when talking about the Holy Order. Hmm, do you think the battle between the Royal Knights and the Blue Leopard Division was also arranged by them? The assassin girl proclaimed this as she put her hand in her chin as to think, but the Lady Knight answered immediately, I'm sure they were the woman was stubborn. She wanted to constantly remember people that the Holy Order was rotten with evil people. So it was the Holy Order who crushed the magic squad from before. Well, it made sense, as they were the ones that seemed to care the most about the subjugation of the Emperor Dragon King. Cheeky thought that was she in that position, she'd probably do the same. The Knights of the Holy Order are a rather shallow bunch, aren't they? Al doesn't have a good look on his face. It's the face of boredness and hopelessness someone shows when they realize they're against an utterly disgusting amount of trickery. That being said, Al, there isn't anything wrong with crushing your competitors, you know? How can you be so innocent to not properly assess the strength of your opponent? Question mark. They didn't quite get the exact meaning of those words, but it seems he doesn't like them. Those same words can also apply to you, Al Cheeky said that for the moment, and in response, the boy looked with a blank expression at her. No hero would take the initiative in targeting an ally, or a rival. Maybe it just wasn't talked about, but nobody had heard of a hero who avoids his problems and relaxes, even if they surpass the others. Al was probably shocked that, the Holy Order, from where many heroes have emerged, was planning on doing something like that. Be quiet. And while saying that, Shayna gripped her sword. Be quiet she put her index finger in her mouth, closed her eyes, and started seriously focusing. It was as she was trying to hear something from very far away. And then, effortlessly, she drew her sword. There was no bloodlust to be felt. That was the only way someone like Cheeky, who was a great assassin, couldn't have reacted to it. The sword was placed at her throat, in a very quick manner. Since it was an unseen technique for her until now, that meant it was probably North God style, a minor school at the time. Both Alex and Flowing Clouds were taken aback by this action. It looks like the Knights of the Holy Order have somehow found us. I'm sure there's someone who can use tracking magic among all of them that makes sense then. Why did you put a sword to my throat? Shayna forcibly lifts the edge of her mouth, looking down at the short cheeky with a despised look, as if to make a fool of her. I thought of using you guys as a bait to run away. What a sudden change of heart. What are you talking about, Cheeky Chan? I didn't change my mind. You already knew that I was hunted by the Holy Order and that's why they call me the Reaper Knight. I've been planning to do this all along. I'm sorry, but I'm going to run away while you guys fight the Holy Order. It was true, Cheeky knew, but she kept her mouth shut, as she thought it wasn't a big thing at all. Suddenly, Al, who was watching Shayna suspiciously, read her lips. I've seen that you two don't get along, but were you being chased? Yes I see, I understand now Al said that easily holding flowing clouds under his arm. Uh. The boy walked towards Shayna, while the girl in his arm couldn't yet understand what was happening. Cheeky panicked. Wait, Cheeky is being held hostage, what will you do if she stabs me? That's true. Don't move. As the two of them shouted at him he suddenly stopped. Excuse me, I wasn't told to stay still it's alright. Now, in that way, start slowly walking BAC dash before she could finish, Al moved easily, grabbed the girl by the collar, lifted her up, and then carelessly moved out of Shayna's range. The knight couldn't react. Maybe it was because the timing was just too quick, and maybe it also had to do that she didn't hate her opponents, but in the end, she didn't move. Cheeky looked up as soon as she felt the coldness of the rain. She could see Al's face, with a strange expression and somewhat of a bitter smile, looking at her. Well, if you excuse us, we're off to fight the Holy Order and after politely bowing, he turned and walked away. They walked far away, enough not to see the cave even if it was daytime before the boy dropped the two girls on the ground. Cheeky had a grim expression on her face. I failed, so, I'm probably going to die now, so she thought. 
They had been betrayed by Shayna, who realized she wouldn't be able to escape from the Holy Knights and used them as bait to try once again. She had surely been living like this. She was probably even watching the party now, so that, were her pursuers to find her, she would detour them into facing Al's group. What a thing, Cheeky was indignant. In the end, both Shayna and the Holy Order acted as mere dogs. They were just disgusted at each other for being so similar. Al, that nest's dragon, big? I know. That's why she helped us escape was that what happened? Yeah, probably, that's what took place. Cheeky suddenly interrupted the conversation between Alex and the magician. Wait, both of you explain. What are you talking about? Let Cheeky know as well didn't you realize? It wasn't a mocking tone, yet still, the girl somehow felt a pride she didn't know she had hurt. It's not like I didn't notice, I just don't know what the hell are you talking about? And just as she was about to start complaining, the party leader's word reset her mind. That was Kajak's nest well, what was that Kajak they were talking about? Ah yes, it was the name of the Emperor Dragon King. Usually, dragons don't name themselves, but in the Great Human Demon War, the demon god named all the Emperor Dragons. Emperor Dragon King Kajak, Emperor Red Dragon Syriac, Emperor Sea Dragon Redlift, Emperor Black Dragon Rugork, Emperor Blue Dragon Rakrak, etc. Nowadays, the only Emperor Dragon alive is the Emperor Dragon King Kajak, as all the others have been featured in the heroic tale of their defeat. However, his was a different one, as he defeated the hero who tried to best him. So, what do you mean? What was the Reaper thinking? Hmm, I'm not exactly sure, but she must have a plan, as I'm now hearing the earth shaking roaring from deep inside the cave is the Holy Order coming for us? I'm sure they'll be here soon as they probably have info about where the Emperor Dragon King lives. We could try changing places, but I think sooner or later they'll find us and what happens when someone is between the Dragon and the Holy Knights? They surely die he said it easily. With such ease, that it left Cheeky confused, once again. What's going on? She had thought Shayna was sending them to their deaths, but it seems like in the end she was. It seems this was always her intention, as Shayna san has said from the beginning. If we were to find us against an impossible to evade or deal with danger, she would somehow help Cheeky san and Flowing Cloud san. That's why she was traveling with us, as she said. Impossible. It had all been a misunderstanding in her mind, due to Cheeky's paranoia. She had somewhat felt that intention a bit, but had disregarded it as something impossible when she was totally focusing on escaping. While she thought that, flowing clouds clapped her hands. Clap, clap. A little applause that reverbs through the rain. And, the next moment, that same rain has become stronger, hitting the trees, and creating small holes in the ground. It was the art of manipulating the rain. The girl who controls the clouds was doing something. The rain. I made it stronger. For now, when confused by this, escape. Good luck. Cloud Son, are you going? Yes, if I can help, I want to. I don't abandon friends, and I want to defeat cowards. My first goal was defeat Dragon. This is the same I see, then, good luck with that um as the girl nodded, she went back in the cave's direction, her feet wet. She is a serious woman who has three objectives, not to abandon the party who took her in, avenge the party she was a member of, who was attacked from behind by cowards, and to subjugate the Emperor Dragon King. If she were to spend her life completing those three tasks, then it would be fine. If in order to achieve those three at the same time, she had to go, then she would. Cheeky was lost. She was proud of her humanity. She had been told by the Master, a cold-hearted assassin is strong but fragile, if you want to live long you must become a warm and flexible assassin. Still, she didn't want to be a stepping stone for others. Two thoughts were clashing in her mind. One of them was to help Shayna, who they had been working with, and someone they should not abandon. The other was that it would be foolish to put her life in danger for something like that. Both of them had a point. It is said that life is what we make of it, but it would be hard to live with regret. She wasn't the type who forgets about this type of stuff easily, either. Cheeky was relieved, in the end, 
she thought that she'd rather go back to that cave. Just recently, she had wanted to run away from it so much, it was the first time something like this happened to her. Her actions and thoughts had become inconsistent. I will also go back after all that thinking, that's what she said. In the last two weeks, except for the last day, she had never felt uncomfortable with Shayna. Until the very end, Shayna was still Shayna. If the last day was a misunderstanding, then it was Cheeky's fault. Even if the knight had not been hurt, the assassin was ready to apologize for her actions. It was a quick decision, one that came from the heart. And thus, she called for the guy who was standing there while smiling. All right, let's go, Al, I am not going. Cheeky stops in her tracks, as she had started following Flowing Cloud's path. What was that? Facial expressions were made unconsciously, sometimes. They came out even if you weren't thinking about it, or didn't realize it. The night, Shayna, are you going to abandon her? Al opened his mouth as to start saying some words, to the point that even an A dash could be heard before he stopped and just nodded. It seems like I'll have to abandon her, Cheeky couldn't understand what she was feeling right now. She held her temples and thought. It wasn't anger, nor was bewilderment. It was different, but it was true that some of those were there, in that mix. But, she saved you, didn't she? What are you talking about? I have not been saved by her it wasn't clear what was cold, whether it was Cheeky's heart, her body, or if it was Al's attitude. What was clear, was the shock inside the girl's head, as her mind got blank. This guy, what, what did he say? Shayna said that she wanted to help flowing clouds and Cheeky. So. Does this mean he's not part of the group that wants to help them, is that what he meant? It felt disgusting for the girl. She had always thought of Al as a man with a very strong sense of justice, a gentleman that couldn't be matched by anyone else. A reckless man who talks about becoming a hero, she had never hated him. She knew he wasn't as mature as Shayna, since he's not an adult, and was even entertained seeing how he planned on living. Such man had now made an utterly disgusting choice like that. Cheeky isn't righteous, but she is a girl that kept her dreams in her mind, and even if it's been some years since she's been working as an assassin, she keeps both her dreams and her charm. Secretly, she even supported Al, as she hoped that he would try as hard as he could, even if eventually he got bored, or had to face reality and give up and leave the path of a hero. That man suddenly returned his hand. He just wanted his life. Did he really think a man who abandons his comrades as easily as that could become a hero? Al, I misjudged you Cheeky said that disgustedly. She thought that he would somehow still smile and laugh when she told him about misjudging him, but surprisingly, after having heard that, the boy's face became one filled with surprise. And slowly, turns into a sad face. It couldn't be, was he feeling sorry for what he has said? In that case, the girl thought it was good she had stayed there and told him to then go help Shayna. If you think you're doing bad, then let's go, Al no, I just, can't do that he said, sadly, squeezing out the words. Then, he turned on his heel. Cheeky snorted once while sneering at him. He looked like a boy running away from something he didn't like. If this was his usual reaction to this type of thing, it would hit him really hard when did it in an emergency. Cheeky realized it didn't mean anything anymore to look at his back, and thus, turned her back away from Al. Chapter 6, The Boy Who Was Abandoned, Part 2 What have I done wrong? Al asks himself. What has he done wrong? He asks once more, but even then, he can't think of an answer. He'd like to say out loud that he didn't do anything wrong. But were that the case, the boy wouldn't have gotten that scornful look from Cheeky. He had done something wrong. If that wasn't the case, he wouldn't be walking by himself now. Maybe it had to do with Shayna's thing. No, it couldn't be that, he was sure of it. That's because there had been a promise. If it gets dangerous, I want you to leave me alone and run Al had just respected that woman's promise. So, he wasn't wrong. So, where had he failed then? The young warrior's father was a gentle man, who was tolerant of failure. Don't be afraid of failure. Don't regret your mistakes. Don't blame it on luck. There is a reason for failure. 
understand the reason and don't fail next time. On the other hand, he was very strict about success. Don't get drunk on success. Don't be immersed in success. Don't think of your success as a result of your abilities. Success is a result of luck. Remember your actions, find out where you relied on luck, and apply it next time. He never got angry when Al made the same mistakes. He never told him what he did wrong. That was his father's education, and his mother had no say in it. That's why Al thinks like this. There is a reason for failure. There is no doubt about it. There is no such thing as a failure without a reason. But no matter how much he thought about the actions he had taken, he couldn't find that reason. That's why he was thinking. Thinking, while getting soaked by a dark, heavy rain. He walked for around half an hour until he found that group. There was a fluttering light, coming from a bonfire, in the middle of the dark. A bonfire in this rain? As the boy approached, he saw that water repellent cloth had been tied to the trees to form a huge roof. In the center was a large bonfire. Judging from the buzzing sound of raw wood burning, it seemed to be made directly from wood that had been chopped in the area. Around it, there seemed to be a group of very hot people. A man with muscles to the point of bursting out of his body folded his arms in front of the fire, and men, men, and more men sat in regular rows in front of him. Sometimes there are women in the mix, but without exception, they all have muscles that would make a sailor pale in comparison. They are the martial arts group, Phoenix's Nest. They are the embodiment of the fist, smashing everything with their bare hands. At that time, Al realizes he had never seen them in town before. It sounded impossible, but could it be they had been staying in the mountain the whole time for these two weeks? As he got closer, that idea became more and more plausible. Behind them, lined up in regular order, there was at least one huge object. A chunk of meat, it is a dragon king's body. As he got closer, two other plates appeared, one in front of the other. On one of them were massive bones and meat, and on the other were wild grasses and mushrooms that looked like they could have grown anywhere. Seeing this, anyone's first thoughts would be self-sufficient. Hmm. A naked man standing in front of the fire with his arms crossed turned around. His eyes met Al's, who was looking like a wet rat. Could this be, Alex Dono? Hey, fondly, it's been some time Al approached the man who was expected to be the next head of the phoenix's nest in a friendly manner. When you think of the Emperor Dragon Kingdom as a city, Al's hometown quickly becomes the countryside. Al, also known as Alex Ryback, was the son of that countryside's lord. He had met fondly when both were still kids as the current head of the phoenix's nest was doing his training to become a warrior, which meant he was traveling the world. The two met at around the same age and deepened their friendship as children, and even now they still talk with each other, from time to time. It had been a long time since they had seen each other. When Al saw that man in the tavern, he hesitated to speak to him, partly because the muscles he had developed over the years made it difficult to identify him from a distance and partly because he could not be sure that he was the same man he had known as a child. I'm such a rude person. I've realized it was you since I saw you at that tavern, Alex Dono you've trained all too well. Isn't it hard to move with all that? Those muscles, I mean. They look heavy heavy fists are for heavy bodies. All my muscles are very flexible and perfected. They are heavy but flexible and springy, that they are, and when they are ready to move, they are as agile as Mashira. Let me show you that Fong started to laugh with a loud wahaha as he slapped both his arms, which made a loud bang sound. A couple of his students, who were doing their post-meal muscle training in pairs, glanced at Fong. Head of the fighting squad, Phoenix's Nest, that was his current title. Even though it's a hereditary title, you have to be good to take your students on an expedition. As soon as you realized, one of them was in front of Fong. Leader, we see that that man is a swordsman, what kind of relationship do you have with him? A very close friend for about ten years, he is excuse me, leader, but we are taught not to associate with weak swordsmen the other pupils were disturbed by the pupil's imperious attitude. How could he talk like that to the leader? But the man looked down arrogantly at Fong, with a face that said he believed not to be wrong. From what Al could see, 
he was by far the strongest of the students. He's someone you'd call the best student, he guessed. Waha, does Alex Ryback really look like a weak swordsman to you? Waha, listen, how long, do you really understand the meaning of the words do not associate with weak swordsmen? Yes, I do. It means that you will not grow strong if you keep being friends with those who are so weak, they have to rely on the sword that's correct. Then, what kind of men rely on their swords? Lazy men who do not train their body, but seek only the skill of their hands and the power of their sword that's correct. So, and then, Fong looked at Al, I'm not sure if he's one of those lazy swordsmen, that he's only after hand skill and his sword's power it was a mosquito repellent gesture. Fong waved his arms, and, at the same time, a sound like the one produced by dry branches popping could be heard. All the students instantly recognized the sound, it was a serious backfist from their master. Something blew off level with the ground and smashed into a tree above them. From the top of the tree, drops of water fell in what could be thought was a sudden squall. I don't know if that's correct yet. I don't know yet, but I'm an old friend who hasn't seen you for a long time, that I do as Fong says that and shrugs his shoulders, Al, who had been blown all the way to the tree, stood up. He held his nose as he quickly returned near the warm bonfire. That hurts, Fong it's worse when you can't avoid it, that it is well, that's also true how long, the student, looked pale. The other pupils also fell silent, and the atmosphere became completely quiet. The head of the group kept talking as if nothing had happened. Alex Dono, have you come to subjugate the Emperor Dragon King, have you? Al also kept talking, as if nothing had happened. Yes, that's my intention are you here for revenge, is it? That's not it. I just want to become a hero that is very Alex Dono-ish. If that's the case, I shall support you too, that it is he palmed the boy's back as he laughed with a loud waha waha. He is also happy to hear this, since Fong is being serious about the support, he's not mocking him. I'm grateful for your support, but, is there something worrying you? Yes. I was going to become a hero by defeating the King of Dragons, but it seems that I have failed. My friends have given up on me the boy, sadly, laughs at himself. This is troubling because I don't know if I will really become a hero after defeating the Emperor Dragon King, and I don't know why I failed either him, well, I can give you some advice, Alex Dono. Whenever you are troubled, it is best to sit back, calm your mind and talk to someone. Now, don't be shy, eat some dragon meat. We have come to this mountain for a picnic to eat dragon's meat and be strong like a dragon, for that we have no time limit, no matter where the dragon kings and the emperor dragon king are. I will stay with you even if it is a long story that takes all night, that I will after hearing that, Al begins to talk. He talked about the two women he helped while getting to the town, about what he had done these last two weeks, about how he had recently parted ways with both women, and as he did that, Fong understood really quickly what had been happening there. And then, he laughed, and asked, as if was to any of his pupils, Alex Dono, what does it mean to be a hero? Someone who defeats a monster that'd usually take a whole army to beat, right? The big man nods, as if approving, and answers, that is right, but not completely, is it? There are many who have defeated that type of monster and have been called a hero, but there are also those who do the same, yet they are not called heroes. So that's why I ask of you, what's the difference between them? Al was at a loss for words when asked what the difference was. What could it be, and his doubt was real, because deep down, he knew that, even if he were to defeat the Emperor Dragon King, he wouldn't be called a hero, and that's why he was worried about what else would he need. Yet his longtime friend once again, answers with ease. It's your friends, it is. After all, it doesn't matter what your form is, if you end up defeating the monster by yourself, with no one else to share the fight, then what else is it but a fight between monsters a fight between monsters, you say? That's right, it is. Think about it, from the point of view of a weak human being, someone that can defeat the Emperor Dragon King is but another monster. But if that monster is allied with humans, and defeats the monster to protect them, then it is there when they are called a hero then, my mistake was to, yes, it was to keep your promise, it was. Since you then had abandoned the female knight the boy stood up. 
Having realized his mistake, he couldn't stay there anymore, suddenly he couldn't even stay quiet, and started moving, and that was soon running. Thank you, fondly. You really helped me being here. The phoenix's nest members looked in dismay as the boy left in a flash, and how long? The man who lunged at Fawn earlier, asks him fearfully, Wah, what is that boy, exactly? He is just an ignorant, field-raised little boy, he is the boy who can take the rock-breaking fist of the head, and stay calm as if nothing happened? The voice of the man was still trembling. Well, I only know the old Alex Dono, that I do. It would not be surprising if he became a hero, just in the way I became a teacher and wah, what would happen if he didn't? Gah. In that case I will have failed to judge him, and will give up my title as the head of the organization, and go on a training trip by myself, that I will the rain is growing stronger and stronger, at the same rate that people grow more and more anxious. Fondly, a man who was a veteran fighter, with dozens of students under him, laughed. By the time the rain stopped, he would still be laughing, as a legend would have been born already. Chapter 7, Emperor Dragon King Flowing Clouds is a low-ranked combat magician. Her real name is Frau Claudia, and she's a serious, ambitious person, who lies whenever it's convenient to do so. As a child, her future was as bright as the most splendid star in the sky. At only three years of age, she was recognized for her talent in magic and became an apprentice to the highest-ranked combat magician of the Magic Guild Leaves from the World's Tree. At age 6, she was already a full-time student. By age 10, officially a beginner mage, and by the time she was 13, her rank had risen to intermediate magician. Compared to the average, she was 7 years faster. And then, she was 16. Not taking into account her age, her skills were at a level that would allow her to be authorized as a senior magician. Once that happened, she could call herself a medium-level combat magician. At that level, you can call yourself a full-fledged magician. You can become a freelance sorcerer or be employed by some other country. You can be hired for far more money than a half-hearted sorcerer. There's as big a difference between the lower and middle ranks as between an adult and a child. Now, in order for her to sit for the advanced sorcerer's licensing examination, she needs her master's approval, but he is currently in a very difficult position. The magic society leaves from the world's tree has its different factions, where two of them are by far the largest, the sun and moon factions. Frau Claudia's master, the strongest combat magician, is also the leader of the moon faction. They had just lost a number of competent people due to a backstabbing from the sun faction, and with the consequent reduction in major jobs, the moon faction was being cornered by the sun faction. With all these events weighing on his back, the master said to Frau, who wanted an authorization test, now it's not the time for that, and first of all, you should get a little stronger, physically, first Frau was impatient. At this rate, the faction would collapse, and when that happened, her master would at best be thrown out, or at worst privately executed, and as his disciple, she herself would be kicked out of the guild. Before that, she had to take a senior magician's licensing exam. Otherwise, she would have to find another master in a different magic guild and get approved again from scratch. All the hard work she'd done up to that point would be for naught. And that'd be troublesome. Frau has ambitions. She wants to become a rich wizard and set up orphanages all over the world. In order to keep this ambition alive, she decided to take part in the Dragon King's subjugation. And it had already served its purpose. She had bribed Barkle, a well-known holy knight in the area, so that he'd attack the Rising Sun, the highest-ranking combat magician of the whole Magic Guild and leader of the Sun faction, also taking out several other high-rank members, who'd also be present there. Her miscalculation, however, was that the timing of the attack was in the evening and that Barkle was unexpectedly merciless, so the whole magic group that had been sent to deal with the Dragon Kings was wiped out. Frau was also almost killed. That near death was Frau's fault for not moving herself to safety. Barkle did not break his promise and the rising sun died as a result, so good riddance. It was a small retaliation that Barkle told Al and the others that he had done it. Now, although she had been lucky enough to be rescued by a dreamy fool once she had run out of magic and physical strength, 
Frau realized that it would be somewhat bad if she went home empty-handed. If she was deemed to have run away without even seeing what happened, she might end up dishonoring his master. Also, if only one person survives, others might suspect that you killed the others. So, at the very least, Flowen Clouds wanted the result of having participated in the battle against the Emperor Dragon King. Even if she didn't kill him, if, in the end, it appeared that the girl had fought through to the end, she'd be able to save the face of the Magic Guild. If that happened, the Sun Faction would not be able to denounce them head on. And that's why, right now, Frau is fighting against the Emperor Dragon King. It was only a size larger than the ordinary Dragon Kings. However, it was clearly more adept than the three dragons the girl fought on the first day, and it used space so well to get around that the narrow caves seemed spacious. To fight, it used claws that were small for its giant body, but extremely sharp, as well as gravity magic. And finally, the flame breath. Mount Strong, is this the Emperor Dragon King? As she thought this, Frau makes her right hand load both feet with magic. The staff in her left hand is already loaded with the strongest water hammer magic that Frau can use. Grass-style combat magic. This combat technique treats the four extremities as bullets. Half-chanting loads the four parts with meaningless magic power, and just before using it, the remaining half-chanting gives it meaning and ejects it. Those bullets are used in three ways, attack, defense, and movement. The left hand with the staff, which is the medium that can handle the most enormous magical power, was loaded with the greatest offensive magic into it so that she could strike with her strongest technique at the best possible time. Move the claws attack comes. At the same time, the right foot's mana is given sense, and after igniting, the girl moves to the side, as if bullets had been shot. Fire, Benelli giving meaning to the magic of the right hand as it is about to land. Ignition, three fireballs, each with a different trajectory, strike the king of the dragon kings and explode. They succeed in inflicting a painful itch, comparable to a mosquito bite. It is determined that there is no damage. The firebullet magic frau used is only intended for use against humans and is not suited for long-range firefights with giant creatures. Her water hammer magic, instead, would work against such a foe, since it's a deadly technique that boils the blood of the opponent and causes instantaneous death. However, it must be cast at point-blank range. The problem is, the girl cannot close the distance. As expected of the Emperor Dragon King, he is no fool. He is not the kind of creature that can be dealt with a magician's pocket trick. Just for a moment, she felt like she had chosen the wrong technique. However, there was no other one that could one-shot such foe in her arsenal. Mount she once again loads mana in her right hand and leg, which had already lost their previous charge. Her mind was beginning to be filled with thoughts of loss, gradually. Since they couldn't land a coup de grace, they were gradually losing strength and mana. Daria Wawawea as if to cover the gap created by Frau's loading, Shayna swings her one-handed sword, leaps with a yell, and slashes. The blade makes contact with the elbow of the dragon's forelimb, making a tremendous metallic sound and creating a shallow wound while filling the ambient with sparks. Sparks are the proof of magic preventing a slash. The Emperor Dragon King is constantly spreading gravity magic over his entire body to strengthen his defense. Swordsmanship cuts the enemy with skill and tuki, but the power of the sword is reduced by offsetting each other with magic. The Reaper Knight can only inflict damage to the extent of conventional arm strength. Her arm strength is not enough to penetrate the dragon's hard scales. She furthermore, Cheeky throws a knife as if to support Shayna, who has made a slash with all her might. The assassin girl decided the eyes were her target, as that is the single point not protected by the scales. But dragons also have eyelids. The dagger bounces off with a light cracking sound, but it succeeds in momentarily blinding the dragon. Thanks to that, the woman was able to regain her spacing. They are lacking decisive power. Their foe is inflicting small damage, but in exchange, it is draining a reasonable amount of physical and magical power. Even if the damage and exhaustion are the same, the Emperor Dragon King, which is bigger than Frau and the other three combined, has more magic power and physical strength in absolute terms. 
the magician girl grit her teeth. If only she were a bit more mobile, she could have been able to deliver the ultimate technique. Without the mobility provided by grass-style combat magic, Frau would be nothing more than a girl of her age. If you think about it, the girl's actual combat experience can only be counted on one hand, and all of her battles have been those in which she has outnumbered her opponents. She had never fought a battle where the results had been 50-50, much less imagined a battle in which she was at a disadvantage. The situation where even a single blow would kill you was more physically demanding than she'd expected. Clouds John, are you okay? Ah, ah, Shayna calls out to her side in concern, but Frau is unable to reply. The words her master had told her before going to the Dragon King subjugation came back to her mind. Now it's not the time for that, and first of all, you should get a little stronger, physically, first she used to laugh at that but was now regretting it. If I had done a bit of running, I wouldn't be out of breath like this now, she thought. The most important thing for a combat magician is to build up their physical strength with a view to long-term warfare. No matter how much instantaneous magical power you can emit, if it is not accompanied by decisive power like this, you will be out of the game. Shayna and Cheeky were moving three times as much as Frau, but they still seemed to have room to spare. Especially the little girl, who has been running at full speed for a few minutes already, without stopping, as to keep disturbing the dragon, and yet she still has a smile on the corner of her mouth. Her fighting style is to run around at high speed and throw knives whenever she finds an opening. The thrown knife has a very fine thread attached to it, which is then pulled back to release a second, unpredictable blow as the knife returns to the girl's hand. Some knife shapes seem to be able to use centrifugal force to penetrate armor, but they still lack offensive power. There is no damage to their current enemy. It seems that this technique is only for killing humans. While running around, Cheeky throws knives, occasionally feigning to avoid dragon attacks, and supports Shayna as she attacks in the gaps. I have to move too, Frau thinks. Her legs are wobbling and shaking. It's both due to fatigue and fear. I should never have ventured this far for the sake of looking good to my master. I should have just gone back to town with Al, she thought, from the bottom of her heart. Regret is meaningless. If I don't move, if I don't move, if I don't move, you ah wah. Shayna's slash gouged out the dragon's ventral side, a slightly softer part. Go ah ya. Yeah. The dragon cries out in agony as it is slashed in a place where it's not covered by its thick scales. We did it! Frau shouted involuntarily, and in the exact next moment, she realized how it was a mistake. Shayna was highly skilled, but at this time, her intuition and skill opposed each other. She was powerless and could not even cut through the dragon's belly. With her buried sword, her movement was halted. As the magician realized why it was a bad idea, Shayna was hit from directly above by the dragon's powerful gravity magic. Gag? With a less than flattering scream, Shayna is knocked to the ground. The Emperor Dragon King lifts its legs to deliver the finishing blow. If I don't help, if I don't help, if I don't help, Shayna. Dodge it. Cheeky tries to rescue the knight, who is trying to stand up with her whole body shaking like a newborn lamb while the assassin restrains her with a knife. The dragon read the move. Since the pattern had been repeated several times, the formidable opponent knew the girl would move. Light comes from the dragon's mouth. A frightening red color. Flame breath. If the little girl received that, there wouldn't even be remains that could be called Cheeky's body. Just as the breath with its terrifying pressure was about to be spat out at the girl, Frau's hand moved. Fire, blind drip slash move meaning the freshly loaded right hand and right foot at the same time. First, she released a wall of water towards the mouth of the Emperor Dragon King, offsetting the flame breath. The resulting steam explosion blasts the smaller girl backwards. Once that was done, the magician lands beside Shayna with a magic leap-like movement. She grabs her by the collar and raises her up. Immediately above, the dragon now brings down its leg and so the remaining left foot is given meaning. Move! As if hit by a wild boar, the knight and the magician's bodies fly away. Not even a second later, the dragon bursts open the ground where they had just stood. 
Barely, they had escaped. Are you okay? Uh. Frau looks down at Shayna. Her plate is full of cracks, but fortunately, she is not dead. She is dazed, yet still conscious. The armor seems to have shrugged off the king dragon's gravity magic, but it's not like her protection could nullify it completely. The damage definitely penetrated the knight. She then looks towards Cheeky. The girl was crouched at the edge of the wall. It seems that she was blown away by the aftermath, knocked against the wall, forced to expel the air from her lungs, and is having difficulty breathing. The Emperor Dragon King looks down on the magician, without making any noise. There is nothing to do now. The only magic already loaded is the water hammer of the staff. Powerful, but unable to break through the situation. A despair-inducing red light appears in the dragon's mouth. Looking up at it, Frau thinks. It was simple, in the end. In the first place, had they ever had a chance against the King of the Dragon Kings? They had challenged the dragon without any chance of victory and had lost their lives after a futile and worthless effort. It would be meaningless to reflect on how they could have won. Ah, have I given up on myself? That's what she thought, when, fire. Several arrows of light pierced the dragon. Form phalanxes, and charge. It was a group of dazzling white armor. They entered an orderly formation and swiftly charged, as a group, into the Emperor Dragon King. Gah! The dragon reacts and retracts the flames in its mouth. Don't let it use gravity magic. Holy artificers, to the front. At the order of a sneaky man standing in the center, the rear guard, the first group to throw the arrows of light, step forward. In their hands is a staff in the shape of a sword. All are users of sorcery, or rather, the holy arts as given by St. Melis. The Black Queen has bestowed upon you, A, ancestor of the A, to become the heroic spirit and the tin sword the Melis followers are following one theory. Frau witnessed the obliteration of the Emperor Dragon King's gravity magic. The common foe had lost its protective barrier. Not only that, but according to the theory they were following, this dragon, without its gravitational field, cannot bear its own weight, and until it can cast magic again, it has no choice but to crawl on the ground like a caterpillar and spray the silver knight with its deadly red flames. It's useless. The defensive holy art applied to the shining armor worn by the regular holy knights is robust. It only ended up turning the skin of a few of them slightly red, as if it was the blush of a maiden in love. The knights in white armor rushed at the dragon, which was unable to move. All too easily, the dragon that had tormented Frau and the others died. The cave was filled with the vomit-inducing stench of the Emperor Dragon King's blood. In there, flowing clouds and her group were surrounded by a group of holy knights. They had been disarmed, but ultimately not tied up, as they were deemed unable to escape from the cave in their current conditions. It seems that the holy knights are more of a group of gentlemen than people say. With austere expressions on their faces, they are monitoring the three women and keeping watch over their surroundings, while some others are examining the King of Dragon King's body. Not all of them are gentlemen, though. There's one knight with a nasty expression on his face, grabbing Shane up by the collar. Barkle. To Frau, he's a man whose full name or nickname is unknown and she only knows that he's a man with a high position in the Holy Order. She knew him because they had spoken directly when the man was crushing the rising sun, but he didn't give the girl a second glance, perhaps because he was ignoring her, or perhaps because he was only interested in the woman knight. Hey, Shayna, you know that there is a bounty for the Reaper Knight, from St. Millis? You're the one who put it up, aren't you? That's right. It's for the sake of all those who died when you betray us, ha. Huh? See who's talking. Maybe I should tell everyone here who the real traitor is I don't care about weird shit getting to my men's ears Barkle smiles insidiously. It was as if the chief of a group of bandits was about to commit an indecent act on a young lady who happened to be in the carriage he had attacked, but Barkle wouldn't actually do it. As Frau saw it, Barkle is the type of man who values money and fame more than carnal desires. Whatever carnal desires he may have for Shayna, he will act with moderation in front of his men. And he would not kill Shayna in a fit of emotion. But Ma'an, ain't today the best day of my life? 
Not only do I get to kill the Emperor Dragon King, but I can also stop Shayna's actions. This is all thanks to St. Millis well, but for me, it's my life's worst even as she says this, Shayna's gaze is constantly moving around her. She is glancing at the girls, probably thinking that she can at least let Frau and Cheeky escape. However, the thoughts on the magician's mind were this has nothing to do with me. At that moment, one of the knights who had been inspecting the dragon's corpse returned. But man, I still can't believe it, huh? It was pretty easy, defeating the Emperor Dragon King. For such a legendary creature, I can't believe that hitting it with all my might could. What was that? Barkle raises his eyebrows when his subordinate overhears him. Almost simultaneously, the knight guarding the entrance shouted. Enemy attack! The moment she saw it, Frau was impressed. It was a huge dragon. The one the Holy Order had just defeated was also huge, but this one was even larger than that. Old scars covered all its body. Definitely, the result of having fought hundreds of battles, and the experience that came with them. Its body is covered with golden, hard scales. It is not a dull yellow, like other dragon kings. It is the golden color befitting of a king, polished and shining through the passage of hundreds of years, inappropriate to the name of a real dragon king. The golden color is surrounded by muscles that are toned to the bone. The muscles of the whole body, trained with a sense of purpose, as befits a wild beast. Its muscles are so awe-inspiring to behold that it is understandable to be told that that huge body is supporting its own weight, even without gravity magic. What oozes from its entire body is divine dignity. If the previous dragon king, they had fought, was a bouncer in a bar, the one in front of them now is a bloodthirsty swordsman, who is famous throughout the continent. And above all, its eyes are different. They are not the fierce ones of a beast but rather ones that show a prominent intelligence. One glance at the dragon made a name come naturally to everyone's mind. Kajakt, the Emperor Dragon King. Frau was moved, as she was watching such a legendary creature with her eyes. Probably, that was the same reaction everyone had. It was for at least five seconds, that nobody moved. It was like time had been stopped. It was in those five seconds that at least ten people, those that were the nearest to the door, lost their lives. Eh? It was a totally one-sided slaughter, against an enemy that was unprepared. It took one more second for the Holy Knights to finally realize what was happening around them. In the face of such overwhelming and unstoppable power, these men, who had always solved things with their own might, couldn't think of taking such a fight. They were just afraid and panicked. And then, the screams flooded the cave. It was as pandemonium had been unleashed. After all, people were dying in a mere blink of an eye. And thus, Shayna moves. She grabs the magician by her neck, grabs her own sword, and runs into the depths of the cave. Barkle clicks his tongue. First, before going after Shayna, he hurriedly gives instructions to the Holy Order. Form a phalanx, defensive formations, holy artificers, to your positions, put up defensive walls. At that time, Cheeky retrieves her knife and follows the woman's trail. Reload Frau puts magic into her left and right hands. For some reason, her eyes meet those of Barkle, who turns to look at her. Fire, Merkel. A fireball flies from her right hand, exactly towards where she was looking. As the bullet hits the ceiling, explosions start shaking the cave, while the soil starts to get covered in falling debris, from the now cracked top of the cave. Fire Marochi without missing a beat, a mass of compressed water flies from Frau's left hand towards that same point, and it also hits. Water permeates the cracks. In an instant, the hard bedrock becomes a brittle mass of earth. And then, it collapses. When this happens, any light entering is lost, and everything becomes filled by darkness. The last thing that could be heard was only the pitiful, decimated dying screams of the holy knights. Once they could see again, the magician saw a total of four people. Herself, Cheeky. Shayna. And, Barkle. Who was having a sword pointed at him, as the situation from before has been completely reversed. To abandon your troops being such a quick decision, 
as expected of you, Barkle well, if I followed y'all, I can still survive, even if it's still a tough situation and instant decision. Barkle saw Shayna fleeing deeper into the cave, wait up whether to unite his confused subordinates, fight the Emperor Dragon King, and try his luck winning, or to prepare himself for this situation, where after following her, Shayna would put a sword to his head, and chose the latter without hesitation. He had to choose between the men who danced on his hands, or Shayna, who had burned them. For him, it was an easy choice to make, as he always objectively judged the success his actions could weigh him, and always put himself and his safety before anything else. Oi, Shayna. Emma Killen Cheeky tells the woman knight, holding one of the only three knives she was able to recover in an underhand grip. That sounds good Shayna nodded as a matter of course. Frau has no reason to object either. From the outset, Barkle is a hated enemy who has killed her friends, and, pragmatically, it is not good for the girl to leave alive the only person that knows she hired someone to take care of the rising sun. If she was later blackmailed with that information, that would be troublesome. It's three against one. No matter how wounded the three of them are, and no matter how strong that shining armor the Holy Order takes pride in, Barkle should be quite outnumbered, if you include the casting girl against him. However, he fearlessly smiles and doesn't even seem like he's gonna unsheathe his sword. And then, his eyes met Frau's. The lieutenant I left at the inn, he'll probably tell the Magic Guild, once I'm a goner what are you saying? Shayna is confused by the sudden and unintelligible words. Frau stiffens and thinks for a little while. She is not stupid enough to lose sight of her initial purpose, and she does not have a personal grudge against Barkle as the woman knight does. It is possible that Barkle is bluffing, but there is no way of knowing for sure. He is the type of man who, if he makes any deal, keeps an insurance policy. The type of man to agree to a clause not to benefit himself, but to put his opponents at a disadvantage. Hence, the decision was easy. Clouds John, does this man have something on you? Shayna calmly asked her, who had slowly moved to Barkle's side. Yes, I see, there's nothing you can do. Then, as the magician gave a small nod, Shayna easily agreed and sheathed her sword. Oi, Shayna, is it really all right? It is. As much as I want him dead, I don't want Clouds Chan to become my enemy, and also he's a coward, so he can't really kill me in a situation like this. He's a coward, so he can't kill her right now. Frau couldn't really make any sense of those words, but since the knight was snickering, and Cheeky put her knife away, with a motion that said if that's how it is, then there had to be some sense to it. In the end, the teenage girl thought it was good they didn't have to end up killing each other. She didn't have the strength to run around anymore, nor the mana, nor the will. Even if she could have defeated Shayna and Cheeky, dying such a dog's death in this cave, she would feel really bad about it. Well, it seems we've reached a truce. My, my, once again I've taken another step back Barkle shrugged his shoulders and turned his steps towards the back of the cave. He can still hear faint vibrations and screams from behind the rubble behind him, but he does not look back. Barkle is that kind of man. An egoist by nature and by choice. He is willing to bring others down or to help them, as long as it's for his own good. He is a common type of merchant. He is trustworthy as a boss, subordinate, or customer, but not the type you want to be friends with. But honestly, the Emperor Dragon King is really out of this world, huh? Nothing Y can really do about that Barkle leads the way, talking to no one in particular. Shayna doesn't like him, and Cheeky doesn't want to waste time with him, so Frau has no choice but to deal with him. But, why did it come here? Even if it's another's dragon's nest well, this cave was originally the Emperor Dragon King's nest originally? Dragon King's only nest during the egg-laying season. The female protects the eggs in the nest and the male brings food to the female. The Emperor is a male, you see? Ah, so that's how it is this cave is the nursery for the future Emperor Dragon King, that is the Dragon Prince or Princess. The female instinctively attacked Shayna and her friends to protect their eggs and was exterminated by the Holy Knights. The King of the Dragon Kings was furious after his beloved wife was cruelly killed. I just had a glance at it, yet I know. Half-assed magic won't work. It takes way more than one or two hundred to kill the King of Dragons. 
a well-trained group of a thousand, after attacking all day and night, might be barely able to pull it off, I thought it would be bad if they got there before us, so I crushed the guys from the magic guild, but it was a mistake Shayna laughed at the guys' regrets. Not only the magic guild but the blue leopard division and the royal knights as well, didn't you? Come to think of it, I haven't seen a hot muscle-bound man in town for the past two weeks thinking back, there were some phoenix's nest guys at the bar, but they hadn't been seen except on the first day either. Frau didn't care, but it was possible that Barkle had assassinated them in the mountains just for his own benefit. Shayna, you bastard, don't blame me for everything it's hard to believe it doesn't have to do with you Barkle raises his voice, but Shayna makes no apologies I admit I tried to go after both sides during the day when they both were worn out but the conflict between the mercenaries and the knights had nothing to do with me. About the guys from the phoenix's nest, I don't even know if they're alive or not, nah. they could have unexpectedly been killed by the dragon kings on the first day, you know I don't know about that, Shayna does not trust Barkle, at all. It must be from experience, Frau decides. She doesn't know much about the rumors of the death god knight, but she can see that they are not on good terms with each other. In the course of their many confrontations, the woman has learned the folly of trusting that wicked man. TCH there was no way he was hurt, but still, Barkle shut his mouth in a moody way. And then, everyone was silent for a while. As they silently proceeded deeper, led by Barkle with his lantern, the smell of the dragon gradually became more and more noticeable to the nose. The deeper they went, the stronger the stench that made them turn back home was, and the ambient temperature rose along with it. The hatchery is getting closer. Although the Dragon King Mountain is not a volcano, it must be accumulating heat in some way, in order to keep the eggs at the optimum temperature. Frau wipes the sweat from her forehead. It is not because it is hot. It is due to her physical weakness and nervousness. Wait, someone's there by saying that, Cheeky made everyone stay still. Frau silently activated her illumination magic and increased the amount of light. What emerged was some debris. A slimy mucous membrane of a color that could neither be described as yellow nor green and a shattered, mottled shell of white and yellow. An egg, that's what it was. There was nothing left but that debris. Everything was completely destroyed, and a fishy smell filled the surroundings. The hatchery is warm. The fact that the eggs, which would have rotted in a day or two, are still at such a foul-smelling level proves that they have only just been broken. To the other side of the light, the shade of a person faintly appears. The magician can't see well at night, and she barely glanced, but it looked like it was somehow blue, it's the enemy. Before she could get a good look, Cheeky shouted. Two knives were thrown at the same time. One straight ahead, the second from the darkness by centrifugal force. The knives made to kill people, are shot at people, with the skill to kill people. The knife pierced the human body without a sound, easily taking its life, or at least, it should have. However, a pleasant sound was that which reverbed. With one movement, the man grabbed the first knife, with another, the second, and then took another step and cut the transparent thread tied to the knife. He easily outwitted two patterns of attack that would have been difficult to discern in the dark or even in the daylight with no obstacles in the way. With a clink, the sound of the knife falling and the blade being returned to its sheath coincided. That's a hell of a greeting. I like little kids, so I usually let them off the hook. Chiquita. Are you different? While the other three are stunned, a man in a blue leopard print easily emerges from the darkness a sword in a white scabbard with no decoration whatsoever. The man appears with a wry smile on his face, tapping it on the ground with a steady tap like a blind man's cane. A man in a blue leopard print. Blue Panther, commander of the Blue Leopard Division. A blind sword, ha. Huh. It's the first time I see one in Shana said, with an admiring voice. The blind sword is a well-known sword art. Originally used by blind swordsmen, it is the art of reading sound, air, and signs. It is one of the sword arts considered extremely difficult. However, once mastered, it is a masterful technique that can easily intercept an attack from behind, even on a moonless night. TCH, if it ain't the most dangerous guy in the Prime Leopard's company? Barkal frowns. 
Blue Panther is closing the distance quickly. Shayna silently steps forward to protect Cheeky. The man stops one step in front of the woman knight, the edges of his mouth twitching eerily. Chiquita, are these, your comrades? Does it even matter to you? Even if I look like this, I don't want to kill anyone more than the ones I'm supposed to. Hey, hey. Even if I'm the one telling it, it's not a funny joke. Ehe. If you're not her comrades, let's go for a duel to kill each other, Chiquita. I'm ashamed to say that I've lost all my men too, and I need a few more to get out of here, so, the Blue Panther laughs wryly and lowers his hips even lower. Cheeky retreats with a bitter look on her face. The magician girl doesn't understand what's going on. Cheeky chan, what's going on here? Shayna, who is between the ones expecting a duel and behind Frau, lays her hand on her sword's hilt, and while carelessly looking at the man, finally asks the thief. Cheeky grips the last remaining knife and opens her mouth with her usual expression. My job, this time, is to kill the top people from the Prime Leopard mercenary group, she says as it's no big deal. I've already killed Red and Black. Blue was hired by the Casper Kingdom, to destroy the Emperor Dragon Kingdom, working from the shadows, or so I heard see. Did you hear that, Shayna? The Royal Knights have been against the Blue Leopard all along not reading the tense atmosphere, Barkle shrugs and says foolishly. He is not one of the Assassin's comrades, nor does he have any reason to kill Blue Panther. He is no more than a stranger. He then puts his hand on his chin and asks the other man in a curious tone. The Kingdom of Casper is a country that's about to set up a relationship with this kingdom. I see, the Blue Leopard Division aims to use the dragon slaying as a cover to destroy the Royal Knights in the mountains, by the way, was it you that destroyed this egg? Blue Panther was overjoyed to recognize Barkle's appearance. Well, 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 look closely and you'll find out that it's Barkle son of the Holy Order, a famously filthy and clever little rat. That other one is the Death God Knight. That's a very strange combination, isn't it? You guys actually hang out together? That only makes the truth of the rumors all the more interesting bastard, why do you destroy the eggs? It couldn't be you're trying to make Dragon King's fried egg, could you? Barkle does not take advantage of the mercenary's leader's lightheartedness and repeats the question in an indifferent manner. Blue Panther does not conceal his actions, either. What did I do? That's a bit of a long story as mission was already done. A long time ago, there was a time when a rumor said that if you ate the eggs of the Emperor Dragon King, you would become immortal. And that became a really huge rumor. But there was a king who believed in that superstition. He led a large army into the Dragon King Mountains, uprooted the eggs, and ate them. Well, it's a superstition, so there's no way he could become immortal. When the king ate one bite and it didn't work, he got angry, crushed the egg, and threw it into the mountain Shayna and Cheeky made quizzical faces. They had probably never heard of such a story. But Frau knew. It was called old literature, and she had read about it. And its consequences. The Emperor Dragon King is a wild beast, and if its eggs had been stolen and eaten, it would have simply given up, as nature dictates. However, that wasn't the case, since those eggs have been thrown right in front of it. So it brought all the dragon kings in the mountain and marched towards that kingdom. And then, they went on a rampage, for three long days, and nights. Raging gravitational magic, breaths that burn the earth. Overwhelming violence to the point of changing the terrain. The result was that wilderness the eastern wilderness. A vast deadland where nothing remains. The grass does not grow on that land because the effects of its overwhelming magic power have not yet disappeared. Many people do not know it. Even seasoned travelers lose their lives there because its magical power severely reduces their physical strength. What I'm trying to do is recreate that. But I messed up a bit and that Emperor Dragon King caught me breaking the egg. In their haste to escape, he probably killed all my men, and I hid here and escaped but it's a wonder that I'm still alive. After finishing his story, the man lets out a drawn-out, eerie laugh that echoes in their crampiness. Now, let's get back to the point, shall we? He laughs just one more second and then turns his gaze onto the little girl while showing a serious expression. For my part, 
I thought both the Black Panther and the Red Panther were disgusting, so I had no intention of retaliating, and I have no energy to waste in this situation, however, Chiquita, the assassin, is famous for both being very skilled, and someone who can't be reasoned with or talked with. Even if I didn't want to fight, if she would attack me regardless, what other choice can I have? Shayna looks back at Chiki. She nodded her head in agreement, but the woman grabbed her head carelessly. The flesh of her cheeks puckered and distorted. She then forcefully moves the younger girl's head sideways. Oi, Shayna. Don't get in the middle of my work now. At least, not now. The Emperor Dragon King is coming here soon Chiki reacts with surprise on her face. You guys, it couldn't be that Kajakt is following you here, right? Blue Panther's face turns blue as he says that. They couldn't forget. The entrance was crushed by the collapse, but it was the Emperor Dragon King who dug the hole in the first place, the Holy Knights who were outside, had already been annihilated and the dragon who so relentlessly annihilated the humans in the wilderness would never leave the pests who escaped that deep into the nest. Gah at that time, such a sound could be heard, as something was destroyed, from a distance. Soon, it would be here. TCH, it has become a rather troublesome situation, how Blue Panther removed his fingers from the sword hilt and straightened his back. So you've brought back a troublesome opponent after hiding all this time? It's what you deserve Cheeky put her knife back into one of her pockets, with a bored expression. It was the signal of a temporary truce. Oi, Blue Panther, ain't there some exit or something? Barkle asks as he peers into the darkness behind the man. Well, if there was, I wouldn't be wandering in a place like this the assassin leaves the talking men alone and goes to retrieve the knife that was knocked down. Shayna is also making a troubled face. Frau looked at them as if it was their problem, but not hers. The mercenary leader thought for a few seconds, but when he realized the presence of the sorcerer, he made one suggestion. There is no way out, but there are several narrow side streets. Unfortunately, all of them are dead ends, but it would be nice if we could hide in one of them, get past it, and have the magician there collapse the ceiling and bury it alive, but if we collapse it too much and bury the rest of us, we'll be no better off. How about we just let the rocks fall to buy some time and escape while we're at it? He states his strategy as smoothly as if he had been thinking about it for some time. A highly ranked member of a huge organization must be very quick-witted. Frau did not miss the suspicious glint in Barkle's eyes. This man, he's up to something again or that's, at least, what they thought, even if it was only a bit. Preparation was not necessary. There was no time. The uneasy, zinging footsteps could be heard very close by. Let's just go with this one. This side road is hard to find and we can all get in. They all hide in a slightly deeper side street. The path is narrow enough for people to pass each other. They would hide there, and the moment their unbeatable foe reached the hatchery, Frau would use her magic to make the ceiling collapse, while they'd dash towards the entrance. If they entered the forest and took advantage of the darkness to scatter and escape, some of them may survive. What it's really important, it's the timing, you know. Blue Panther speaks to Frau in a whisper. The Blue Panther and Frau take up a position near the entrance, timing themselves. Behind them, Shayna, Barkle, and Cheeky line up in turn. The footsteps gradually get closer. The magician's mind is filled with anxiety. What if, the Emperor Dragon King finds me, what if I can't make the ceiling collapse with magic, what if I can't escape? Her hands and feet begin to tremble. She looks behind, as a sort of cry for help, and then, her eyes meet Shayna's. To her surprise, she receives a warm smile and a whisper, encouraging the young girl, saying that she was fine. Shayna was relaxed. Was this the difference with someone who has been near death many times? The moment she nodded back and looked forward, Barkle had a nasty smile on his face. Step, 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 step. Gasp. The Emperor Dragon King was visible. Its golden scales were luminous even in the darkness, and it looked as if the skin itself was glowing, but it was because of the magical power oozing from its entire body. The sound of a heart could be heard. It's pounding, so fast that it would make everyone who heard it dizzy. Whose heart could it be? 
It was no other than Fraus. Could the dragon hear the sound? Would they be discovered because of it? One of the forelimbs can suddenly be seen, entirely. It has something stuck between its toenails. She almost screamed, only managing to stop by putting her hand in front of her mouth. A person's head was caught in a look of anguish, a look of utter despair. Things happened in the next moment. What happened, she would not have known what really transpired at the time, but somehow she could clearly remember who acted, what they looked like, and what their intentions were. Aurea. Die, Shayna. A sudden cry was heard. Frau shuddered and turned around. She was pushed away and Blue Panther came tumbling out. Why? Because Barkle kicked him out. More precisely, because the knight tried to kick Shayna out in front of their draconic enemy, but the woman avoided it just in time. However, that was not the case for the mercenary leader, who was in the same direction the kick went, and who was kicked away. He had been concentrating on the dragon in front of him and was utterly unlucky. He had felt the bloodlust, but had no way of avoiding such an attack that was not directed at him and ended up hitting him like a stray bullet. Gua! The royal knight is groaning in pain. A sword had pierced his thigh. Shayna's sword. She had been alert, for she knew that, at that precise timing, when she was in front of the king of dragons, the man would carry out his plan. Cheeky Chan. Follow me. The next moment, Shayna grabbed Frau by the collar and ran. The cave was small. The hatchery is reasonably large, but in this place, a passageway, there is no space for a dragon to look back. Shayna manages to slip by the Emperor Dragon King. The magician looks back as the assassin is throwing the last of her knives, right as she follows the woman knight. The target is not the giant dragon, but a stunned blue panther who finds himself in front of the cave's master. The mercenary quickly turned himself around, but the knife pierced into the area of his calf, and he cries out in pain. Cheeky is resolute. Even if he managed to keep rolling, he wouldn't be getting up again. Shayna runs at her full speed. In an instant, she leaves Barkle, Blue Panther, and finally, the Emperor Dragon King, behind. We did it! And Frau rejoiced. In front of the Dragon King, two people are left to die. As long as that monster faced them and gave their backs to the girls, they could escape. Both the mercenary and the knight have injured legs, but they will buy some time. While that happened, the others were already outside of the cave. Ah, we managed to survive, and the moment that thought entered their minds, ha! Huh? The Emperor Dragon King turned around as it scraped its way through the narrow cave. The distance was already there. Neither the breath attacks nor the gravity magic could reach them. Yet Frau was frightened. She shivered. The monster intends to kill everyone present here. It decided that the priority for this should be those who slipped by its side and are heading for the exit, rather than the ones in front of it, who can't move because of their injured legs. It was not a mere beast. They had come this far and yet, they had underestimated it. It hadn't fallen for the bait in front of it. It hadn't gotten its priorities wrong. It was a fierce beast, yet doted with intelligence. Shayna. Run. Clouds. The ceiling. Cheeky shouts as she overtakes Shayna. Frau gasps and concentrates her magic in both hands. Flame shot Merkel. Three flaming bullets were shot out, although their power wanes somewhat due to the high speed chanting. They land on the ceiling as a roar can be heard. The magic power in the left hand is released in succession. Bubble shot Morochi. Spears of water are launched. In an instant, they penetrated the hard bedrock, loosening its tight bonds. And then, the girl releases one more shot, for good measure. Flame kick Parazzi. Five flaming bullets were sent flying from her feet. A serious hit dealt the final blow to the ceiling, which was already beginning to crumble. Collapse. This time, she didn't hold anything back. The cave crumbled, due to the effects of that powerful magic that had the intention of burying a live blue panther, Barkle, and the Emperor Dragon King. Not yet. She still underestimated the King of Dragons, that had looked up at the ceiling for a moment, 
just for a moment, with its golden eyes. The ceiling, which had begun to collapse like a scattering back, was pushed upwards. Gravitational magic. The brittle bedrock is squeezed dry like a rag, hardened like clay, and put back into the ceiling. She couldn't even stop the dragon in its track. And it wasn't even her fault, due to her ineptitude. The problem had just been that the Emperor Dragon King was too strong. Who in the world would have thought that such a monster could be defeated? It was ridiculous. This is a different creature from the Dragon Kings. It is a unique creature in the world that goes by the name of Kajakt. Ice Golden Eyes are locked into Frau, who upon seeing them, can't help but cower. He. A pitiful voice escaped her throat. It must have heard it. Shana and Chiki look back. The Emperor Dragon King is right about here. It will catch up with us. It will catch up with us. Once it catches up with us, are we going to die? Those were the girl's thoughts. We're getting out of here. One moment there was an unpleasant sound of chittering and a nauseating smell, and the next the heavens opened up. At some point, the rain had stopped. The sky was full of stars. The surroundings were dazzlingly bright with moonlight. At the cave's entrance, where the silvery wreckage remains, the Emperor Dragon King flies into the sky. Powerful gravity magic can even lift such a huge body like it's into the air. The landing was light. It was a movement as familiar to the body as the corpse eater they had seen two weeks ago. Right in front of them. Frau and the others, with their backs to the cave entrance, had been caught up with by the King of Dragons. It raises its forelimbs. Cheeky Chan. Clouds Chan. Run away. Shayna pushes the assassin away and throws the magician towards a nearby bush. When the bud called human opens, a red flower blooms. Just as the forelimbs are about to swing down on Shayna, a well-communicated voice is heard. Ah, thank God. You were not finished quite yet the Emperor Dragon King had stopped moving, for something that could not be ignored had appeared in front of it. What ash? Frau looks on. For some reason, she could not take her eyes off the figure. The person who came at the worst possible time, who was supposed to be nothing more than a tiny, pitiful sacrifice, emitted a strong presence. With a voice full of himself, the figure raised his voice. My name is Alexander Ryback, and I am here to hereby declare a duel onto the Emperor Dragon King. Kajakt Al announced himself with a shuddering dignity and pointed the tip of his sword towards the Emperor Dragon King. Chapter 8 One on One Duel The Emperor Dragon King slowly turned towards Al. A low, shrill voice rang out from its mouth. A small man who kills his own still immobile child who has to kill his own wife due to fate, who leaves his own people to die so that he can save his own life, is fighting against me in single combat. Shayna looks surprised. She is wondering how has the King of Dragons spoken to them. One speech is but a wave of sound. One who has lived as long as the Emperor Dragon King can use gravity magic to be able to communicate with humans, at least to some level. It is said the creature in the hero's face is even able of communicating emotions this way. Don't be presumptuous. You humans don't even need to have the minimum of courtesy. No manners, no etiquette. I will kill you all, even babies and pregnant women. It looks down at the tiny boy in front of it, enraged. Al just quietly lifts his sword. Then, so be it. Only my name will remain in future generations as the swordsman who slew the mad, rampaging dragon the boy's theatrical tone, which Frau had never heard before, sent a shiver down her spine. The tip of the sword turns to the king of dragons. Angry dragon, for whatever reason, my sword will not draw a strange presence rose from Al's body, and the emperor dragon king closed its mouth. Sword in my right hand the sword in his right hand is lifted and the tip points towards the heavens. Sword in my left hand the left hand holds the hilt. Take with both arms, and bring about the loss of all life and a unique death two-handed. He holds a long sword with a high stance. Incurable wounds of the North God style, Alex Ryback, forward the king among the dragons, who bears the name of king, is immobilized by the tiny human. 
it is convinced that, were it to move right now, it would be decapitated with a single blow. The human right before its eyes was different from the other individuals. It was clearly an exceptional existence. The Emperor Dragon King had experienced this sensation once before. Ryback? It was a name that sounded familiar. Shayna can only gaze. She had seen through Al's sword skills, but she had never imagined that he could intimidate even the Emperor Dragon King. In his school. A sense of deja vu when she saw him move his scabbard once. That was as it should be. The North God style is the one that Shayna practices and that technique is its secret technique, the fastest bat 2 technique, where the sword is drawn with the right, the sheath is moved with the left, and the sword is delivered without cutting back. The twenty-fold draw. Furthermore, the crowning noun before mentioning the North God style. Incurable wounds. The North God school, as the name suggests, is said to have been left behind by North God Kalman. There is already no main school, and the way of life and its unique way of fighting, rather than swordsmanship, is the main focus of the school. Many of the techniques used by Shayna were not developed by the first North God but were created by later generations of swordsmen according to his philosophy. However, the incurable wounds of the North God style is of a different nature. It is a hidden art that is said to have been directly handed down by North God Kalman to a certain demon king. According to the heroic tale of the North God, it is the swordsmanship that defeated the immortal demon king, and according to another legend, it is the swordsmanship that the immortal demon king received from the North God. Because it was handled by the immortal demon king, it is also known as the immortal king sword. It is a sword art that symbolizes the contradictions in the lore of the North God. No one has ever seen it, but it is known only by name, a phantom sword style. According to those tales, this art is said to have been created by its founder solely for the purpose of defeating that immortal demon king. According to another legend, the demon imitated the swordsmanship used by the North God. Either way, if the North God style that everyone practices nowadays is an imitation of North God's way of life, then the immortal demon king style is an imitation of his techniques. It is a sword art that is not only a mystery but whose very existence is in doubt. No one has ever seen it for what it really is, but word of it remains in most tales. It is said, every wound inflicted by that blade is incurable the meaning is that it is a one-hit kill. The immortal North God style is a merciless sword style that wipes out life with a single blow. Now that Kalman is no longer around, there is only one person who can use this style, the immortal demon king, who is said to have been taught by North God. That demon is very rarely heard of. The conclusion to be drawn from this. Alex Ryback is a demon king. That's absurd. It's impossible. The immortal demon King Atof is a woman. No matter how little Shayna knows about demons, she would never mistake a man for a woman. But even if it is impossible, if he is a demon king, then he could overthrow the Emperor Dragon King. No, however, the opponent is a minion of the demon god who nearly destroyed the central continent long ago, and not only that, but because it was the strongest warrior, it's a creature that received a whole mountain as a reward after the war. A dragon. Moreover, among dragons, the dragon kings are renowned for their individually being the strongest race. Furthermore, it is the king amongst dragon kings. The emperor dragon king, Kajakt. Its strength is equal to that of hundreds of demon kings. No one knows whether it is inferior or superior. It is impossible to know. Kajakt opens its mouth cautiously. It had thought of something. I see that you are of the blood of the immortal demon king Atof, aren't you? Al replies. Indeed, I am the only child of the immortal demon king Atof, son of North God Ryback. A gasp can be heard from the crowd of only three people. So that's why, I knew it. The Emperor Dragon King was convinced. It had heard rumors that the immortal demon king, its comrade-in-arms with whom it had fought side by side hundreds of years ago, had been defeated decades ago. The one who defeated him was a man of the human race called North God. Kajak knew that rumor was just that, a rumor, that the immortal demon king was alive and well, and that his magical power had not diminished a single bit. They have been allies for quite a long time, after all. 
when Kajak heard that the immortal demon King Atof had started learning swordsmanship, it tilted its head, in doubt. And when the rumor that the demon had given birth to a child shortly afterward, it was astonished. The beautiful demon king, who had been a tomboy, who had said that she would not allow anyone weaker than herself into her body or her heart, and who had echoed a raucous laugh, had declared that because she was a demon king, she was a prize and that only a demon god could take her as a partner. The king of dragons was curious to find out which demon king had broken Atof's heart, but his existence was shrouded in a haze. He could not even vaguely make out the existence. More than a decade later, there was a man who challenged the dragon king Kajak to single combat. His name was Kalman Ryback, North God. The duel with him is still fresh in the dragon's memories. He was the most powerful enemy since the demon tribe hero Lan Xiao. He was swift and had an overwhelming offensive power that was unmistakably human. If that North God had not shown even a moment's hesitation in this life or death duel, the Emperor Dragon King would not have lived. On the verge of death, the first North God left an excusing note to the bard he had brought alongside him, the face of my son flickered in my mind. Later, the immortal demon King Atof sent him words of resentment. Kajak did not understand why the words were sent at the time. He did not think deeply about the relationship between Ryback and Atof. But now he was sure. Sorry to have kept you waiting. I have changed my mind and will deal with you with all my might he is their son. The one who had broken a toaf was a human swordsman with an ordinary, weak-looking face who could cut a large tree in two. What Kajak sees before its eyes is someone in the middle of being both a warrior and a powerful enemy, an invincible swordsman who combines the swordsmanship of the North God Kalman and the immortality of the immortal demon King Atof. Alex Ryback, also known as Al, aims to be a hero. It is not that he is envious of heroes per se. He was told repeatedly by his mother about the heroic tales of the North God heroes, and it is true that he envied the existence of heroes. The hero Al knows is North God, who is his father, and has already died. He still thinks it is the duty of a son to respect his father. It is said his father was a strong man, the only person to have ever given his mother a mortal wound. Al's mother is alive because his father missed her. After all, it is said that the North God was a kind and just man. No matter how much evil someone had done in the past, or how evil people thought they were, if they showed even a shred of justice in a person's actions, Kalman would never kill them. There are a number of anecdotes passed down in heroic tales, and they are all true. However, every chapter differs only in one final point. He did not kill by striking everything down. North God never took their lives if they reformed. Therefore, he is often spoken of as a horror story, but those who are still alive say that he is the hero. The Rock King, the Immortal Demon King, the former Pope of Millis, they all say that North God is a hero. But he has failed in becoming a hero. Ryback didn't become a hero because he didn't defeat anyone and because he lost to the Emperor Dragon King in the very end. So the world laughs at the heroic tale of North God. That is unacceptable to Al. His father was rightly a hero. He traveled the world alone and wielded his sword for the justice he believed in. And the young Alex couldn't allow his hero to be laughed at, even if his mother laughed at that. North God laughed that he did not fight for anyone's recognition. But Al knows. He knows that it was for his son's sake that he tried to defeat Kajakt. Al is half demon and half human and was born with the characteristics of his mother, a demon. For this reason, his father tried to give him the added value of being the son of a human hero so that he would not be persecuted by the human race. But his father was defeated. Al did not become the son of a hero. After he grew up, he was not persecuted by either the human or the demon tribe thanks to the fact that he resembled humans a lot. His mother laughed at his good fortune, but Al could not laugh. He felt that his father's death had been in vain. In all those decades, Al had only been in touch with his father for a few years. The lifespan of the demon race is long, while humans is short. Al may only live somewhere in between, but he would still be older than his father at some point. The time with his father remains strong in Al's mind. When in contact with his child, that father was not North God Kalman Ryback, 
but a childlike father. And while he had taught him how to live as a person, Al learned all his swordsmanship from his mother. The father he knew did not show the bravery that his mother and the rest of them talked about. What did such a father aim for in his travels around the world, fighting and defeating numerous powerful enemies, but without losing his life? Al could sort of understand that, but couldn't quite put it into words. It was something along the lines of his father not wanting to be a hero, but that exactly makes him the one who deserves to be called a true hero, both in spirit and in body. That's why the current heroic tales of the North God were unforgivable for his son. He couldn't forgive that his father's death was in vain, for example. The end of the thought that he arrived at, driven by these two thoughts, was the two words hero. Alex Ryback's aim is to become a hero. To live like his father and to leave proof that the hero North God Kalman Ryback did indeed exist in this world. He will call himself North God and become a hero. With that, the heroic tales of the North God will be reborn and prove that his father's death was not in vain. To do this, he must first start by defeating Kajakt, the strongest dragon king that his father failed to defeat, making the final chapter of the heroic tales authentic and calling himself the North God. That is why Al wants to be a hero. The battle had begun. Dragon and man, both glaring at each other, neither moving. Al held his head high and Kajakt held its head low like a cat. An uninformed passerby would have tilted his head and wondered what they were doing. Originally, in a one-on-one -on -one battle between a dragon and a human, the dragon has overwhelming firepower, while the human evades it and makes a series of small attacks. A single blow from a human cannot inflict a fatal wound on a dragon. A dragon's blow cannot be defended against by humans. For these simple and obvious reasons, dragons attack and humans dodge. But currently, such theories don't work as if they were true. Cheeky and Shayna finally understood the meaning of what Al had once said, that they hadn't enough offensive power. Al Slash is the immortal North God style, that one of the Demon King Slayer, capable of killing a Dragon King with a single blow. It is true that if he did not have that much offensive power, he would not be able to defeat the Emperor Dragon King. Furthermore, Al's body has the advantages of mortal demon race, and even though he is facing a dragon, he cannot be killed easily. In order to defeat the man, who has immortality, the king of dragons must obliterate his body completely with a single, wide blow. But even for such a powerful dragon, there are few techniques that have the offensive power to evaporate someone like Al. Having said all of that, those are the reasons this fight can be considered equal. Kajakt is a dragon that can see itself objectively. The Emperor Dragon King has an overwhelming advantage in terms of weight and magical power but whether it fails to strike with its full strength, it will easily lose its life. It couldn't attack carelessly, as the battle with the original North God, still fresh, comes to Kajak's mind. That horrifying slash. The King of Dragons, who had once tasted it firsthand, did not dare to take the initiative lightly. But from Al's point of view, it should be the same. Being the King of Dragons, Kajak's hard skin would not be so easy to go through. He needed not to be overconfident. It was hard to think that boy, whose swordsmanship is inferior, will be able to easily defeat Dragon that his father couldn't kill. Both sides aim for a one-hit kill. And so, they both look for the perfect timing to begin. Al is sizzling in between by a few centimeters. That made it Emperor Dragon King's chance. But Kajak cannot make a move. In its mind is the confrontation with North God. The pain of having a careless first strike returned with a vicious counter. Only once since Kajakt was born did it ever wish to have a fight again. It thinks about it on the basis of this valuable experience. North gods are different creatures from humans. Those who have a technique that would kill such a dragon are not human. If they are not human, then it would be best to discard the kind of planning done when fighting humans. It is best to think of it as fighting a demon king with destructive magical powers, that's what Kajak thought. In these kinds of encounters, the first one to move is the one that loses that was the next thought in the king of dragons' mind. First, my hand, I'll let it run once it was Al's chance, he started setting it up. A tremendous killing rush. Kajak was completely surprised. A divine step, 
How fast can a human being move? The momentum of the lower body transfers to the upper body, travels down the shoulder to the arm, from the arm to the sword, and the tip of the sword disappears. The dragon could not see where the tip of the sword had gone. It just couldn't move. The fear of a hole appearing in its defense filled its usually prodigious mind, and that left its body without response. And yet, Kajakt was alive. A moment later, the King of Dragons found itself surprised to find that its head was still attached. Had it defended itself unconsciously? It would be ridiculous to think so. Faint. That's right, it had been but a faint. It had been as Kajakt had thought, for the boy was not incautious enough to launch an all-out attack so carelessly in a fight where the first one to move loses. And as it realized, a small irritation arose in its mind, as it hadn't read the feint itself. It was so bad, that it couldn't even defend itself by concentrating its gravity magic. If that had not been a feint, but a full-throated blow aimed at the Emperor Dragon King's neck, this duel would have already been done. Kajakt gazes at Al's eye. They are eyes that show no hesitation. Reminiscent of the hero Lan Xiao, they are the eyes of a man who simply looks calmly at the battle situation and makes a ruthless move. An opponent with such brilliant feinting skills, he probably realized that his opponent had failed to react. Nevertheless, there's nothing to be proud of. If you faint and the opponent does not move as a result, it is the same as if the feint failed. He had no regrets, for his face showed he had expected his feint to be a failure from the very beginning. Kajak shuddered at his courage. Al keeps stepping forward. He had been prepared for this, after constantly talking to himself about this day coming. He had been confident, even with a lack of evidence, that his sword was absolutely the strongest and that he would be strong enough to defeat the Emperor Dragon King. But behold him, laid the huge body of his enemy, Kajak. Its muscles are so enlarged that it cannot even be regarded as a beast. The overflowing magical power that seems to be able to blow away an entire mountain. The seamless stance of King of Dragons. And yet, Al was prepared to finish it off with a single blow. He thought that were he to engage in one-on-one -on -one combat, the Emperor Dragon King would swing its legs with the same slow movements as other Dragon Kings, build up a flaming breath, and subdue him with force. He thought that if his own body, with its immortality, was prepared to phase in, he would be able to withstand it and strike a one-hit kill counter. That's how you win, it's easy, he said. It can only be called naive. Even if called groundless confidence, the boy was caught in the grip of such a naive rationale. That is why when Al saw the Kajak still not moving first, and when then, it was still not moving when he entered the motion of attack, he stopped his attack. There is no feint in the Immortal North God style since it is a sword handled by the Immortal Demon King. Feinting is a technique used to break down an opponent's defense. The Immortal North God is a sword style that slashes through the enemy, whether they're guarding or not. The only weakness is that it is vulnerable to counters, but Al has the unlimited defense and durability of an Immortal Demon King. No matter what he does, be it that he is countered or not, he does not have to think about what his opponent is going to do. He can counterattack and win even if he is countered. Or maybe, in his father's North God style, which Al did not know, the art of fainting may have existed at an advanced level. But for the immortal demon King Atof, this was unnecessary. With her defense and durability that defied counters, she only needed to extract the purely offensive part of her power. Hence, in the Immortal North God style handled by her son, there is no such technique as fainting. Oddly enough, it was a mere coincidence that the earlier movement turned out to be a feint. That coincidence defines the course of the duel. King Dragon King Kajakt has the attacking power to kill the Immortal Demon King Atof with a single blow. That is why he feared a counter. If his opponent made full use of feints, it felt that it could not move on its own, even more so. It is the discernment between feints and actual attacks that makes the difference. Kajakt concentrated its magical power in front of him for defense. It went on a defensive stance. Hey, hey, come on now, really, that guy, he sure's doing some crazy stuff right there, ain't he? At the entrance of the cave, Barkle and the Blue Leopard appeared next to Shayna, who was watching the duel with bated breath. 
they lent each other their shoulders to support each other's bodies, and, having healed their legs, they took the opportunity of the Emperor Dragon King's pursuit of Shayna and her party to leave the cave, escaping from this deadly place. Look closely, that fellow, isn't he the young master of the Atof territory? The battle between the immortal Demon King's bloodline and the Emperor Dragon King Kajakt, if you've seen this fight in person, you'll be proud of it for generations to come that is if that kid over air doesn't die since we're all dead if he loses, well, these legs can't stand running the whole distance either way. Let's watch. Whichever side wins, it's not every day you get to see something this interesting. Shayna looked sideways at the exchange and returned her gaze to the front. It may sound out of place to say exciting, but single combat with a dragon is a fairy tale dreamed of by anyone who has learned to use a sword. It is no different for someone like Barkle, who is an expert in proper swordsmanship, or for someone like Blue Leopard, who has even mastered the blind sword style. Men will always be boys. Even if what is in front of them is unrealistic, they still have a twinkle in their eyes. Shayna, who is not a boy, had no such feelings in her heart, though. Al was willing to go on the offensive. Whatever the counter. Whether he was careless or not, whether he had a poor outlook or not, he had no choice but to attack. If he lost with his high, offensive attitude, there would be simply no way to fight against this Emperor Dragon King. Scrape, and thus, the distance grew even closer. The sword is still too far away to reach its fabled rival, even if using but the tip of the sword. If the boy wanted to go for a clean, one-hit kill, he would need to close the distance to the point where he can reach it with his palm. While paying close attention, he closes the distance millimeter by millimeter. If Kajak moves, he maintains a posture ready to counterattack at any time and closes the distance only. Kajak's timing had already passed. Al could read the intentions of the King of Dragons. It would use its gravity magic barrier to repel each slash pull back to its own spacing, and then burn the defenseless prey in the air with a fire breath that possessed the maximum possible attack power. This configuration is the same as when North God fought Kajakt. What is different from Al is that the first North God was a mere human, and when these events took place, the Emperor Dragon King suffered serious wounds in various parts of its body, including its hind legs, and was unable to move. Probably, North God had studied Kajakt well and had achieved this feat through careful strategy building and image training up to the day before. After crushing the limbs in the interval, all that remained was to strike down the head with a slash that could not be prevented with the defensive barrier of gravity magic alone. Having cornered the field to that point, North God made a mistake in his definition. No, it should be said that the King of Dragons, Kajakt was a cut above the rest. In a desperate situation, he used gravity magic, which is normally used for defense and movement, to attack and deliver a coup de grace. It is a technique made possible by its outstanding fighting sense and wealth of experience. If he had taken one more step, or even half a step, or even a few centimeters deeper, North God would have won. It must have been such an exquisite tactic. Otherwise, Kajakt, the king of the dragon kings, would not have shrunk like a tortoise and put up a defensive stance like that. It is afraid. Since it is an intelligent creature, there is no reason why death should not be terrifying for it. What is important is discernment. Just a few centimeters of misjudgment can tip the scales. The sound of Kajak's heartbeat could be heard. It was a powerful sound. One that his opponent decided to stop. Exclamation point. As he thought that, the royal dragon raised its head by just a tiny margin. It was a very slight movement for the dragon, maybe 50 centimeters or so. The movement was so natural that it was almost audible, as if it was riding on the pulse of the heart, as if it was taking its breath away. Just like that. Al's chance disappeared. His stance is the Dijodin. To cut an opponent who was as tall as the tip of your sword, you have to jump up in order to get closer, so that you can actually land the hit. Should I back down and enter a new stance? No, no. That's not good enough. Maybe strategically, but no. It beats the feeling. Do you back down every time you get into a disadvantageous situation? Is this the kind of opponent you can win against with such a runaway attitude? No. 
Besides, it's not hopeless yet. Al relaxed his shoulders. The sword falls. Counterclockwise, with a click, the tip of the sword pointed to his lower right, five o'clock. North God style, Junpo Geddon stance. If the opponent raises its head, an opening can be made below. Lay down the sword, let it gouge out, and cut. To do so, close the gap further. For the next time, were it to put its head down, the swordsman won't let him get away with it. The immortal North God style has its own technique. If it raises its head more, the sword will reach its stomach, which is not protected by the scales. Slowly, Al walked towards it. The King of Dragons was now so close that he could almost kiss it. No one in history has ever come this close to a living dragon. The heartbeat became quieter and quieter, and, at one point, Alex couldn't hear anything anymore. That's when he thought it was time to do it. No one will forget this moment for the rest of their lives. The distance had closed, and so, the time had come. The tip of Al's sword rises as if a string that has been drawn to its limit is released. Ah! Whose voice would that have been? A movement so subtle that it made someone raise a small cry, the Emperor Dragon King raised its head to meet Al's sword. The chance isn't gone. The slash transmitted from the right foot had such a tremendous speed that made it impossible to be avoided. And that's how Alex managed to not let his chance escape. It wasn't possible to escape from the Sword of Death. Kajak's movements still do not stop. As it raises its head, it lets out gravity magic at its full power. Directed right downwards. Al's sword easily cuts through the torrent of magic, but the overwhelming gravity makes his body creak. But, but, but it does not stop there, his attack is relentless. To that extent, the definitive technique the North God has created does not stop. The deadly slash approaches with a speed that seems to cut through time itself. The tip of the sword touches Kajak's lower neck. We won. It was then that someone definitely thought that. And then, by just a few centimeters, Al's foot slipped. No one had noticed. Or, if this had been a battle between humans, Al might have taken it into account from the start. But when it's dragons and humans, there is an overwhelming difference in strength. Whoever wins or loses, the causes of their victory or defeat will be sketchy and ambiguous. It is fair to say that small factors rarely make the difference between winning and losing. That is why. That is why none of them turned a blind eye to the fact that the rain was making their feet muddy. People sometimes don't care about small things in the face of huge things. They don't expect to be taken advantage of at the last minute over such a small thing. And who would have guessed that this would happen in a situation where both sides were aiming for a one-hit kill, a counterattack? He was caught, literally, flat-footed. The King of Dragons had been two or three steps ahead of the boy, as it did not miss even the smallest changes, due to its expectance of a last-minute definition. Or perhaps this was due to its experience with Kalman and Lan Xiao, that is, experience with strong opponents, that made Kajak always read two or three moves ahead. Even Al is not trained to maneuver on a field this muddy. The slip was only a few centimeters, or even less than a few millimeters. But that was enough. Now, Kajak's eyes caught sight of Al, who was in a slumped position and lit a fire in its mouth. It takes less than a second to burn out the enemy in front of you. A flame breath using all of the body. The crimson flame generated by the ignition organ in the body and amplified by magic power is so powerful that even the immortal demon King Atof would stop to take a glance at it. One hit kill. Kajak understood very well that he could not finish off the immortal demon king's bloodline otherwise. It won't be able to be avoided in time. The duel would end with the victory of the Emperor Dragon King. A distant sound of explosions. Followed by a rising, distant burning red pillar of fire. Fang Li looked up, his face seared by a fire that made it seem like it was midday. He mutters a few words. This one wishes he'd had been there to see it, he does, how long, who overheard this, then called out. Isn't it fine if you just went to see it? This one has a responsibility to oversee, he does, the members of the martial arts organization Phoenix's Nest had started to withdraw. They were here to train. 
they have been strictly ordered not to fight with the Emperor Dragon King because they would never win. Well, this one's going home, since he's homesick, ah, this one can't wait to see his father again in a theatrical tone, how long urged Fong Li to get off the mountain. He would have been there himself if he had been a little younger, covering for Al. But the head of the martial artists knows. Now Al already has friends. As he felt the heat around him, Al was stunned. Still alive. Why? Is it burning? Has it been put down? Who did it? Impossible? People? Black? Emperor Dragon King? Made clothes? Confused, he shakes his head and then sees there was something covering him. It was a person. Their black hair is burnt to a crisp at the edges, and their tattered, cracked armor is shattered at the back, revealing the scars of severe burns. Is it steam or smoke rising from their body? His eyes met those of the tattered Shayna. Shayna started moving her mouth, trying to say something and fainted. She no longer had any strength left, even to speak. Al understood instantly. She had saved him. When he realized this, a warm feeling welled up in his heart. He couldn't help but think that it was superfluous. As he had been interrupted in sacred single combat. As a knight, there was no greater insult. But, in spite of this, a warm feeling welled up in the boy's heart. What was on Al's heart was not frustration or anger, but gratitude. He was honestly grateful that his life had been saved. Now he could still fight. Shame on you that are still fighting a duel where you were saved by your comrades when he stood up, with Shayna lying at his side, the sword in his right hand was awfully light. The great sword he had taken from his parents' house had been snapped off at the base. It was the work of art that Atof used during the Human Demon War. It is an antique that will go down in history, so perhaps it can't be helped. Mother is gonna get angry at me, he was thinking absent-mindedly, and before he could realize it, Frau had come close to his side. Not speaking a word, she holds out a sword to Al, here, use this what he's receiving is a sword soaked in red blood. A replica of the holy sword Barolite. The sword used by the holy knights. It probably belonged to a knight who died in the cave. Frau did not explain where she had picked it up and immediately started treating Shayna. All I can do is defeat the Emperor Dragon King while thinking this, Al stood up, looked at Kajakt, and shuddered. Ah the Emperor Dragon King was dying. Stabbed in its jaw was a broken zambato. It had slashed from the throat to its chin, and blood was pouring down. The slash must have reached the upper jaw. Blood was also gushing from the nose. In addition, black smoke is spewing from the mouth. Perhaps, when it was about to release his flame breath, Al's sword sewn up the top and bottom of his jaw like a nail, causing some of it to flow back and burn internally through the wound. The nerves behind its nose were burnt and Kajakt had lost both sight and hearing. Yet its eyes are still powerful, glaring at its opponent. Whether it is a sign or an obsession, the Emperor Dragon King senses that Al is still alive and is doing its best to sharpen all its senses but the eyesight in order to find out when a counterattack will come with his bluff gaze. Perhaps it does not even know why the boy is still alive. It doesn't even think that he was unceremoniously saved by his comrades in the middle of their one-on-one -on -one duel, and thinks that instead, Al has somehow disabled the flames and is now raising his sword to counterattack. No, or perhaps it does not even perceive that Al is alive. The Emperor Dragon King, who had failed in its all-out attack and even received damage itself from it, might have thought that with that own incomplete attack, it could have failed to defeat the immortal Demon King's race. Al's whole body was trembling. Embarrassed and horrified. How embarrassing it was for him to have tainted a sacred duel. How terrifying for Kajakt, who still maintains its will to fight in such a state. Al couldn't move. Can he stand still? Normally, he should not be able to stand like that right now. He looks around. What's after this black charred forest? What is that dry forest, supposedly wet by the rain, burning in the distance? The Emperor Dragon King's true fiery breath will burn a country to the ground and create a wilderness of death that will last for decades. If you take one step, won't those flames come flying at you once more? The next time, will I be able to avoid them? 
is what Alex is thinking. Ah, ah, his teeth clicked and rattled. Fear bounded his whole body. He was afraid of dying, for he was born as the son of the immoral demon King Atof, and as a member of the immoral demon king's bloodline, he had lived the furthest from death in the world, without any threat. He was overconfident in his body, which would not die even if he fell from the top floor of the castle. It was easy not to think about it. I am not going to die. It would be more unrealistic to die. What he had believed in collapsed easily. He was afraid. His legs and muscles would be able to reach Kajakta in one step and give him a complete coup de grace to its head. Of course, this was before it could fire its flaming breath again. But he can't move his legs. He wasn't able to do what he had to. Oh, no. If I don't move, the Emperor Dragon King's sight will recover in time. That was only temporary are his next thoughts. Were that to happen, Al will be slandered as a coward and this time he will be killed. He didn't want to be slandered as a coward for trying to be a hero, and neither did he want to tarnish the name of his father, the North God, any more than he wanted to die. But his leg shook, and he couldn't move. Oi, Al, what's wrong? When he turned to look, he saw Cheeky standing there with a number of small burns. She still had the same diligent facial features, and the burns had made her look even more manly, but even at a time like this, she still had her usual expression on her face. When she saw Al's face, she started snickering. What a very pathetic face. At this time, even Cheeky can win is it that, very, pathetic? Oh, you look like an upstart aristocrat on the verge of being murdered. You look like you're about to start begging for your life Al touched his face. He can tell a lot from just touching it. He definitely looks like he's about to cry now. Indeed, it's a pathetic face. Look at the Emperor Dragon King, Al, it's almost there but it's a one-on-one -on -one duel, you fool, why are you still scared? What was that resolve you showed when you spoke with me in bed? If you've been all talk, Cheeky might really despise your resolve. Yes, he definitely had had that determination. No matter what, no matter what, he would defeat the Emperor Dragon King Kajakt. I don't know anything about the etiquette of dueling but I do know that the last one alive in a fight to death wins Cheeky San. Do you think you can kill that Emperor Dragon King Kajakt because you are bound by pride, honor, and other such ties? Knights and mercenaries are mistaken, but life is heavier than pride, honor, and gold. It's all packed in there that's why whoever is the one to get the kill in this world is the hero. If you can't do that, Al, then give up no, that I can't do the trembling stopped. If he defeated the King of Dragons here, it may call me a coward for spoiling a one-on-one -on -one duel. Even if it didn't, the rancor inside it would not disappear. ABD the boy will regret it for the rest of his life. This anxiety turned into a string of letters. Al held up his sword. Tuki welled up from his body. Emperor Dragon King Kajakt, you have won the duel. I was unceremoniously burned by the flames and Alex Ryback, son of the immoral demon king, died question mark. From now on, I'll become the successor of the North God style, a hero, and as the disciple of the first generation North God, I will take my revenge. That is well a one-sided and self-serving comment. Did Kajak listen or not? He just opened his heavy mouth like he was too busy with other things. When I die, give my regards to your mother, a tof yes the emperor dragon king hesitated, just a little bit, at that moment. Just before it struck the gravity magic, the face of a certain person came to mind. It was its former comrade in arms, and still its ally, a tof. How many times had she saved it and how many times had it saved her during the Great Human Demon War? It was no longer at the level of lending and borrowing. It was thanks to each other and their friends who had died that they had been able to fight through that fierce war and live like that after the defeat. If it kills her husband, his son will appear. If it killed even this son, Kajak didn't think that this time Atof herself would appear. Immortal demon kings live forever. They have little concept of marriage or companionship, and when someone they love is killed, they only complain and do not seem to be angry enough to take revenge, but it is hard to believe that she would remain silent after the murder of a blood relative who even shared her own blood. Just as the Emperor Dragon King itself had done, 
she would use the forces of the immortal demon king race to literally collapse this dragon king mountain and turn it into a flat land. Kajakt had thought that much and, for a fraction of a second, delayed its action. As a result, Al's sword slashed from its throat to the upper jaw, burning its optic nerve with its own fiery breath. Because of that momentary hesitation, the enemy's help arrived just in time. Kajakt is not going to make excuses such as if it had not been for his comrades. An attack that would have killed him even if his friends had come to his aid became an attack that would not have killed him even if there was no one else because of its momentary hesitation. And even then, his friends appeared to his aid. Kajak knows nothing of human manners. It has experienced one-on-one -on -one duels only a few times in its long dragon life. Most of the time, it either crushed an insignificant human who challenged it to single combat with a large number of dragons or crushed a large number of humans by itself. So, it had no intention of complaining about one or two interruptions now. It was too beautiful a way for it to die, Kajak thought. After thinking it would end up a lonely skeleton on a mountaintop, or that a young male would take its place as king, or maybe that it would be eaten by sandworms in the eastern wilderness, or even that it would have its life uprooted by a natural disaster that came out of nowhere. It was not bad if you die a victorious death after having played the game to the hilt. You may come at me thus ended the defeat of the Emperor Dragon King, that had won the duel, and the North God, who was the survivor. The curtain rises on a new legend. Chapter 9 The Curtain Rises Subjugation of the Emperor Dragon King Kajakt, Results Royal Knights of the Emperor Dragon Kingdom, Annihilated Prime Panther Mercenary Groups, Blue Leopard Division, Annihilated Millis Unit Chaos Destroyers, Annihilated Magic Guild The Leaves from the World's Tree, Annihilated Martial Arts Group Phoenix's Nest, Retired Emperor Dragon King Kajakt, Crushed all groups that had been considered strong candidates were in fact wiped out. The winner of the fierce battle was the boy who was the legitimate successor to the North God School. He challenged the King of Dragons to a one-on-one -on -one duel, which he won. However, no one came forward to say that he was the one in the town that was so excited over the corpse of the giant Emperor Dragon King, and it is not credible that he won in single combat against the one that reigned over the Dragon King Mountain who had annihilated the Blue Leopard Division and the Holy Knights of Millis. People say that the Blue Leopard Division and the Holy Knights of Millis must have worked together to defeat it. Few know the truth, but it is true that the Emperor Dragon King Kajakt was subjugated, and the blacksmith Yulian brought its corpse into his workshop. The town was festive. Three days had passed since Yulian entered the workshop. Frau Claudia, flowing clouds, was getting ready for her journey. A few days had passed in a sentimental and lazy way, but she had achieved her goal of assassinating the main leaders of the Sun faction. Once that was done, she must return. In retrospective, she felt that she had just moved confusedly around, making some errors that almost costed her her own life, and confirming her immaturity, but she was aware that she had grown a whole lot mentally. After being so obsessed with titles that she had forgotten what was important, she had always been obsessed with titles, but now I don't know why are they referred like this when they've been always called the Order of the Holy Knights, but yeah, those same guys knew they were not of any real use. There were plenty of people who were better than her, even lower ranking or, on the contrary, even worthless magicians who have no title. Frau intended to change her mind and retrain in magic from scratch when she returned. Not to learn for the exam, but to be a magician who could be relied upon in times of need. In addition, she also intended to start by building up her physical strength. Ah, outside the town, the girl saw an unusual figure. The person was meditating, sitting Zazen on a large rock. Frau thought about calling out to them, but decided not to. She didn't know what to say, and it was not her intention to interrupt their meditation. She regretted not being able to say goodbye, but she had left a message and it would be fine that way. Frau bowed to the person and went on her way with a refreshed face. Two weeks have passed since Julian entered the workshop. Cheeky, or Chiquita the assassin, was bored. Originally, she had planned to set off in pursuit of the Blue Leopard, 
which had left town to join the main group, but the other day she heard a rumor that the assassin's union to which Cheeky belonged had been destroyed in a devastating blow. It seems that the person who had asked her to exterminate the leopard was also killed by someone. To be honest, Cheeky was also fed up with killing dangerous opponents like the Blue Leopard, who would repel a knife thrown at them in the dark, so she abandoned her work and relaxed in the town. Although the girl was not very good at being part of a crowd, it was fun to look around the town, which was becoming festive because of her involvement. However, after two weeks, the town has lost its liveliness, and she herself has grown tired of it. At present, Cheeky is walking around the town, pecking at a skewer of dragon meat she bought from an open-air market. The town has regained its serenity from a period of time. It's like the calm before the storm of the Demon Swords announcement. All those who took part in the subjugation are eagerly awaiting Yulian's announcement of those expected demonic blades. There are rumors in the town about the battle against the Emperor of the Dragon King. The swordsmen of the North God style are said to be giants over three meters tall Barkle, the last holy knight, and Blue Leopard, a master swordsman, join forces to defeat Kajakt and the Death God Knight, the assassin and the survivor of the leaves from the world's tree formed a party and defeated the King of Dragons. Cheeky was also a little excited to hear that she was mentioned. I know an acquaintance of mine who has a friend that's in the leagues with Blue Leopard, and according to him, that guy, the Holy Knight Barkle and the successor to the North God School fought the Emperor Dragon King for three days and three nights, and all three were seriously injured when they finally defeated it really now, three days and three nights. No, it's not so much the time, it's that Dragon King wasn't half bad either, having outlasted those three onslaughts by that much cheeky chuckled when she heard such a conversation. She remembered that moment well. The standoff between Al and the Emperor Dragon King Kajakt lasted only 16 seconds. Then, after a pep talk by her, it took him about three minutes to finish off Kajakt. There was no onslaught, and who would believe that the battle was almost over with just one sword? It would be more believable if they had fought for three days and three nights. Even if no one believes her, Cheeky will never forget that moment in her life. Oh, if it isn't Alson and this little girl. What Chug guy is doing here? They were approached head on. There he was, a despicable man who could have been mistaken for a bandit if he hadn't been told he was a holy knight. Barkle. He was dressed in silver and white armor that glistened in the sunlight, and he was pulling a white horse loaded with cargo. There is too much gap between his armor and his face. We aren't doing anything, go over that way Cheeky did not have any particular bad feeling towards the man, but remembering his relationship with Shayna, she said so. The hell's that, you're so rude, ha. Huh? Ain't we the pals that were chairing on, hm? Barkle mumbled, shrugged his shoulders and walked past her. Despite his words, Cheeky changes direction and steps alongside him. Barkle looks quizzical. What's that? Didn't Chow want me to go over there? You are the one who stopped me, no. Well, it's fine though, Cheeky has free time. Barkle, where are you going? We're going back to the headquarters for now, as we received a lot of damage this time. I'll get a pay cut in the best case scenario, and a demotion at worst. Well, seems like my prediction was way too sweet, huh? It is said on the streets that you were a key part of the defeat of the King of Dragons. If you say you were, then it's certain. Can't you just say so and then it'll be all right? When Cheeky suggested so, Barkle scratched his chin. I'm a liar, but I don't lie about things I can't do. Because I couldn't do it again. Besides, if that really happens, you won't shut up, will you? I'm not as good as Blue Leopard. I don't want to be chased around by Chiquita, the killer indeed. If this man were to get carried away and feel triumphant, not only Cheeky, but Shayna, flowing clouds, and perhaps even Blue Leopard would turn against him. As someone who saw that battle with his own eyes, such a shameless lie would be absolutely unforgivable. I, too, am a swordsman who once thought of aiming for the top on the sword path. It's true that, from your point of view, I may be a cowardly, filthy, unrefined swordsman. But even a guy like me respects Alex Ryback as a swordsman is that so? The girl opened her eyes with surprise after hearing the man's confession. 
I was so moved at that moment that I didn't care about Shayna, about the holy nights, about status and honor, and all the other things I'd been obsessing over for so long. Since you let Blue Leopard go, I think you understand it as well when Barkle, the dirtiest thinker in the room, said it, it somehow carried weight. In fact, until the first sword was swung, no one could move except Shayna, who had seen Al's defeat through her own crisis-sensing abilities. Words cannot explain it very well. Given the circumstances, Cheeky could have stabbed Blue Leopard after all was said and done. But she couldn't. Such a thought did not even go through her head. Only those who were there and breathed that air would understand. The feeling of not being able to put a damper on the battle in front of him was akin to a feeling of intimidation. Oh, yeah, did you hear about that? About your client who got bumped off. Yeah, some drunk stabbed him on the side of the road. That's a stupid thing to do that's the thing. Apparently, Blue Leopard gave him the go-ahead to do it what? He seems to be taking a lot of risks and pushing himself too hard. Next time you see him, make sure you think I'm properly, got it? Why would the Blue Leopard do that? Cheeky nodded her head. There were numerous people who wanted the heads of the leaders of the Prime Panther mercenaries. Even in this town, there must have been a number of assassins in a similar position to the girl. Furthermore, it could be that the fights between the Blue Leopard Division and the Royal Knights in the town may actually have been engineered by them. There's no point in killing only Cheeky's client. No matter how great her skill is, it is difficult to hunt down and kill the leader of the Prime Leopard mercenaries by herself. The same was true of the officers she killed before. You have to fight together with the others, sometimes team up with them, and hunt them down with great care so that you don't misjudge the timing and opportunity, and finally get to them. Along the way, a number of those who joined forces died. It wouldn't have been weird for Cheeky herself to have died along the task. So it's no use doing something about one or two of them, and even if you manage them all, in a few years someone with a grudge against the Prime Leopard mercenaries will hire another group of assassins. Hey. Hey, that's the kindness of Sir Blue Leopard. I don't want to fight with you. Hmm, but why? It's his camaraderie. He doesn't want to kill each other with all the people who were there. I don't either. The most important thing is that you have to be able to get a good deal on the money. Are you different? Do you still want to kill the Blue Leopard? No cheeky shook her head. If it was the workaholic Cheeky of the past, she would have completed the job anyway, no matter what happened to the organization or the client. At any rate, that too would have been evaluated later on. That's what I'm talking about. You've got to choose your job it's none of your business absolutely. Definitely not like me Barkle laughed happily. The town's exit is in sight. More people are going in than going out, at the western city gate. I'm going through the deadly wilderness to get home as soon as possible, but I heard that Shayna and you went through there. What do you got? You'd better take the long way round. Cheeky and Shayna would be dead if Al hadn't picked them up really now, we'd better not do that then. Nothing to do about it Cheeky stops walking, and Barkle looks back. Then, as if remembering something, the knight opened his mouth. You, too, turn to the order of the holy knights when you're at your wit's end. I'll do something about it. Tell that to Al. But don't tell Shayna. See you later Barkle said this and walked out of town. Chki changed direction again and headed into town. Like Frau, she envies people with a purpose. She has a lot of spare time on her hands at the moment. A month had passed since Julian entered the workshop. Shayna Marianne was still getting there. It was only recently that the burns she had sustained while rescuing Al had fully healed. The burns that extended to the muscles of her back were so severe that she could have died, and the doctor told her that, no matter how fast the first aid treatment by flowing clouds was, the fact that she was able to move without any aftereffects in one month was a result of luck in the physical body she had trained. When Shayna lost consciousness on Mount Dragon King, she woke up in a hospital bed in the town. It was not a refreshing awakening. It was sunny outside and the sun was high in the sky, but she was not lured by the sunshine, the reason being the pain in her back. When she woke up, two days had already passed since the battle. Flowing clouds apparently nursed her throughout the two days, 
but the day after Shayna woke up, she prepared for her journey and returned to the headquarters of her magic guild. After that, Cheeky came to visit her almost every day. Her appearance and behavior are deceiving, but it seems that she is a very dedicated girl. When Shayna asked her what had happened, the assassin's reply was that she was not familiar with the language and could only tell that the Emperor Dragon King had been defeated by Al and that the town was in a state of celebration. The knight could have imagined that level of detail without asking, because of the festivities she could see from outside the window. Once, Blue Leopard went to the ward. He entered quietly with a mysterious face, with his presence muted, and when he realized that Cheeky wasn't around, he returned his presence with a relieved face. It seems that Chiquita isn't around here even a mercenary officer like you can't knock when sneaking into a lady's room? How tactless you don't knock when sneaking into a room, well, let's just say that Chiquita is that dangerous, alright? When Shayna blamed him, the Blue Leopard laughed and said so. So, what are you here for? It's not like I'm on a special errand. It's nothing special, but I wanted to visit you and give you a message. I couldn't find the young master, so I thought I'd pass the message on to you. Blue Leopard told them that Frau had left a final message for Shayna and the others to the effect that if they ever needed a sorcerer for party recruitment, they should call her. He then told them that he, too, would be leaving the town soon, and left as quietly as he had come. After that, there were no visits from anyone other than Cheeky. It's been a month of boredom, and in no time at all. Shayna walks along the road to the inn, feeling uncomfortable with her back, which feels cramped. It seems that someone has paid the money for the hospitalization. The woman didn't know how much it came to, or whether it had been cheeky, al, or flowing clouds, but she'd have to thank them. And an apology. She didn't have any money with her at the moment, she said. The town's heat must have died down by now. The festivities were over. But the fact that the heat has not cooled down is probably because Julian has not yet come out of his workshop. He is said to have struck the sword with everything from the top of that giant Emperor Dragon King's head to the tip of its tail. Shayna doesn't know how he transforms the creature into a sword, but a sword made from such a powerful creature, an unprecedentedly great sword will be created. Perhaps it could even reach the title of a divine sword. Neither Blue Leopard nor Cheeky seemed interested in such things but Shayna can relate to the enthusiasm of the people who are eagerly awaiting the announcement. So what about Al? Angry, aren't you? Shayna thought back to that moment. When Al was about to release a slash, just before his foot slipped, an electric current ran down Shayna's spine and she had a gut feeling that the boy in front of her was going to die. She jumped in at the same time as her intuition. It was as if she had no idea what that would entail. Shayna is a knight. A knight is a creature of honor. Those who do not respect honor cannot be knighted, cannot call themselves knights, and are even considered unworthy to aspire to knighthood. Shayna is not a big fan of dueling, but if she were to be interrupted while dueling someone, she would be seriously offended that her honor had been tarnished. Even now that her reputation as a wandering knight has gone viral and her honor has been dropped to the ground and covered in mud. It should be the same with Barkle, who is such a dirty thinker. Of course, that man is a diminutive vessel who would not duel unless he had a guarantee of victory, but even he would defend his honor as a knight if he were to start a duel. Al may not have been knighted through a formal procedure, but judging from his normal behavior, he must have received a proper education from his parents, the demon King Atof. Besides, he was trying to be a hero, so he must have wanted to defeat the Emperor Dragon King fair and square. There was no way he was convinced. Ah, what shall I do? An involuntary sigh escaped. She was hated. And when she thought about it, her chest tightened, and she wanted to cry. However, I can't do anything about my worries, I don't regret anything that's right, she had no regrets. When they reached the inn, Cheeky had a difficult look on her face as she laid out the knives on the bed. They are all knives with strange shapes. When Shayna first saw them, she thought they were hobbyist and had no practical use, but considering that they fly in mysterious trajectories in the air, these shapes are rather practical. There used to be nearly ten of them, but now there are only three. The rest were probably lost in that mountain. Were they custom-made? 
they were given to me by my master. I've been taking good care of it, but I've lost eight of them at once. It's the first time I've lost this much at once. I had twenty at first, ha, cheeky sighed, carefully wiped the knives laid out on the bed with the sheet and sheathed them, and turned to Shana once again. Is your body fine already? It still hurts a bit, but, by the way, where's Al? Shana looks around. When she first arrived at the inn, she looked in Al's room, but he was not there. She thought he was in this room, but she couldn't see him. He said he went out to meditate. Now that you mention it, he hasn't come back, eh, Al is immortal, so it's not like nothing can happen to him. Worrying would be a waste of time Cheeky said this as she was attaching and removing knives with a difficult look on her face. She was more worried about where to attach just three knives than that she was down to three knives. Shayna watches and unpacks her belongings, which are gathered in a corner of the room. What she pulls out from inside are her usual maid uniforms. Shayna carries a total of seven similar outfits. The ones she had used to come in were burnt out and tattered, and then the hospital clothes she received while recovering made her uncomfortable. And with this, all right, Shayna quickly changed and nodded to herself. Her armor is broken, but it can't be helped. Seeing this, Cheeky makes a surprised sound. Oi, Shayna. I've been meaning to tell you for a while now. I think you're going to end up with a weird nickname like Death God Knight because you're dressed so blackly and sinister Shayna looked puzzled. She wondered what this little assassin was saying that was so out of the ordinary. Of course not. A maid is the most harmless creature in the world, you know? Well, that's instructive. But if Shayna dresses like that, she won't look harmless everything starts with form cheeky was smiling unusually bitterly. Hmm. She wears a sword belt without armor and notices that the scabbard is empty. Shayna recalls the whereabouts of the sword. She stabbed Barkle in the cave and, it's still there. Seeing that Cheeky has only three knives, Al must have barely dragged his exhausted body back to town after defeating the King of Dragons. What you don't have, you don't have. And if you're in town, you can get by without a sword. Which way did Al go? Outside the town. He said just outside the gate. It's too noisy in town for meditation him, so probably the north gate. When did he leave? When Shayna asked this, Cheeky suddenly started to bend her fingers and began to count something. When the number reached 30, she finally looked up. Was it about 30 minutes ago, or was it about 30 hours ago? If it was the latter, Shayna thought, he might be coming back soon, when Cheeky said with a huff. Now that you mention it, he hasn't appeared for a whole month Cheeky and Shayna jumped together out of the inn. Alex Ryback was meditating on a rock that stood alone on the outskirts of town. Meditation sounds like a great thing, but he was simply thinking. What he was thinking about was that battle, the duel with the Emperor Dragon King. It was true that he was alive now, and he definitely was the one who got the last hit to the King of the Dragons. That raw sensation still remained in his hand. It was the feeling of killing an unarmed person. It was good up to the middle. A sense of urgency at the last minute, a sword struck at the right moment to thread the needle. Despite the perfect timing, it was returned in an unexpected way. Without Shayna, he would not have left even a bone in this world. How could he have one? He is thinking. When was there a moment of dominance? No, there was not a single one. Until the very end, Al and Kajakt had been even. Then, as a final conclusion, why did he lose? Because the dragon's gravitational magic caused the boy to slip up. Why did it slip? Because he made a cut up from the lower step. Because the target was on top, he had to step on the axis of one foot to cut both legs off. Why did he perform the cut up from the lower step, where the foot was slippery? because Kajakt lifted its head and took care of the chance of doing it from the upper step. Why did Kajakt raise its head? To make El take a lower position after considering the above. Then, what would have happened if he had remained in the upper stance until the end? The slash would not have reached the fatal blow and he would still have lost. A 50-50 match would have been absurd. With just one move, the act of raising its head, Al had fallen for Kajak's winning strategy. 
how pathetic it was that he didn't realize this and just went back to the lower stance. If it were possible, he would like to start over, to challenge the dragon to an ordinary fight once more. But there will be no next time, even if he wanted some sort of revenge. Because Al had killed it himself. No, Al shakes his head. Even if he can't get revenge, he should find a way to beat Kajakt. And that brings him back to the beginning. Why did he lose? How could he have won? The new North God was stuck in a roundabout way of thinking. When he opened his eyes, he saw a woman in a familiar maid's outfit and a girl in a tattered cloak standing there. Al stood up, startled. The little birds on his shoulders and head fluttered away. Shana san. You must not. To be standing already, Shana was amused by his desperate expression, but quickly replied with a smile. I'm fine already. I even have the doctor's authorization. It still hurts a little, though is that so? It didn't really look like a wound that would heal in a day or two, Al felt a strange feeling in his body there, and he stretched out. It was as if he had slept all day. Shana, with a dumbfounded expression, answered to the boy, you know what? How many days do you think it's been since I was admitted to the hospital? How many days? But it hasn't even been two days, has it? Are you being serious right now? The knight and the assassin saw each other with surprised faces, ah Al, too, finally realized there that he had spent a considerable amount of time on the stone. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost track of time when I was thinking, oh, by the way, I'm hungry. How long has it been? A month. I was afraid you were dead ha, huh? there's no way I can die in just a month Shana was rather serious about the fact that he might be dead, but Al took it as a joke. After all, he is the son of an immortal demon king. The immortal demon king only has a long lifespan and a vicious regenerative capacity, so he is not completely death-proof, but if he wanted to starve to death, he would have to not eat or drink for at least a year. So, Al. You've been meditating for a month, have you gained enlightenment already? Cheeky asked like someone else could ask did you sleep well, to someone who was dozing off in front of them. The boy, however, replied in a serious way. No way, the more I think about it, the less I realize that I am alive and Kajakt is dead Shana speaks to Al, who is muttering distantly I wonder why I'm still alive and looking at her distantly. Hey, Al, are you angry? Angry about what? That moment, when I jumped in by that moment, he muttered ah at first, and then started slowly shaking his head. I thought Shana-san would be the one to be angry I would. The woman shook her head, as the answer had been unexpected. Why? Am I not the one who interfered in an honorable duel of a night? But before that, I broke my promise and came back there. That's how Shana got hurt. A man who breaks his word has no right to talk about the honor of knighthood, does he? Yes, but I'm sure I interfered as well, it seems like it's mutual Shana said this but was relieved. For the past month. She had been worried for a long time. She wondered if Al was not coming to visit her because he was upset about something she had done, or that she had messed something up. I owe you my life. I'm grateful for that, even taking into account the duel. Our blood is not so easy to die, but we fear death more than anything else Al was no exception. That's why he went into the battle against Emperor Dragon King with a strong self-intimidation to contain himself. Preparedness is nothing more than convenience. Having immortality and not fearing death are two different things. As for the knight's honor, thanks to Cheeky San's encouragement at the time, I was able to keep going forward him. Cheeky thought what was that I had said, but immediately folded her arms and nodded. It's because Cheeky is a very strong assassin Al laughs and agrees, nodding. And then, he returns to a serious expression. All I was thinking about was how could I have won? Do you know what on earth I could have done at that moment, to win against Kajakt, Shana? Suddenly being asked, Shana recalls the scene. Intuitively, she thought Al had lost, not because she had read Kajakt's move, but because he had not taken a certain action against the waiting Kajakt. Eh? Well, simply put, if you had used the first feint when you attacked to receive that gravity magic, you could have avoided the gravity magic and thrust your sword at the chest of the King of Dragons, 
which was defenseless with its head raised to shoot the flame breath. Wouldn't that have worked? No, it wouldn't the correct answer was easily given. Al was too embarrassed to say that he could not use faint techniques. U O O G H H H H M. At that moment, the town suddenly became noisier. It was as noisy as when the dead body of the King of Dragons was paraded through the town. Maybe Yulian has finished the sword, Shana said, and Cheeky started to walk away. Let's go see they follow. The sun was setting behind them, and Cheeky was walking briskly, looking her age. Al and Shana saw her, and they began to care less and less about the honor of knighthood and whether they had won or lost a duel. Right now, they are alive and standing here. That is what is important. There were forty-eight swords presented. That many swords were produced from that giant king of dragons. Twenty-four swords are considered demon swords, and twenty-four are considered holy swords, with each holy and demon one pairing, so twenty-four pairs of swords, each with opposite effects. Swordsmen would want these swords with their overwhelming power so badly that they would be at each other's throats. However, ten of the swords were donated to the Emperor Dragon Kingdom, and the remaining thirty-eight were distributed to a number of merchants who had sponsored the blacksmith. With a look of satisfaction on his face, Yulian finished his sword presentation and fell into a sleep so deep that he seemed to have run out of energy and caught his last breath, collapsing on the spot, exhausted. After a month of crafting without eating, drinking, or resting, even the mightiest of demons would probably have done so. Indeed, people were fascinated by the swords crafted in this way. The multicolored blades are recognizable at a glance, each one carrying a different meaning and magical power. The swords have a mysterious shape with a faint luminescence. Those swords were so powerful that they fascinated not only swordsmen but also mere ordinary people. It was enough to make people wonder how it would be to have one of those swords. Hundreds of them would later die over these swords, every year. Of course, no one knew about it at the time. They're so impressive, do you think I could get a knife made if I ask for it? I don't know, Cheeky Chan, your knives have strange shapes, what do you mean strange? They're cool. Eh? They're cool? When Al returned to the inn, he was listening to such conversations and putting away his luggage. The burnt-out armor had been polished before he knew it, and the laundry he had left behind had been washed clean before he knew it, and so he tilted his head. Cheeky san, this, oh, I am the one who cleaned that. Be thankful thank you very much. Cheeky san can become a proper wife, huh? The girl's face turned red for a moment, and then she boastfully laughed. Oh, you could marry me once we grow up. If it's Al, it would be marrying into a nice family. I would be fine even if I were to become a concubine. I want to have a comfortable life once I get older. But according to my master, it is not recommended to have an assassin as a wife, because they will kill you for real if you cheat. Cheeky is willing to be generous there, though even the wife of the demon king has a hard time because of the occasional attack by so-called heroes Al laughed and stood up, putting everything in his sack. The armor clanks with a clatter. While Cheeky and Shayna were talking for a moment, they were completely prepared for the journey. They stare at it in amazement. Alcoon, where are you going? I haven't decided on anything in particular, well, I heard that a man called the Sword God once defeated my father, so it might be a good idea to go and defeat him, but there's also what Kajak said, so maybe I should go back home once, yeah, either way, it's further north sorry, I shouldn't have said it like that. It's night now and if we're going to travel, we might as well do it tomorrow when Shana said this, Al's eyes flashed and he was thinking about something, but then he opened his mouth to say what he was talking about. But there's nothing to do in this town anymore, and besides, knock knock at that moment, there was a knock at the door of the room where they were staying. Who on earth could be the enemy this late at night? Shana and Cheeky instantly thought so and braced themselves. Oh no, the door is unlocked. They signal to each other with their eyes that their escape is through the window. There should be no enemies in town at the moment, but it must be a condition reflex. Is the door open? Let me pass, please only Al doesn't get all nervous, puts his sack aside, and opens the door. It opens slowly, making a squeaking noise. You are, Al rises his voice in surprise. 
A man wearing a thick robe and a hood pulled over his eyes enters. His dark purple skin peeks out from the edges of his hood. At first glance, it is clear that he is a demon tribe. He was carrying a large bag and a package so large that it looked as if it might contain oars. Please excuse my delay in appearing this late at night, your highness a hoarse voice. Shana and Cheeky looked at each other because they had heard the voice somewhere. Al's expression broke into a broad smile when he heard the voice. It's been a long time, Yulian. Thank you for your work today. Is your body doing better already? I am very grateful for your kind words. I am late in greeting you, and yet you are kind enough to worry about me. I have a frail body that can collapse at the slightest touch, but as long as I am standing and walking like this, there is no need to worry the blacksmith Yulian Jalisco bowed deeply, so low that he could have fallen flat on the spot. Shayna's eyes were black and white when she saw Al and Yulian exchanging friendly words, but if you think about it, he is Alex Ryback, the son of the Demon King, making him a prince, and it is not surprising that he is acquainted with a famous person of the demon race. Yulian kneeled down softly and rubbed his head on the ground. I heard a rumor in the town that a boy of immortal blood, the heir to the North God, had killed the Emperor Dragon King, and I have belatedly remembered that this Kajakt is your highness father's adversary. I was not thoughtful enough to ask a last second put together assortment of people to take it down. I have come here today with the intention of apologizing by breaking my seven-layered knees into eight-layered knees. I am truly sorry. If His Highness is not appeased by the cheap head of Yulian, then by all means, drop this head and send it to Atofsama. I am sure our queen will expose me in the most miserable way possible. Al was indeed taken aback by the Dejiza and the long-winded speech, but he considered the words carefully and connected them to memories of the past. Are you sure? When I upset my mother before, I told her that all I had was my life because I had a purpose, today, that purpose has been fulfilled. I no longer have any regrets his voice was quiet and hoarse, but it was the tone of a contented man. It sounded serious, but Al was smiling. Is that so, but you don't have to worry, for my father's enemy was dealt with by this own hand and then, the blacksmith raises his head. So it wasn't some random man from the human race that appeared from nowhere, but his highness, who subjugated that hateful dragon. Yes, I was defeated in the duel, and it is not something I can be praised about, but the absolute fact is that I am alive and Kajakta is dead, and, Al glanced behind him, and Shayna and Cheeky sent him a look that said you don't have to say anything else unlike my father, I was helped by my comrades. On my own. I wouldn't have been able to fight all the way to the end when Al was honest, the women were embarrassed and shy. For them, they were just watching the fight between Kajakt and the current North God, but it wasn't like that according to him. Without Shayna, the dragon would have killed him, and without Cheeky, his broken will would have remained that way. Frau did not directly help him, but it goes without saying that without her, Shayna and Cheeky would not be alive. So he can say this without being conceited. It was all of us that managed to beat it when Al said this, Yulian stood up, tears in the corner of his eyes, threw his bag behind his back, took off his robe, stripped down to his upper body, and fell flat on his face again. What a big man, Al thought, but he knew that this was one of the greatest manners of gratitude in Yulian's clan. Thank you very much for avenging my good friend, Kalman Ryback. Thanks to you. I was able to fulfill the vengeance I swore to heaven and earth on the day Cowl was cruelly devoured by the Emperor Dragon King Kajakt saying this, he brings a large bag and a package, which he had thrown out to his side, in front of him. When he unwrapped the package, a huge, thick sword appeared from within. Th. Cheeky and Shayna were immensely impressed. It was a sword that exuded inorganic magic that could be described as divine or disastrous. It was different from the one presented at noon. What is this? This is the 49th and greatest masterpiece. The cooling fluid was made from the bone marrow of the Emperor Dragon King, the core metal was forged using magic power extracted from the shoulder bone, the jade steel was made by boiling the marrow of a hard bone, and the blade was made by melting the crown and tusk in a ratio of 2 to 8 and using the heat resistance effect of the firing tube, slowly burning it and forging it for 7 days and 7 nights. The other 48 and so on were merely practice for making this one inch Al also admired the proud yet sad voice that presented it. 
This is indeed tremendous, what's the name of it? I named it Kajakt, the king's dragon sword with a face distorted by mixed emotions, Yulian said. Al, who had grown up looking at magic swords from an early age, had no interest in them, but that sword was different. It had an alluring charm. He wanted to hold that sword in his hand, to swing it. He wanted to cut something with it. This is the magic of the sword that swordsmen of the world cannot resist. And this is the request fee. By the standards of the human race, I thought I had prepared an amount that would allow me to play with my descendants for several generations for the rest of my life, but, well, it's just too miserable to be presented to His Highness, I don't really have a need for this money, Al said this casually as he looked at the contents of the bag offered to him and turned back to the two women behind him. How about splitting it between Shana-san and Chiki-san? Eh? They were both clearly visibly distressed. Stuffed into the dirty bag were coins of a kind not seen around there. The surface was lightly engraved with a pattern, and it was not even clear what country they were issued by. On the contrary, it was a metal that they had never seen before. Both Shana and Chiki judged at first glance that this coin was unusable. Chiki doesn't really need it I need money to buy a new armor and sword, but I couldn't possibly accept this Al looked relieved when they showed some difficulty. Is that so? You look kind of happy, don't you? I'd heard that many humans were dirty with money, so I was somewhat relieved to see that you two are different with that. The boy closed the lid of the bag and handed it to Yulian. Neither Shana nor Chiki showed any expression on their faces, but inwardly they were relieved that they did not seem dirty with money. The blacksmith looked annoyed when he was turned away from his reward, but, Yulian. Since it's like this, why don't you craft a sword and a knife for them? He nodded his head in agreement. It's a simple task. I have a few ingredients left over, so it can be finished this evening and delivered tomorrow morning. Don't cut corners, will you? Of course not. However, the best swords have already been made, so don't expect too much. It was some time after Yulian had asked them in detail what kind of weapons they were in for, and after they had gone long on their explanations, and just before they went to bed, that Shana and Chiki remembered that the metal they had just seen was very rare, used for expensive weapons, and that some of the old blacksmiths exchanged such metal for money. Next day. Al was out of town. The goal is the north. It is the demon continent, northwest of the central continent. He had to report that he had avenged his father's death, that he had killed his mother's comrade in arms, and that the Emperor Dragon King had transformed into 49 swords. A letter would have been fine, but he had decided that the important things should still be reliably conveyed from his own mouth. And so, he was thinking about the road to the demon continent. There are shipping services from the Emperor Dragon Kingdom to the Millis continent, but the holy land of Millis is an enemy of the demon race, and the forest of the beast race, located north of that holy kingdom, would be an unnecessary hardship for a member of the demon race if they wanted to get out. That continent is not kind to those that came from the harshest continent. Al looks closer to the human race, but there are those, like Yulian, who will notice. That's why, as he had thought, it would still be the same road as the one he had gotten there in the first place, through the deadly wilderness, traveling along the sea and getting on a boat. The road won't be the same as the one he had come through, but well, people learn the road by going back and forth. Al. As the boy had started walking towards the wilderness with these thoughts in mind, a high-pitched scream was heard from behind him. There is some anger in the sound of the voice. When he turned around, he saw Shayna, wearing brand new armor and a brand new armor, and Cheeky, still in the same tattered cloak, running toward him. Al smiled when he saw the brand new sword at the knight's waist. Oh, thank goodness. It looks like you both got your swords made properly. Yulian is a bit loose with his time. Still, I really hope he didn't cut corners to get it done on time, they stopped running when they got close to Al and caught their breath roughly. They had run in quite a hurry. Did you forget something? She shouldn't have anything that would cause her any trouble were her to forget it, but as she received that question, she caught her breath and glared at the boy asking. A farewell isn't just walking away without saying anything, just cruel? So that's how it is. Please forgive my mistake. I thought that after tonight's even we had already parted, but thinking properly about it, 
I shouldn't be already on my way as long as you know. Cheeky wipes her sweaty forehead with her sleeve. Shayna saw the brown marks, probably from the dirt, and took out a handkerchief from her pocket to wipe it. Al looked at her and thought that they were like sisters-in-law who were far apart in age. From now on, I'll be crossing the wilderness of death, travel the sea, and return to the demon continent at once even if Kajakt had died, the wilderness of death will not be restored. People would have to wait for the magic to slowly drain away over hundreds of years. It's hard to get out of the wilderness of death. Are you in a hurry? No, simply because it's the shortest way. If you go around the Dragon King Mountains, it would take you about a month. And I can go through that wilderness without eating or drinking Al said this as if it were a matter of course, but Shayna looked displeased. If you were me, what would you two do? Eh? If you don't take us into account, it will be troublesome. Or are you planning to carry us if we fall, as you did before? When Shayna said that in a teasing tone, Al twisted his head and thought about it for three seconds. He arrives at one conclusion. Are you coming with me? Hearing that, Shayna put up a sad expression. Can't we? It's not that you can't, but I'm sure that both Shayna san and Cheeky san had a reason to come to this country, so, is it really fine if you leave now? The little girl, shocked, replied immediately. Cheeky's job was done while Al was sleeping in, so it's okay the organization collapsed, the client died, and the work just flowed on in ambiguity, but it was over, or so she thought. Ah, so that's how it is. What about Shana san I'm a knight, so my only purpose was to volunteer for the Emperor Dragon Kingdom's order. That's why I joined them, but the Royal Order of Knights is gone too, if I wait in town or in the Royal Capital, won't they just start up anew? Yes, but you haven't heard about the Blue Leopard, have you, Al? It seems like the Casper Kingdom is about to invade here, so it's better to leave Al guess that this meant there would be a recruitment draft. Isn't that convenient then? Listen here, the Emperor Dragon Kingdom, which has lost its royal knights, can't compete with the Casper Kingdom, which has the original Panther mercenaries. It's no good being a knight of a country that's about to cease to exist that's true as well, so... Are you looking for a new kingdom to go? There is no other kingdom in this continent than the Emperor Dragon Kingdom that would hire someone with such a nickname like Death God Knight, you know. Ah, Al, could it be that your place could hire me? It was mostly said as a joke, but Al took it seriously. If it's that sort of thing, leave it to me. I think my mother would have a difficult look on her face if I hired a knight or something like that, but I'll try to persuade her somehow, but Shayna's efforts are also, ah, but Death God Knight under the Immortal Demon King sounds kind of cool, doesn't it? If I go after her with that as a point of appeal, it'll be fine because my mother likes cool things oi, Al, since it's a great timing, hire Cheeky as well, since I just lost my job Cheeky-san as well, huh? It would be great if there was a vacancy in the assassination squad, but, if you want, I can be your lady-in-waiting at the castle aha, well then, it will be a detour, but let's go around the Dragon King Mountains and so. While happily conversing, the three of them began their journey. The story of the subjugation of the Emperor Dragon King comes to an end. The story of New Story, the heroic tale of North God begins. Epilogue In the dungeon book Labyrinth, which exists in the depths of the demon continent, there are duplicates of every book that has ever existed in the world. This is because the eccentric sage who lives in the innermost part of the labyrinth uses his wisdom and clairvoyance to duplicate the books that exist in the world. No one knows how long he has been in this labyrinth and why he does it. Only that he has been there for a long time and continues to produce copies of books. There are all kinds of books in this labyrinth. The books cannot be taken out of the labyrinth, but some of them are said to contain the original texts of the Lost Order of Millis and secret books of legendary swordsmanship, but finding such rare books is like finding a pearl dropped in the desert. The majority of the books are someone's diary or a notepad with only one unused page. The journal was brought back by an adventurer who had explored the book Labyrinth. According to his story, it was not taken from the bookshelves of the dungeon but found in the luggage of someone's corpse, rotting into bones in a corner of the labyrinth. The journal, which had no name or title, contained the details of the subjugation of the Emperor Dragon King, which was now an old story. 
it was discovered and people said it was a delusional novel. There cannot be a 49th sword in the 48 swords of Julian Jalisco. It was much later that North God II met the death god Knight Shana and the bandit Chiquita. It was never heard that Frau Claudia, Leaves from World's Tree Guild leader, participated in the subjugation of the Emperor Dragon King. There was no way that Barkle, the clean and honest former leader of the Holy Knights, could be someone easily confused with a street thug. First of all, the Emperor Dragon Kingdom still exists as a major power, doesn't it? That's a delusion thought up by a corpse of whom we don't know, that's what it is. Everyone said. From an unexpected place, someone found out that what was written in this memoir was a real event that really happened. Oh, this is my father's handwriting. Wow, I miss him, it's been hundreds of years. When I was a kid, he used to tell me this story all the time, North God Kalman III laughed with joy when he read the memoir. He was the third North God to take over the name of the founder. Thus, a new story was added to the North God heroic tale. The story was named North God's Heroic Tale, Introduction the Subjugation of the Emperor Dragon King and was published in book form by a novelist and became an explosive hit, but that is another story. Only one thing can be said. The boy Alex Ryback's aim has indeed been fulfilled. The End